Jess. I move through the cav, deeper into the crowd of masked faces and writhing bodies. The party's getting wild. I'm pretty sure I spot a couple up against the wall having sex or something close to it. And little way on, a small group doing lines. I wonder if the room full of wine has been locked. I reckon this many people could put quite a dent in those racks of bottles. Veux tu un baiser de vampire? A guy asks me. I see that he's dressed as Dracula in a plasticky cape and some fake fangs. It's almost as crap a costume as my ghost outfit was. Um, sorry, what? I say, turning towards him. A vampire's kiss, he says in English with a grin. I asked if you want one. For a moment I wonder if he's suggesting we make out. Then I look down and realise he's holding out a glass swimming with bright red liquid. What's in it? Uh, vodka, grenadine, maybe some chambord, he shrugs. Mostly vodka. Uh, okay, sure. I could do with some Dutch courage. He hands it over. I take a sip. Jesus, it's even more grim than it looks. The metallic hit of the vodka beneath the syrupy raspberry liqueur. It tastes like something we might have served at the Copacabana, and that's not a good thing. But it's worth it for the vodka, even if I'd really prefer to take it neat. I take another long glug, braced this time for the sweetness. I've never met you before, he says, sounding almost more French now he's speaking English. What's your name? Jess. You? Victor. Enchanté. Uh, thanks. I get straight to the point. Hey, do you know Ben? Benjamin Daniels? From the third floor? He pulls a face. Non, désolé. He looks genuinely sorry to have let me down. I like your accent, he adds. It's cool. You're from London, no? Yep, I say. It's not exactly true. But then, where am I from, really? And you're a friend of Mimi's? Uh, yes, I suppose you could say that. As in, I've met her precisely twice, and she's never seemed exactly delighted to see me. But I'm not going to go into particulars. He raises his eyebrows in surprise, and I wonder if I've made some sort of mistake. It's just, most people here are friends of Camille. No one really knows Mimi. She, uh, how do you say it in English, uh, keeps herself to herself. Kind of intense, a bit. He makes a gesture that I take to mean cuckoo. I don't know her that well, I say quickly. Some people don't get why Camille is friends with Mimi. But I say, you just have to look at Mimi's apartment to know why. Mimi's got rich parents. You know what I'm saying? He points up towards the apartment. In this part of town? Seriously expensive. That is some... Sick crib. He attempts to do the last two words in a kind of American accent. In other circumstances, I could almost feel sorry for Mimi. That people would assume someone's only friends with you because of your money. That's rough. I mean, it's never a problem I've had to deal with, but still. So, what are you? He asks. What? A beat. And then I realise he means my costume. Oh, right. Shit. I look down at my outfit. Jeans, an old bobbly jumper. Well, I was a ghost, 
but now I'm just an ex-barmaid who's sick of everyone's shit. What? He frowns. It's, uh, a, a British thing, I tell him. It might not translate. All right, he nods. Cool. An idea hits me. If Camille and Mimi are down here, then no one's up there, in the apartment. I could take a look around. Hey, I say. Victor, could you do me a favour? Tell me. I really need to pee, but I don't think there's an, a uh, toilette down here. He looks suddenly uncomfortable. Clearly French boys get as embarrassed about such matters as their British counterparts. Could you ask Camille if we can borrow the key to the place? I smile my most winning smile. The one I'd use on the big tippers at the bar. Little hair flip. I'd be so grateful. He grins back. Bien sûr. Bingo. Maybe Ben's not the only one with the charm. I sip my drink while I wait. It's growing on me now. Or maybe that's the vodka kicking in. Victor comes back a few minutes later, holds up a key. Amazing, I say, holding out my hand. I'll come with you, he says, with a grin. Crap. I wonder what he thinks is going to come out of this. But maybe it helps me look less suspicious if we go together. I follow Victor up out of the curve up the dark staircase. We take the lift, his suggestion, and we end up pressed against each other, as there's barely room for one person. I can smell his breath, cigarettes and vodka. Not a totally unappealing combination. And he's not bad looking. But too pretty for my liking. You could cut a lemon on his jawline. Besides, he's basically a child. I have a sudden flashback to Nick and me a couple of hours ago on the roof terrace. That moment, after he'd taken the leaf out of my hair, when he didn't move away as quickly as he should have. That snatched piece of time, just before the lights went out, when I was convinced he was going to kiss me. What would have happened if it hadn't suddenly gone dark? If I hadn't gone sneaking into the rest of the apartment and found that photograph? Would we have gone back to his apartment, fallen into his bed together? You know, I've always wanted to be with an older woman, Victor says earnestly, jolting me back into the real world. Steady on, mate, I think. And besides, I'm only 28. The lift grinds to a halt on the fourth floor. Victor unlocks the door to the apartment. There are a load of bottles and crates of beer stacked in the main room. Must be extra party supplies. Hey, I say. Why don't you fix us a couple more drinks while I go and pee? This time, big on the vodka, please. Less of the red stuff. There's a corridor leading off the main room with several doors. The layout reminds me a little of the penthouse flat. Only everything here is more cramped and instead of original artworks on the walls, there are peeling posters. Cindy Sherman, Santa Pompidou, and a tour list for someone called Dinos. The first room I come to is an absolute tip. The floor scattered with clothes, lace lingerie in bright sorbet colours and shoes, bras and thongs tangled around the sharp points of heels. A dressing table covered in makeup about twenty mashed lipsticks all missing their lids. The air's so heavily scented with perfume and cigarette smoke, it gives me an instant headache. A huge poster on one wall of Harry Styles in a tutu, and, on the opposite, Dua Lipa in a tux. I think of Mimi in her scowl, her jagged, grungy fringe. I'm pretty sure this isn't her vibe. I close the door. The next room has to be Mimi's. Dark walls, 
big black and white angry prints on the walls, one of a freaky, blank-eyed woman, lots of serious-looking arty tomes on the bookshelf, a record player with a load of vinyls in a special case next to it. The one on the turntable is by the yeah, yeah, yeahs. It's Blitz. I creep across to the window. It turns out that Mimi's got a perfect diagonal view into the main living space of Ben's apartment, across the courtyard. I can see his desk, the sofa. Interesting. I think of her dropping her wine glass earlier when I spoke about Ben. She's hiding something. I know it. I open the cupboard, search through drawers of clothes. Nothing to know. It's all so neat, almost anally so. But the problem is I don't know what I'm looking for. And I suspect I don't have much time before Victor starts wondering why I'm taking so long. I get on my knees and grope around under the bed. My hand connects with what feels like material wrapped around something harder. Wood, maybe. And I just know i found something significant. I get a hold of the whole lot, pull it towards me. A piece of grey material falls open to reveal a ragged pile of artists' canvases, slashed and torn into pieces. So much mess and chaos compared to the rest of the room. I look more closely at the material they were wrapped in. It's a grey t-shirt with acne on the label, an exact match for the ones in Ben's cupboard. I'm sure it's one of his. It even smells like his cologne. Why has Mimi been keeping her art stuff in one of Ben's t-shirts? More importantly, why has she got one of Ben's t-shirts at all? Jesse? Victor calls. Are you okay, Jesse? Shit. It sounds like he's getting closer. I start trying to fit some of the scraps of canvas back together as quickly as I can. It's like doing a really messy jigsaw puzzle. Finally, I've pieced enough pieces of the first one together to see the picture. I stand back. It's a really good likeness. She's even managed to get his smile, which others have called charming, but I'd definitely tell him makes him look like a smarmy git. Here he is, right in front of me. Ben, just as he is in life. Except for one terrible, terrifying difference. I left a hand at my mouth. His eyes have been removed. Jesse? Victor calls again. Where to, Jesse? I fit the next image together, and the next. Jesus, they're all of him. There's even one of him lying down, and Christ alive, that's way more of my brother than I ever needed to see. In every single one, the eyes have been destroyed, punched or torn out with something. I had a feeling Mimi was lying about knowing him the first time I met her. I suspected she was hiding something as soon as her wine glass hit the floor in Sophie Meunier's apartment. But I never expected anything like this. If these are anything to go by, if that nude painting is any clue, she knows Ben very well indeed. And feels strongly enough about him to have done some pretty serious damage to these paintings. Those tears in the fabric could only have been made with something really sharp, or with a lot of force, or both. I stand up, but as I do, a strange thing happens. It's like the whole room tilts with the movement. Whoa. I go to steady myself against the nightstand. I try to blink away the dizziness. I take a step backwards. And it happens again. As I stand, trying to get my balance, it feels like the ground is rolling around under my feet, 
and everything around me is made of jelly. The walls collapsing inwards. I stagger out of the bedroom, into the corridor. I have to keep a hand out on both sides to stop myself from keeling over. And then Victor appears, at the end of the passage. Jesse, there you are. Well, what were you doing? He's walking towards me down the dark corridor. He smiles, and his teeth are very white, just like a real vampire. My only way out is past him. He's blocking my escape. Even with my brain turned to syrup, I know what this is. You don't work in twenty different divey bars and not know what this is. The drink some guys offered to buy you. The freebie that is anything but. I never, ever fall for that shit. What the hell was I thinking? How could I have been so stupid? It's always the pretty ones. The seemingly harmless ones. The so-called nice guys. What the fuck was in that drink, Victor? I ask. And then everything goes black. Monday. Mimi. Fourth floor. Morning. I'm sitting on the balcony watching the light seep into the sky. The joint I stole from Camille hasn't helped me relax. It's just making me feel sick and even more jittery. I feel... I feel like I'm trapped inside my own skin. Like I want to claw my way out. I hurry out of the apartment and run down the twisting stairway to the cav, not wanting to meet anyone on the way. It's full of the detritus from the party last night. Broken glass and spilled drinks and dropped accessories from people's costumes. Wigs and devil's folks and witches' hats. I normally like it better down here. In the dark and the quiet. Another place to hide away. But right now I can't be here either, because his Vespa is there, leaning against the wall. I don't can't look at it as I pull my bicycle from the rack beside it. He always went out on that Vespa. I wanted to know about his life. I wanted to follow him into the city, see where he went, what he did. Who he met with. But it was impossible because he used that bike to go everywhere. So one day, I went down into the cave, and I stabbed a small hole into the front wheel with the very sharp blade of my canvas cutting knife. That was better. He wouldn't be able to use it for a few days. I only did it because I loved him. That afternoon, I saw him leave on foot. My plan had worked. I went after him, followed him into the metro, and got onto the next carriage. He got off in this really shitty part of town. What the hell was he doing there? He went and sat down in this greasy-looking kebab place. I sat in a shisha bar across the road and ordered a Turkish coffee and tried to look like I fitted in among all the old guys puffing away on their rose-scented tobacco. Ben was making me do things I never normally would, I realized. He was making me brave. Ten minutes or so later, a girl came and joined Ben. She was tall and thin, a hood up over her head, which she only took down once she was sitting opposite him. I felt my stomach turn over when I saw her face. Even from across the street, I could see that she was beautiful. Dark chocolate hair with a sharp fringe that looked so much better than my home-cut one. A model's cheekbones. And young. Probably only my age. Yes, her clothes were bad, a fake-looking leather jacket with that hoodie underneath, and cheap jeans. But they somehow made her seem even more beautiful by contrast. As I watched them together, I could actually feel my heart hurting. 
a hot coal burning behind my ribcage. I waited for him to kiss her, to touch her face, her hand, to stroke her hair, anything. Waited for the worst pain I knew would come when I saw him do it. But nothing happened. They just sat there talking. I realized it seemed quite formal, like they didn't actually know each other that well. There was definitely nothing between them to suggest they might be lovers. Finally, he passed her something. I tried to see it. It looked like a phone or a camera, maybe. Then she got up and left, and he did too. They went in different directions. I still couldn't work out why he'd been talking to her or what he might have given her. But I was so relieved I could have cried. He hadn't been unfaithful to me. I knew I shouldn't have doubted him. Later, back in my room, I thought of that night in the park, how we'd shared that cigarette. The two of us in the dark by the lake. The taste of his mouth when I'd kissed him. I thought about it when I lay in bed at night, fingers exploring. And I whispered those words I heard in the darkness by the lake. Je suis ta petite pute. I'm your little whore. This was it. I knew it. This was why I'd waited so long. I was different to Camille. I couldn't just screw around with random guys. It had to be something real. Un grand amour. I had thought I'd been in love before. The art teacher, Henri, at my school, Les Sœurs Servantes du Sacré-Cœur. I'd known we had a connection from the beginning. He'd smiled at me in that first lesson, told me how talented I was. But later, when I sent him the paintings I had made of him, he took me aside and told me they weren't appropriate, even though I'd worked so hard on them, on getting the proportions right, the tone just like he'd taught us. And when I sent them to his wife instead, but cut up into little pieces, they made some kind of formal complaint. And then... Well, I don't want to go into all that. I heard they left for another school abroad. I didn't know where this part of me had been hiding, the part that could fall in love. Actually, I did. I'd been keeping it locked away, deep down inside me, terrified that sort of weakness would make me vulnerable again. But I was ready now, and Ben was different. Ben would be loyal to me. Down in the cab, I tear my eyes away from his Vespa. I feel like there's a metal band around my ribs stopping me from taking in enough air, and in my ears, still this horrible rushing sound. The white noise, the storm. I just need to make it stop. I yank my bike free and haul it up the stairs. I can feel the pressure building inside me as I wheel it across the courtyard, as I push it along the cobbled street all the way down to the main road, where the morning rush hour traffic is roaring past. I jump onto the saddle, look quickly in each direction through the tears blurring my eyes, push straight out into the street. There's a screech of brakes, the blare of a horn. Suddenly I'm lying on my side on the tarmac, the wheel spinning. My whole body feels bruised and torn, my heart's pounding. That was so close. You stupid little bitch! The van driver screams, hanging out of his open window and gesturing at me with his cigarette. What the fuck were you doing? What the hell were you thinking pulling out into the road without looking? I yell back, my language even worse than his. I call him a fils de pute, son of a whore. Un sac de merde! a bag of shit. I tell him he can go fuck himself. I tell him he can't drive for shit. Suddenly the front door of the apartment building clangs open and the concierge is running out. I've never seen that woman move so fast. She always seems so old and hunched. 
but maybe she moves more quickly when you're not looking. Because she's always there when you least expect to see her, appearing around corners and out of shadows, lurking in the background. I don't know why we even have a concierge. Most places don't have them any longer. We should have just installed a modern intercom system. It would be much better than having her around snooping on everyone. I don't like the way she watches. Especially how she watches me. Without saying anything, she puts out her hands, helps me to stand up. She's much stronger than I ever would have guessed. Then she looks at me closely. Intensely. I feel like she's trying to tell me something. I look away. It makes me think she knows something. Like maybe she knows everything. I throw off her hand. Ça va? I say. I'm okay. I can get up on my own. My knees are still stinging like a kid who has taken a tumble in the playground. And my bike chain has come off. But that's the worst of it. It could have ended so differently. If I hadn't been such a coward. Because the truth is, I was looking. That was the point. I knew exactly what I was doing. It was so close. Just not close enough. Sophie, penthouse. I descend the staircase with Benoit trotting at my heels. As I pass the third floor, I pause. I can feel her there, behind the door, like something poisonous at the heart of this place. It was the same with him. His presence upset the building's equilibrium. I seem to see him everywhere after that dinner on the terrace, in the stairwell, crossing the courtyard, talking to the concierge. We never talk to the concierge, beyond issuing instructions. She is a member of staff. That sort of divide must be respected. Once I even saw him following her into her cabin. What could they be speaking about in there? What might she be telling him? When the third note came, it wasn't left in the letterbox. It was pushed beneath the door of the apartment, at a time when I suppose my blackmailer knew Jacques would be out. I had returned from the boulangerie with Jacques' favorite quiche, which I have bought for him every Friday for as long as I can remember. When I saw the note, I dropped the box I was holding. Pastry shattered across the floor. It sent a thrill through me that I knew had to be fear, but for a moment felt almost like excitement. And that was just as disturbing. I had been invisible for so long, any currency spent long ago. But these notes, even as they frightened me, felt like the first time in a very long while that I had been seen. I knew I could not stay in the building for a moment longer. Outside, the streets were still white with heat, the air shimmering. At the cafes, tourists clustered at pavement tables and sweated into their thé glacé and citron pressé and wondered why they didn't feel refreshed. But in the restaurant, it was dim and cool as some underwater grotto, as I had known it would be. Dark panelled walls, white tablecloths, huge paintings upon the walls. They'd given me the best table, of course. Meunier, Salle, has supplied them with rare vintages over the years. And the air conditioning sent an icy plume down the back of my silk shirt as I sipped my mineral water. Madame Meunier, the waiter came over. Bienvenue. The usual? Every time I have eaten there with Jacques, I have ordered the same. The endive salad, with walnuts and tiny dabs of roquefort. An aging wife is one thing. A fat wife is another. But Jacques was not there. L'entricot, I said. The waiter looked at me as though I had asked for a slab of human flesh. The steak has always been Jacques's choice. But madame, he said, it is so hot. Perhaps the oysters? We have some wonderful pouce en clair, or a little salmon, cooked sous vide? The steak, I repeated. Blue. 
The last time I ate steak was when a gynecologist, all those years ago, prescribed it for fertility. Doctors here still recommend red meat and wine for many ailments. Months of eating like a caveman. When that didn't work came the indignity of the treatments, the injections into my buttocks, Jacques' glances of vague disgust. I'd inherited two stepsons. What was this obsession with having a child? I could not explain that I simply wanted someone to love. Wholehearted, unreserved, requited. Of course, the treatments didn't work, and Jacques refused to adopt. The paperwork, the scrutiny into his business affairs, he would not stand for it. The steak came, and I cut into it, watched as the blood ran thin and pale as pink from the incision. It was then that I looked up and saw him, Benjamin Daniels, in the corner of the restaurant. He had his back to me, though I could see his reflection in the mirror that ran along the wall. Something elegant about the line of his back, the way he sat, hands in his pockets, the posture of someone very comfortable in their own skin. I felt my pulse quicken. What was he doing here? He glanced up and caught me watching him in the mirror, but I suspected he knew I was there all along, had been waiting for me to notice him. His reflection raised the glass of beer. I looked away, sipped my mineral water. A few seconds later, a shadow fell across the table. I looked up, that ingratiating smile. He wore a crumpled linen shirt and shorts, legs bare and brown. His clothes were entirely inappropriate for the restaurant's formality. And yet he seemed so relaxed in the space. I hated him for it. Hello, Sophie, he said. I bristled at the familiarity, then remembered I had asked him not to call me Madame. But the way he said my name, it felt like a transgression. May I? He indicated the chair. To do anything other than agree would have been rude. I nodded to show I didn't care either way what he did. It was the first time I had been so close to him. Now I saw that he wasn't handsome, not in the traditional sense. His features were uneven. His confidence, charisma, that was what made him attractive. What are you doing here? I asked. I'm reviewing the place, he said. Jacques suggested it at dinner. I haven't eaten yet, but I'm already impressed by the space, the atmosphere, the art. I glanced at the painting he was looking at. A woman on her knees, powerfully built, almost masculine, strong limbs, strong jaw, nothing elegant about her, only a kind of feral strength. Her head thrown back, howling at the moon like a dog. The splayed legs, the skirt rucked. It was almost sexual. If you could get close enough to sniff it, I imagined it wouldn't be paint you smelt, but blood. I felt suddenly very aware of the sweat that might have soaked into the silk beneath my arms on the walk over here, hidden half-moons of damp in the fabric. What do you think? he asked. I love Paolo Rego. I'm not sure I agree, I said. He pointed to my lip. You have a little... just there. I put the corner of the napkin up to my mouth and dabbed, took it away, and saw that the thick white linen was stained with blood. I stared at it. He coughed. I sense... Look, I just wanted to say that I hope we haven't got off on the wrong foot. The other day, when I commented on your accent, I hope I didn't seem rude. Minon, I said. What would make you think that? Look, I took French studies at Cambridge, you see. I'm just fascinated by such things. I was not offended, I told him. Pas de deux, not at all. He grinned. That's a relief. And I enjoyed the dinner on the roof terrace so much. It was kind of you to invite me. I didn't invite you, I said. That was all Jack's idea. Perhaps it sounded rude, but it was also true. No invitation would be offered without Jack's say-so. Poor Jack, then, he said with a rueful smile. The weather that night. I've never seen anyone so furious. I actually thought he was going to try and take the storm on like Leah, the look on his face. I laughed. I couldn't help it. I should have been appalled, offended. No one made a joke at my husband's expense. But it was the surprise of it. And he put such an accurate impression of Jacques' outraged expression. Trying to regain my composure, 
I reached for my water, took a sip. But I felt lighter than I had in a very long time. Tell me, he said. What is it like being married to a man like Jacques Meunier? The sip caught in my throat. Now I was coughing, my eyes watering. One of the waiters ran forward to offer assistance. I waved him away with a hand. All I could think was, what did Ben know? What could Nicholas have told him? Sorry. He gave a quick smile. I don't think my question came out quite right. Sometimes I can be so clumsy in French. What I meant was, being married to such a successful businessman, what's it like? I didn't answer. The look I gave him by way of reply said, you don't frighten me. Except I was frightened. He was the sender of the notes, I was certain of it now. He was the one collecting those envelopes of cash I left beneath the loose step. I just meant, he said, that should you ever want to give an interview, I'd be so interested to talk to you. You could talk about what it is to run such a successful business. It's not my business. Oh, I'm sure that isn't true. I'm sure you must know. I leant across the table to emphasize the point, tapped out each word with a fingernail on the tablecloth. The business is nothing to do with me. Comprenez-vous? Do you understand? Okay. Well, he looked at his watch. The offer still stands. It could be more of a lifestyle piece, on you as the quintessential Parisian, something like that. You know where I am. He smiled. I just looked at him. Perhaps you don't understand who you're dealing with here. There are things I have had to do to get to where I am. Sacrifices I have had to make. People I have had to climb over. You are nothing compared to all that. Anyway, he stood. I better be going. I have a meeting with my editor. I'll see you around. When I was sure he had gone, I called the waiter over. The 1998. His eyes widened. He looked as though he was about to offer an alternative to such a heavy red in that heat. Then he saw my expression. He nodded, scurried away, returned with the bottle. As I drank, I remembered a night early in my marriage. The Opera Garnier, where we watched Madame Butterfly beneath Chagall's painted ceiling and sipped chilled champagne in the bar in the interval and I hoped Jacques might show me the famous reliefs of the moon and the sun painted in pure gold on the domed ceilings of the little chambres at each end. But he was more interested in pointing out people, clients of his, ministers for certain governmental departments, businessmen, significant figures from the French media. Some of them even I recognized, though they didn't know me. But they all knew Jacques, returning his nod with tight little nods of their own. I knew exactly what sort of man I was marrying. I went into the whole thing clear-eyed. I knew what I'd be getting out of it. No, our marriage would not always be perfect. But what marriage is? And he gave me my daughter in the end. I could forgive anything for that. Now, I pause for a moment on the landing, outside the third-floor apartment. Stare at the brass number three. Remember standing in this exact spot all those weeks ago. I'd spent the rest of the afternoon at the restaurant, drinking my way through the 1998 vintage, as all the waiters no doubt watched appalled. Madame Meunier has gone mad. As I drank, I thought about Benjamin Daniels and his impertinence, about the notes, the horrible power they had over me. My rage blossomed. For the first time in a long time, I felt truly alive as though I might be capable of anything. I came back to the apartment as dusk was falling, climbed the stairs, stood on this same spot and knocked on the door. Benjamin answered it quickly, before I had a chance to change my mind. Sophie, he said. What a pleasant surprise. He was wearing a t-shirt, jeans. His feet were bare. There was music playing on the record player behind him, a record spinning round lazily, an open beer in his hand. It occurred to me that he might have someone there with him, which I hadn't even considered. Come in, he said. I followed him into the apartment. I suddenly felt as though I was trespassing, which was absurd. This was my home. He was the intruder. Can I get you a drink? He asked. No, thank you. Please, 
I have some wine open. He gestured to his beer bottle. It's wrong, my drinking while you don't. Somehow, he had already managed to wrong foot me by being so gracious, so charming. I should have been prepared for it. No, I said. I don't want any. This is not a social visit. Besides, I could still feel my head swimming from the wine I had drunk in the restaurant. He grimaced. I apologize, he said. If this is about the restaurant, my questions, I know that was presumptuous of me. I realize I crossed a line. It's not that. My heart was beating very fast. I had been carried here by my anger, but now I felt afraid. Voicing this thing would bring it into the light, would finally make it real. It's you, isn't it? He frowned. What? He hadn't expected this, I thought. Now it was his turn to be on the back foot. It gave me the confidence I needed to go on. The notes. He looked nonplussed. Notes? You know what I'm talking about. The notes. The demands for payment. I have come to tell you that you do not want to threaten me. There is little I will not do to protect myself. I will. I will stop at nothing. I can still hear his awkward, apologetic laugh. Madame Meunier. Sophie. I'm so sorry, but I have literally no idea what you're talking about. What notes? The ones you have been leaving for me, I said in my letterbox, under my door. I watched his face so carefully, but I saw only confusion. Either he was a consummate actor, which I wouldn't have put past him, or what I was saying really didn't mean anything to him. Could it be true? I looked at him, at his bemused expression, and I realized in spite of myself that I believed him. But it didn't make sense. If not him, then who? I... The room seemed to tilt a little, a combination of the wine I had drunk and this new realization. Would you like to sit down? He asked. And I did sit, because suddenly I wasn't sure that I could stand. He poured me a glass of wine without asking this time. I needed it. I took the offered glass and tried not to hold the stem so tightly that it snapped. He sat down next to me. I looked at him. This man who had been a thorn in my side since he arrived, who had occupied so much space in my thoughts, who had made me feel seen with all the discomfort that came with that, just when I thought I had become invisible for good. Invisible had been safe, if occasionally lonely. But I had forgotten how exciting it could feel to be seen. I was in a kind of trance, perhaps, or the wine I had drunk before coming here to face him. The pressure that had been building in me for weeks as my blackmailer taunted me. The loneliness that had been growing for years in secrecy and silence. I leant over, and I kissed him. Almost immediately I pulled away. I could not believe what I had done. I put a hand up to my face, touched my hot cheek. He smiled at me. I hadn't seen this smile before. This was something new, something intimate and secret. Something just for me. I... I need to leave. I put my wine glass down, and as I did, I knocked his beer bottle to the ground. Oh, mon Dieu, I'm sorry. I don't care about the beer. And then he cradled my head in his hands, and pulled me towards him, and kissed me back. The scent of him, the foreignness of it, the alien feel of his lips on mine, the loss of my self-control, these were all a surprise. But not the kiss itself. Not really. In some part of myself, I had known I wanted him. Never since that first day, he said, as though he were echoing my own thoughts. When I saw you in the courtyard, I wanted to know more about you. That's ridiculous, I said, because it was. But what made it feel less so was the way he was looking at me. It's not. I've been hoping to do that ever since that night at your drinks party, when it was just the two of us in your husband's study. I thought of the outrage I had felt, finding him in there looking at that photograph. The fear. But fear and desire are so tangled up in one another, after all. That's absurd, I said. What about Dominique? Dominique? He seemed genuinely confused. I saw you two together at the drinks. He laughed. She could eye-fuck a statue. 
and it was convenient for me to be able to distract your husband from the fact that I was lusting after his wife. He reached out and pulled me towards him again. This can't happen. But I think he heard my lack of conviction because he grinned. I hate to say it, but it already is happening. We have to be careful, I whispered a few minutes later as I began unbuttoning my shirt. As I revealed the lingerie that had been bought at great expense but hardly ever seen by eyes other than my own. Revealed my body. Denied so much pleasure. Kept and kempt for a man who barely glanced at it. He dropped to his knees in front of me, as though worshipping at my feet. Pushed down the tight wool of my trousers, finding the thin lace of my knickers with his lips. Opening his mouth against me. Nick, second floor. I didn't sleep well last night. And not just because of the bass from the party in the cab thumping up the stairwell all night. In the bathroom, I shake two more little blue pills into my hand. They're about the only thing keeping me functioning right now. I toss them back. I wander out into the apartment. As I pass the iMac, the screen flickers to life. Did I jolt it? If so, I didn't notice. But there it is. The photograph of Ben and me. I stand frozen in place in front of it. Drawn to it in the same way, I suppose, that a self-harmer is drawn to run the razor blade over the skin of their wrist. After that dinner on the rooftop, everything was different. Something had shifted. I didn't like the way Papa had favoured Ben. I didn't like the way Ben's eyes slid away from mine when he talked about our Europe trip. I also very much didn't like the fact that every time I suggested we go for a drink, he was too busy. Had to rush off to see his editor to review some new restaurant. Avoiding my calls, my texts. Avoiding my eye when we met on the stairs. This wasn't how it was supposed to be. It wasn't what I'd planned when I had offered him the apartment. He had been the one to get in touch with me. His email had blown open the past. I had taken a huge risk inviting him here. I had assumed we had an unspoken agreement. I walk across to the wall behind my iMac, run my hands over the surface, feel the thin crack in the plaster. There's a second staircase here, a hidden one. Antoine and I used to play in it when we were kids. Used it to hide from Papa, too, when he was in one of his dangerous moods. I'm ashamed to admit this, but there were a couple of times when I used it to watch Ben, peering into his apartment, into his life, trying to work out what he was up to, wondering what he could be writing so busily on his laptop, who he was calling on his mobile. I strained to hear the words, but caught nothing. Though he snubbed me, it seemed he did have time for the other residents of this place. I found them in the cab one afternoon when I came down to do my washing. Heard the laughter first, then Papa's voice. Of course, when I inherited the business from their mother, it was a mess. Had to make it profitable. Have to be creative now with a wine business, especially when the estate's no longer producing, and it'll all turn to vinegar soon. Have to find ways to diversify. What's going on? I called. A private tasting. They stepped out of the wine cellar like two naughty schoolboys. Papa holding a bottle in one hand, two glasses in the other. Ben's teeth when he smiled were tinted from the wine he'd drunk. He held one of the few remaining magnum bottles of the 1996 vintage. A gift from my father, it seemed. Nicolas. Papa drawled. I suppose you've come to break up the party. Not, would you like to join us, son? Care for a glass? In all the time I have lived under his roof, my father has never suggested the two of us do anything like their cozy little wine tasting. It was salt in the wound. The first proper betrayal. I told Ben what sort of man my father really is. 
Had he forgotten? Ben grins out at me from the photograph on the screensaver. And there I am grinning away next to him, like the fool that I was. July, Amsterdam. The sun in our eyes. Talking to Jess has brought it all back. That evening, Ben and I spent in the weed cafe, telling him all about my birthday, the gift from Papa. How it was like a catharsis, how I felt cleansed, purged of it all. Afterwards, Ben and I wandered out into the darkening streets, just kept walking, chatting. I wasn't sure where we were going. I don't think he had a clue either. Somewhere along the way, we'd left the touristy part of town and the crowds behind. These canals were quieter, more dimly lit. Elegant old houses with long windows through which you could see people inside, talking over glasses of wine, eating dinner, a guy typing at a desk. This was somewhere people actually lived. You couldn't hear anything other than the lapping of the water against the stone banks. Black water, black as ink the lights from the houses dancing on it, and the smell like moss and mold. An ancient smell. No queasy clouds of weed to walk through here. I was sick of the reek of it, sick too of the crush of other people's bodies, the chatter of other people's conversation. I was sick even of the two other guys, their voices, the stink of their pits, their sweaty feet. We'd spent too long together that summer. I'd heard every joke or story they had to tell. With Ben, it was different somehow, though I couldn't put my finger on why. This quiet. I felt like I wanted to drink it in like a cold glass of water. It felt magical. And telling Ben all that stuff about my dad. You know when you've eaten something bad and after you vomit you feel empty but also kind of cleansed, almost better than before in some indefinable way. Thanks. I said again, for listening. You won't tell anyone, will you, the other guys? No, of course not, he said. This is our secret, mate, if you like. We were walking along a part of the canal now that was even darker. I think a couple of the lamps had stopped working. It was deathly quiet. You know those moments in life that seem to happen so smoothly it feels like they've been scripted in advance? This was like that. I don't remember any conscious decision to move towards him. But the next thing I knew, I was kissing him. It was definitely me that made the first move. I know that. Even if it was like my body moved before my brain had worked out what it was going to do. I'd kissed plenty of people. Girls, I mean. Only ever girls, at house parties or drunk after a formal, a college ball, fooled around. And it wasn't unpleasant. But it had never felt any more intimate or exciting than, I don't know, a handshake. It didn't disgust me exactly, but the whole time it was happening, I'd found myself thinking about the logistical things, like whether I was using my fingers and tongue right, feeling a little queasy about how much saliva was being passed back and forth between us. It felt like a sport I was practicing, maybe trying to get better at. It never felt like something exciting, something that made my pulse quicken. But this, this was different. It was as innate as breathing. It was strange how firm his mouth seemed after the softness of the girls I'd kissed. I wouldn't have thought there would be a difference. And it seemed so right, somehow like it was the thing I'd been waiting for, the thing that made sense. I took hold of the chain around his neck, the one I had watched so many times appear and disappear beneath the line of his shirt, the one with the little figure of the saint hanging from it. I gave it a little tug, pulled him closer to me. And then we were moving backwards into the darkness. I was pushing him into some secret corner, falling to my knees in front of him. Again, every movement so fluid, like it had all been written out in advance, like it was meant to be. Unzipping his fly and taking him in my mouth, the warmth and hardness, the secret scent of his skin. My knees stung where I knelt on the rough cobblestones, 
and even though I'd never allowed myself to think about this, I must have thought about it somewhere in my subconscious, somewhere in my deepest thoughts hidden even from myself, because I knew exactly what I was doing. He smiled afterwards, a sleepy, lazy, stone smile. But for me, after that rush of euphoria, there was an immediate descent. I've never had a come down like it. My knees hurt. My jeans were damp from something I'd knelt in. Fuck. Fuck. I don't know what happened there. Shit. I'm just... I'm so wasted. Which was a lie. I had been stoned, yes. But I never felt more clear-headed in my life. I'd never felt more alive, either. Electric, wired. So many different things. Mate he said with a smile. It's nothing to be worried about. We were a bit pissed, a lot stoned. He gestured around us, shrugged. And it's not like anyone saw. I couldn't believe how relaxed he was about it. But maybe at the back of my mind I'd known this about him, this side of him. I'd once heard someone at Cambridge describe him as an omnivore. Wondered what that meant. Don't tell anyone. I told him. I was light-headed with fear suddenly. Look, you don't understand. This, it has to stay just between us. If it somehow got back, look, my dad, he wouldn't get it. The thought of him finding out was like a punch to the gut. It winded me just thinking about it. I could see his face, hear his voice could still remember what he'd said when I told him I didn't want that birthday gift, what was in that room. What's wrong with you, son? Are you a faggot? The disgust in his voice. He actually might kill me, I thought, if he suspected. He'd probably prefer that to having a son like me. At the very least, he'd disinherit me. And while I didn't know how I felt about taking his money, I wasn't ready to give it up just yet. After Amsterdam, I decided I never wanted to see Benjamin Daniels again. We drifted apart. I had a string of girlfriends. I left for the States for nearly a decade, didn't look back. Yeah, there were a couple of guys there, the freedom of thousands of miles of land and water, even if I still always seemed to hear my father's voice in my head. But nothing serious. It doesn't mean I didn't think about that night later. In a way, I know I've been thinking about it ever since, trying not to. And then, all those years later, Ben's email. It had to mean something, him getting in touch like that, out of the blue. It couldn't just be a casual catch-up. Except after that dinner on the terrace, when he'd so impressed Papa, I barely saw or spoke to him other than in passing. He even had time for the concierge, for God's sake, but not me, his old friend. He was ensconced here, practically rent-free. He'd taken what he needed and then cut loose. I began to feel used, and when I thought about how shifty he was each time I approached him, I felt a little frightened, too, though I couldn't put my finger on why. I thought of Antoine's words about Papa disinheriting us on a whim. It had seemed like madness at the time. But now, I began to feel that I didn't want Ben here after all. I began to feel that I wanted to take back the invitation. But I didn't know how to do it. He knew too much. Had so much he could use against me. I had to find another way to make him leave. The computer's timer must have run out. The screen of my iMac goes black. It doesn't matter. I can still see the image. I've been haunted by it for over a decade. I think about how I nearly kissed his sister last night. The sudden, shocking, wonderful resemblance to him when she turned her head just so, or frowned, or laughed. And also the resemblance of the moment, the darkness, the stillness. The two of us held apart from the rest of the world for just a beat. That night, in Amsterdam. 
It was the worst, most shameful thing I had ever done. It was the best thing that had ever happened to me. That was how I used to see it anyway. Until he came to stay. Jess. I wake in darkness. There's a heavy weight on my chest, a horrible taste in my mouth, my tongue dry and heavy like it doesn't belong to me. For a few long moments, everything that happened to me before now is a total blank. It feels like peering forward and staring into a black hole. I grope around, trying to make out my surroundings. I seem to be lying on a bed. But which bed? Whose? Fuck. What happened to me? Gradually I remember. The party. That disgusting drink. Victor the vampire. And then I see something I recognise. Some little green digits glowing in the blackness. It's Ben's alarm clock. Somehow I'm back here, in the apartment. I blink at the numbers. 1738. But that can't be right. That's the afternoon. That would mean I've been asleep for... Jesus Christ. The whole day. I try to sit up. I make out two huge, glowing, slit-pupiled eyes a few inches from my nose. The cat is sitting on me. So that's the weight on my chest. It starts kneading its claws into my throat in painful little darts. I push it away. It hops off the bed. I look down at myself. I'm fully clothed, thank God. And I remember now, in flashes of memory. Victor was the one who got me down here after I blacked out in Mimi's apartment. Not the date-raping predator I suddenly thought he might be. In fact, he'd seemed scared by the state I was in, left as quick as he could. I suppose at least he tried to help. A flicker of memory. I found something last night. Something that felt important. But at first, everything that happened only comes back to me in hazy, disjointed fragments. There are big missing patches like holes in a jigsaw. I know my dreams were really trippy. I recall an image of Ben shouting at me through a pane of glass, but I couldn't see his face clearly. The glass seemed warped. He was trying to warn me of something, but I couldn't hear what he was saying. And then suddenly, I could see his face clearly. But that was much, much worse. Because he didn't have any eyes. Someone had scratched them out. Now I remember the paintings under Mimi's bed. Jesus Christ. That's what I found last night. Those tears in the canvas. Like she'd ripped them all apart in some kind of frenzy. The slashes. The holes where the eyes should have been. And Ben's t-shirt wrapped around them. I haul myself out of bed. Stumble into the main room. My head throbs. I might be small, but I'm not a cheap date. One drink is not enough to get me in that much of a state. It might not have been Victor, but I'm pretty sure of one thing. Someone did this to me. A loud trilling. So loud in the silence it makes me jump. My phone. Theo's name flashes up on the screen. I pick up. Hello? I know what that card is. No niceties, no preamble. What? I ask. What are you talking about? The card you gave me, the metal one, with the firework on it. I know what it is. Look, can you meet me at quarter to seven? So, in about an hour. 
the Palais Royal metro station. We can walk from there. Oh, and try and look as smart as possible. I don't... But he's already hung up. Mimi, fourth floor. I put the stuff in her drink last night. It was so easy. There was ketamine going around, and I got hold of some, shook the powder into her glass until it dissolved, and asked one of Camille's friends to give it to the British girl with the red hair. He seemed only too pleased to do it. She's quite pretty, I suppose. I had to do it. I couldn't have her there. But that doesn't mean I don't feel bad about it. I've been so careful my whole life about drugs, apart from that night in the park, and then to inflict them on someone else without them even knowing? That wasn't cool. It's not her fault she made the mistake of coming to this place. That's the worst part. She's probably not even a bad person. But I know I am. Camille comes out of her room wearing a silk sleep, black rings of smudged makeup around her eyes. This is the first time she surfaced all day. Hey, last night was crazy. People really enjoyed it, don't you think? She looks at me closely. Putain, Mimi, you look like shit. What happened to your knees? They still hurt from where I hit the tarmac in front of that van. The concierge insisted on dabbing some antiseptic onto the grazes. She grins. Someone had a good night, no? I shrug. Oui, I suppose so. Actually, it was probably one of the worst nights of my life. But I didn't... Sleep well. I didn't sleep at all. She looks at me more closely. Oh, was it that kind of no sleep? What do you mean? I wish she'd stop looking at me so intently. You know what I mean. Your mystery guy? My heart suddenly beating too fast in my chest. Oh, no, it wasn't anything like that. Wait, she grins at me. You never told me. Did it work? What do you mean, did it work? I feel like she's crowding me, the smell of Miss Dior and stale cigarette smoke suddenly overpowering. I need her out of my space. The stuff we picked out. Mimi! She raises her eyebrows. You can't have forgotten. It was only like two weeks ago. Already it feels like it happened to someone else. I see myself like a character in a film, knocking on the door to Camille's room, Camille sitting on the bed, painting her toenails, the room stinking of nail polish and weed. I want to buy some lingerie, I told her. Maman always brought all my underwear. We went together every season to RS, and she would buy me three simple sets, black, white, nude but I wanted something different, something I had picked myself. Only I didn't have any idea where to go. I knew Camille would. Camille's eyebrows shot up. Mimi, what's happened to you? That new look and now lingerie? Who is he? She smiled slyly. Or she? Merde, you're so mysterious. I don't even know if you actually prefer girls. A smack. Or oh, maybe you're like me. And it depends what mood you're in. Could she really not know who it was? To me it seemed so obvious. Not just that I was into him. But that he and I had a special connection. It felt like it was obvious to the outside world, to everyone who saw us. Come, she said, jumping up, throwing her foam toe dividers to one side. We're going now. She dragged me into Passage du Désir in Châtelet. It's a sex shop, one of a chain, on a big, busy shopping street, 
alongside shoe and clothes shops because I guess this is France and screwing is like a thing of national pride. You see couples coming out carrying bags over their arms, smiling secret smiles at each other. Women striding in there on their lunch breaks to buy vibrators. I'd never gone into one before. In fact, every time I'd passed one of their stores, I'd blushed at the window displays and looked away. I felt like everyone in there was looking at me, wondering what this blushing, loser virgin was doing among all that latex, fetish wear and lube. I lowered my head, trying to hide behind my new fringe. I had horrific images of Papa walking past and somehow spotting me inside dragging me out by my hair, calling me in petite salope in front of the whole street. Camille dug out boxes with things called love kits in whole lingerie and suspender sets for 10 euros. But I shook my head. They weren't sophisticated enough. She grabbed a huge, bright pink dildo with obscene protruding veins, waved it in front of me. Maybe you should get one of these while we're here. Put it back, I hissed, ready to die of shame. Yeah, we have that expression in French too. Mourir de honte. Masturbating is healthy, chérie, Camille said, way louder than she needed to. She was enjoying this, I could tell. You know what's not healthy? Not masturbating. I bet that school your papa sent you to told you it's a sin. I've told Camille about the school, just not why I had to leave. Va te faire foutre, I said, giving her a shove. Ah, but that's exactly what you need to do. Go fuck yourself. I dragged her out of there. We went into a classier place where the shop assistants with their chignons and their perfect red lipstick looked at me sideways. My men's shirts, my big boots, my home-cut fringe. A security guard tailed us. That would be enough normally. I'd leave. But I needed to do this. For him. I want to pick out something too, Camille told me, holding a silk harness up against herself. You own more stuff than this entire shop. We? Oui? But I want something more sophisticated, you know? Who's it for? I asked her. Someone new. She gave a secretive smile. That was weird. Camille's never mysterious about anything. If she has a new fuck buddy on the scene, the whole world has normally heard about it about 30 minutes after their first screw. Tell me, I said. But still she refused to say. I didn't like this new, mysterious Camille. But I felt too high with the thrill of my purchase to think much about it. I couldn't wait. Next to the shelves of designer sex toys, we browsed through racks of lace and silk, felt the fabric between our fingers. The lingerie had to be perfect. Some of it was too much. Crotchless, buckles and straps, leather... Some of it Camille rejected as stuff your maman would buy. Flowers and silk in pastel colors. Pink, pistachio, lavender. Then, I found it, the one for you. She held it up to me. It was the most expensive set of all the ones we'd looked at. Black lace and silk, so fine, you could hardly feel it between your fingers. Chic, but still sexy. Grown up. In a changing room with velvet drapes, I tried the set on. I held up my hair and half closed my eyes. I was feeling less embarrassed now. I'd never looked at myself like this before. I thought I'd feel stupid. Gauche. I thought I'd worry about my small tits, my slight pot belly, my bow legs. But I didn't. Instead, I imagined revealing myself to him. I pictured the look on his face. Saw him sliding it off me. 
Je suis ta petite pute. After I changed, I took it over to the desk and told the shop assistant to ring it up. I liked how she tried to hide her surprise as I took out my credit card. Yeah, fuck you, bitch. I could buy everything in here if I wanted. All the way back to the apartment, I thought about the bag over my arm. It weighed nothing, but suddenly, it was everything. For the next few nights, I watched him through the windows. They'd got later and later these writing sessions, fueled by the pots of coffee he'd make on his stove and drink looking out of the windows onto the courtyard. It was something important, I could tell. I could see how fast he typed, hunched over the keyboard. Maybe he'd let me read it one day soon. I'd be the first person he shared it with. I watched him bend down and stroke the cat's head, and I imagined I was that cat. I imagined one day I would lie there on his sofa, with my head in his lap, and he would stroke my hair like he did that cat's fur. And we'd listen to records, and we'd talk about all the plans we'd make. I saw the image of us there together in his apartment so clearly. It was like I was watching it. So clearly that it felt like a premonition. Nick, second floor. A hammering on the door of my apartment. I jump with shock. Who is it? Laissez-moi entrer. Let me in. More hammering. The door shudders on its hinges. I go to open it. Antoine shoves his way past me into the room in a cloud of booze and stale sweat. I take a step back. He pushed his way in here like this only two weeks ago. Dominique's cheating on me. I know she is, the little slut. She comes back smelling of a different scent. I called her yesterday in the stairwell, and I heard her ringtone coming from somewhere in this building. Second time I rang, she'd switched it off. She told me she was having a pedicure in Saint-Germain. It's him, I know it. It's that English connard you invited to live here. And me thinking, could it be true? Ben and Dominique? Yes, there had been flirtation at that drinks on the roof terrace. I hadn't read anything into it. Ben flirted with everyone. But could this be an explanation for why he had been avoiding my eye, avoiding my calls, why he had been so busy? Now Antoine snaps his fingers in front of my face. Hey, wakey, wakey, petit frère. He doesn't say it affectionately. His eyes are bloodshot, breath rank with wine. I couldn't believe the change when I came back after those years away. When I left, my brother was a happy newlywed. Now he's an alcoholic mess whose wife has left him. That's what working for our father does to you. What are we going to do about her? He demands. The girl. Just calm down. Calm down? He stabs the air in front of me with a finger. I take another step back. He may be a mess, but I'll always be the younger brother, ready to duck a punch. And he's so like Papa when he's angry. You know this is all your fault, don't you? All your mess. If you hadn't invited that cunt to live here, coming here and thinking he could just, just help himself. You know he used you, right? But you couldn't see that, could you? You couldn't see any of it. He frowns, mock thoughtful. Well, in fact, now that I think about it, the way you looked at him... Ferme ta gueule. Shut your mouth. I take a step towards him. The anger is sudden, blinding. And when I'm next aware of what I'm doing, I realize my hand is around his throat and his eyes are bulging. I loosen my fingers, but with an effort, as though some part of me resists the instruction. Antoine puts up a hand, rubs at his neck. Hit a nerve there, didn't I, little bro? His voice is hoarse, his eyes a little frightened, his tone not as flippant as he'd probably like it. Papa wouldn't like that, would he? No, he wouldn't like that at all. I'm sorry. I say, ashamed. My hand aches. 
Shit, I'm sorry. This isn't helping anything, us fighting like this. Oh, look at you, so grown up. Embarrassed about your little hissy fit because you like pretending that you're sorted, don't you? But you're just as fucked up as I am. When he says the word fucked, a harsh foutu in French, a huge gob of spit lands on my cheek. I put my hand up, wipe it off. I want to go and wash my face, scrub at it with hot water and soap. I feel infected by him. When Jess spoke about Antoine last night, I saw him through a stranger's eyes. I was ashamed of him. She's right. He is a mess. But I hated her saying it, because he's also my brother. We can do our family members down as much as we like, but the second an outsider insults them, our blood seethes. At the end of the day, I don't like him, but I love him. And I see my own failures in him. For Antoine, it's the booze. For me, it's the pills, the self-punishing exercise. I might be a little more in control of my addictions. I might be less of a mess, in public anyway. But is that really something to boast about? Antoine's grinning at me. Bet you wish you'd never come back here, huh? He takes another step closer. Tell me. If it was all so great rubbing shoulders with the high flyers in Silicon Valley, why did you come back? Ah, oui, because you're no better than the rest of us. You try and pretend you are, that you don't need him, his money. But then you came crawling back here like we all do, wanting to suck a little more from the paternal teat. Just shut the fuck up! I shout, hands forming fists. I take a long breath. In for four. Out for eight, like my mindfulness app tells me. I'm not proud of myself losing my temper like this. I'm better than this. I'm not this guy. But no one can get under my skin like Antoine. No one else knows exactly what to say and how to say it for maximum impact. Except my father, of course. But the worst part is that my brother's right. I came back. Back to the pater familias, like some seasonal bird returning to the same poisoned lake. You've come home, son, Papa told me as we sat together up on the roof terrace on my first night back. I always knew you would. We'll have to make a trip to the Ile de Ré, take the boat out one weekend. Maybe he'd changed. Mellowed. He didn't taunt me over the money I'd lost on the investment. Not yet. He even offered me a cigar, which I smoked, though I loathed the taste. Maybe he'd missed me. It was only later that I realized it wasn't that at all. It was just more proof of his power. I had failed at finding a life apart from him. If you want any more of my money, he told me, you can come back under my roof so I can keep an eye on you. There'll be no more gallivanting around the world. I want a return on my investment. I want to know you're not pissing it all up the wall. Tu comprends? Do you understand? Antoine is pacing up and down in front of me. So what are we going to do about her? He asks with drunken belligerence. Keep your voice down, I say. She might understand something. The walls have ears in this place. Well, what the fuck is she still doing here? He kicks at the doorframe. What if she goes to the police? I've handled that. What do you mean? It helps to have friends in high places. He understands. But she needs to go. He's muttering to himself now. If we could lock her out, it would be so easy. All we need to do is change the combination on the front gate. She wouldn't be able to get in then. No. I say. That wouldn't. Or we could make her leave. Little girl like that wouldn't be hard. No. If anything, we'd just force her into going to the police again on her own. Antoine lets out something between a roar and a groan. He's a total liability. Family, huh? Because blood is always thicker than water in the end. Or as we say in French, la voix du sang est la plus forte. The voice of blood is the strongest summoning me back here to this place. It's better that she stays here, I say sharply. You must see that. 
It's better that we can keep an eye on her. For the time being, we simply have to hold our nerve. Papa will know what to do. Have you heard from him? Antoine says, Papa. His tone has changed. Something needy in it. When he said Papa, for a second he sounded like the little boy he once was. The little boy who sat outside his mother's bedroom as Paris's best physicians came and went, unable to make sense of the illness eating away at her. I nod. He got in touch this morning. I hope you're holding the fort there, son. Keep Antoine under control. I'll be back as soon as I can. Antoine scowls. He's Papa's right-hand man in the family business. But right now, for the time being, I'm the trusted one. That must hurt. But that's the way it's always been. Our father pitting the two of us against each other in a struggle for scraps of parental affection. Except on the few occasions we unite against a common enemy. 72 hours earlier. She watches through the shutters as he is carried from the building. Just as she watches everything in this place. Sometimes from her cabin in the garden. Sometimes from the recesses of the building, where she can spy on them unnoticed. The body, in its improvised shroud, is visibly heavy. Already stiffening, perhaps, unwieldy, a dead weight. The lights in the third floor apartment have been on up until now, blazing out into the night. Now they are extinguished, and she sees the windows become dark blanks, masking everything inside. But it will take more than that to expunge the memory of what has occurred within. Now the light in the courtyard snaps on. She watches as they set to work, hidden from the outside world behind the high walls, doing everything that needs to be done. Seeing him, she thought she would feel something, but there was nothing. She smiles slightly at the thought that his blood will now be part of this place, its dark secret. Well, he liked secrets. His stain will be here forever now, his lies buried with him. Something terrible happened here tonight. She won't talk about what she saw, not even over his dead body. No one in this building is entirely innocent, herself included. A new light blinks on, four floors up. At the glass, she glimpses a pale face, dark hair, a hand up against the pane. Perhaps there is one innocent in this. After all, Jess, I'm hunting through Ben's closet in case there's an outfit an old girlfriend left behind, something I could borrow. Before Theo hung up on me, I was going to tell him that I don't have anything smart to wear this evening, and no time or money to get something. He's barely given me any warning. Just for a moment, I pause my rifling through Ben's shirts and pull one of them against my face. Try, from the scent, to conjure him here. To believe that I will see him standing in front of me soon. But already the smell of his cologne, his skin, seems to have faded a little. It feels somehow symbolic of our whole relationship. That I'm always chasing a phantom. I drag myself away, choose the one of my two sweaters that doesn't have any holes, and brush my hair. I haven't washed it since I arrived, but at least it's less of a bird's nest now. I chuck on my jacket, thread another pair of cheap hoop earrings through my earlobes. I look in the mirror. Not exactly smart, but it'll have to do. I open the door to the apartment. The stairwell's pitch black. 
a fumble around for the light switch. There's that whiff of cigarette smoke, but even stronger than usual. It smells almost like someone's smoking one right now. Something makes me glance up to my left. A sound, perhaps, or just a movement of the air. And then I catch sight of something out of place. A tiny glowing red dot hovering overhead in the blackness. It takes a moment before I understand what it is. I'm looking at the end of a cigarette butt, held by someone hidden in the darkness just above me. Who's there? I say, or try to say, because it comes out as a strangled bleat. I fumble around for the light switch near the door and finally make contact with it, the lights stuttering on. There's no one in sight. My heart's still beating double time as I walk across the courtyard. Just as I reach the gate to the street, I hear the sound of quick shuffling footsteps behind me. I turn. It's the concierge, emerging once more from the shadows. I try to take a step away, and when my heel hits metal, I realise I'm already backed right up against the gate. She only comes up to my chin, and I'm not exactly big. But there's something threatening about her nearness. Yes? I ask. What is it? I have something to say to you, she hisses. She glances up at the encircling apartment building. She reminds me of a small animal sniffing the air for a predator. I follow her gaze upwards. Most of the windows are dark blanks, reflecting the gleam of the street lamps across the road. There's only one light on upstairs, in the penthouse apartment. I can't see anyone watching us. I'm sure this is what she's checking for but then I don't think I'd necessarily be able to spot them if they were. Suddenly, she snatches out a hand towards me. It's such a swift, violent action that for a moment I really think she's going to hit me. I don't have time to step away. It's too fast. But instead, she grabs a hold of my wrist in her claw-like hand. Her grip's surprisingly strong. It stings. What are you doing? I ask her. Just come, she tells me, and with such authority, I don't dare disobey her. Come with me now. I'm going to be late for meeting Theo now, but you can wait. This feels important. I follow her across the courtyard to her little cabin. She moves quickly, in that slightly stooped way of hers like someone trying to duck out of a rainstorm. I feel like a child in a storybook being taken to the witch's hut in the woods. She looks up at the apartment building several more times, as though scanning it for any onlookers. But she seems to decide that it's worth the risk. Then she opens the door and ushers me in. It's even smaller inside than it looks on the outside if that's possible. Everything is crammed into one tiny space. There's a bed attached to the wall by a system of pulleys and currently raised to allow us to stand. A washstand, a minuscule antique cooking stove. Just to my right is a curtain that I suppose must lead through to a bathroom of some sort, simply because there's nowhere else for it to be. It's almost scarily neat, every surface scrubbed to a high shine. It smells of bleach and detergent, not a thing out of place. Somehow, I would have expected nothing less from this woman. And yet the cleanness, the neatness, the little vase of flowers, somehow make it all the more depressing. A little mess might be a distraction from how cramped it is, or from the damp stains on the ceiling, which I'm fairly sure no amount of cleaning could remove. I've lived in some dives in my time, but this takes the biscuit. And what must it feel like to live in this tiny hovel, 
while surrounded by the luxury and space of the rest of the apartment building. What would it be like to live with the reminder of how little you have on your doorstep every day? No wonder she hated me, swanning in here to take up residence on the third floor. If only she knew how out of place I am here too. How much more like her than them I really am. I know I can't let her see my pity. That would be the worst insult possible. I get the impression she's probably a very proud person. Behind her head and the tiny dining table and chair I see several faded photographs pinned to the wall. A little girl sitting on a woman's lap. The sky behind them is bright blue, olive trees in the background. The woman has a glass in front of her of what looks like tea, a silver handle. The next is of a young woman, slim, dark-haired, dark-eyed, maybe 18 or 19. Not a new photograph. You can tell from the saturated colours, the fuzziness of it. But at the same time, it's definitely too recent to be of the old woman herself. It must be a loved one. Somehow it's impossible to imagine this elderly woman having a family or a past away from this place. It's impossible, even, to imagine her ever having been young. As though she has always been here. As though she is a part of the apartment building itself. She's stunning, I say. That girl on the wall. Who is she? There's a long silence. So long that I think maybe she didn't understand me. And then finally, in that rasping voice, she says, My daughter. Wow. I take another look at her in light of this. Her daughter's beauty. It's hard to see past the lines, the swollen ankles, the clawed hands but maybe I can see a shadow of it, after all. She clears her throat. (coughs) Vous devez zarete, she barks, suddenly, cutting into my thoughts. You have to stop. What do you mean? I ask. Stop what? I lean forward. Perhaps she can tell me something. All your questions, she says. All of your looking. You are only making trouble for yourself. You cannot help your brother now. You must understand that... What do you mean? I ask. A chill has gone right through me. What do you mean? I cannot help my brother now. She just shakes her head. There are things here that you cannot understand. But I have seen them with my own eyes. I see everything. What? I ask her. What have you seen? She doesn't answer. She simply shakes her head. I am trying to help you, girl. I have been trying since the beginning. Don't you understand that? If you know what is good for you, you will stop. You will leave this place and never look back. Sophie, penthouse. There's a knock on the door. I go to answer it and find Mimi standing there on the other side. Maman. The way she says the word, just like she did as a little girl. What is it, ma petite? I ask gently. I suppose to others I may seem cold. But the love I feel for my daughter, I'd challenge you to find anything close to it. Maman, I'm frightened. Shh. I step forward to embrace her. I draw her close to me, feeling the frail nubs of her shoulder blades beneath my hands. It seems so long since I have held her like this, since she has allowed me to hold her like this, like I did when she was a child. For a time I thought I might never do so again. 
and to be called Maman. It is still the same miracle it was when I first heard her say the word. I have always felt she is more mine than Jack's, which I suppose makes a kind of sense, because in a way she was Jack's greatest gift to me, far more valuable than any diamond brooch, any emerald bracelet. Something, someone, I could love unreservedly. One evening, roughly a week after the night I had knocked on Benjamin Daniel's door, Jacques was briefly home for supper. I presented him with the quiche Lorraine I had bought from the boulangerie, piping hot from the oven. Everything was as it should be, everything following its usual pattern, except for the fact that a few nights before, I had slept with the man from the third floor apartment. I was still reeling from it. I could not believe it had happened. A moment, or rather an evening, of madness. I placed a slice of quiche on Jack's plate, poured him a glass of wine. I met our lodger on the stairs this evening, he said as he ate, as I picked my way through my salad. He thanked us for supper. Very gracious. Gracious enough not to mention the disaster with the weather. He sends you his compliments. I took a sip of my wine before I answered. Oh? He laughed, shook his head in amusement. Your face. Anyone would think this stuff was corked. You really don't like him, do you? I couldn't speak. I was saved by the ringing of Jack's phone. He went into his study and took a call. When he returned, his face was clouded with anger. I have to go. Antoine made a stupid mistake. One of the clients isn't happy. I gestured to the quiche. I'll keep this warm for you, for when you come back. No, I'll eat out. He shrugged on his jacket. Oh, and I forgot to say, your daughter. I saw her on the street the other night. She was dressed like a whore. My daughter, I asked. Now that she had done something to displease him, she was my daughter. All that money, he said, sending her to that Catholic school to try and make her into a properly behaved young woman. And yet she disgraced herself there. And now she goes out dressed like a little slut. But then perhaps it's no surprise. What do you mean? But I didn't need to ask. I knew exactly what he meant. And then he left, and I was all alone in the apartment as usual. For the second time in a week, I was filled with rage. White, hot, powerful. I drank the rest of the bottle of wine. Then I stood up and walked down two flights of stairs. I knocked on his door. He opened it, pulled me inside. This time there was no preamble, no pretense of polite conversation. I don't think we spoke one word. We weren't respectful or gentle or cautious with one another now. My silk shirt was torn from me. I gasped against his mouth like someone drowning, bit at him, tore the skin of his back with my nails, relinquished all control. I was possessed. Afterwards, as we lay tangled in his sheets, I finally managed to speak. This cannot happen again. You understand that, don't you? He just smiled. Over the next few weeks, we became reckless, testing the boundaries, scaring ourselves a little. The adrenaline rush, the fear, so similar a feeling to the quickening of arousal. Each seemed to heighten the other, like the rush of some drug. I had behaved so well for so long. The secret spaces of this building became our private playground. I took him in my mouth in the old servant's staircase, my hands sliding into his trousers, expert, greedy. He had me in the laundry room in the cave, up against the washing machine as it thrummed out its cycle. And every time I tried to end it. And every time, I know we both heard the lie behind the words. Maman, Mimi says now, and I am jolted abruptly, guiltily, out of these memories. Maman, I don't know what to do. My wonderful miracle. My merveille. My Mimi. She came to me when I'd given up all hope of having a child. You see, she wasn't always mine. She was quite simply perfect. A baby, only a few weeks old. I did not know exactly where she had come from. I had my ideas, but I kept them to myself. I had learned it was important, sometimes, to look the other way. If you know that you aren't going to like the reply, don't ask the question. There was just one thing I needed to know. 
and to that I got my answer. The mother was dead. And illegal. So there's no paper trail to worry about. I know someone at the mairie who will square the birth certificate. A mere formality for the grand and powerful house of Meunier. It helps to have friends in high places. And then she was mine. And that was the important thing. I could give her a better life. Shh, I say. I'm here. Everything will be okay. I'm sorry I was stern last night with the wine. But you understand, don't you? I didn't want a scene. Leave it all with me, ma chérie. It was, is, so fierce, that feeling. Even though she didn't come out of my body, I knew as soon as I saw her that I would do anything to protect her, to keep her safe. Other mothers might say that sort of thing casually. But perhaps it is clear by now that I don't do or say anything casually. When I say something like that, I mean it. Jess I come up out of the Palais Royal metro station. I almost don't recognise the tall, smartly dressed guy waiting at the top of the steps until he starts walking towards me. You're 15 minutes late, Theo says. He didn't give me any time, I say, and I got caught up. Come on, Theo says. We can still make it if we're snappy about it. I look him over, trying to work out why he looks so different to the last time I met him. Only a five o'clock shadow now, revealing a sharp jawline. Dark hair still in need of a cut, but it's had a brush and he's swept it back from his face. A dark blazer over a white shirt and jeans. I even catch a waft of cologne. He's definitely scrubbed up since the cafe. He still looks like a pirate, but now like one who's had a wash and a shave and borrowed some civilian clothes. That's not going to cut it, he says, nodding at me. Clearly he's not having the same charitable thoughts about my outfit. It's all I had to wear. I did try to say it's fine. I thought that might be the case. I brought you some stuff. He thrusts a monoprix bag for life towards me. I look inside. I can see a tangle of clothes, a black dress and a pair of heels. You bought this? Ex-girlfriend. You're roughly the same size, I guess. Ooh, okay. I remind myself that this might all somehow help me find out what's happened to Ben that beggars can't be choosers about wearing the haunted clothes of girlfriends past. Why do I have to wear this sort of stuff? He shrugs. Them's the rules. And then, when he sees my expression. No, they actually are. This place has a dress code. Women aren't allowed to wear trousers, heels are mandatory. That's nice and sexist. Echoes of the pervert insisting I keep the top four buttons of my shirt undone for the punters. You want to look like you work in a kindergarten, sweetheart? Or a branch of fucking McDonald's? Theo shrugs. Yeah, well, I agree. But that's a certain part of Paris for you. Hyper-conservative. Hyper-critical. Sexist. Anyway, don't blame me. It's not like I'm taking you to this place on a date, he coughs. <clears throat> Come on, we don't have all night. We're already running late. For what? You'll see when we get there. Let's just say you're not going to find this place in your lonely planet guide. How does this help us find Ben? I'll explain it when we get there. It will make more sense then. God. He's infuriating. I'm also not completely sure I trust him, though I can't put my finger on why. Maybe it's just that I still can't work out what his angle is, why he's so keen to help. I hurry along next to him, trying to keep up. I didn't see him standing up at the cafe the other day. I'd guessed he was tall, but now I realise he's well over a foot taller than me 
and I have to take two steps for every one of his. After a few minutes of walking, I'm actually panting. To the left of us, I catch sight of a huge glass pyramid, glowing with light, looking like something that's just landed from out of space. What is that thing? It gives me a look. It seems I've said something stupid. That's the pyramid. In front of the Louvre? You know, the famous museum? I don't like being made to feel like an idiot. Oh, the Mona Lisa, right? Yeah, well, I've been a bit too busy trying to find my missing brother to take a nice tour of it yet. We push through crowds of tourists chattering in every language under the sun. As we walk, I tell him about what I've discovered, about them all being a family. One united front, acting together, and probably against me. I keep thinking about stumbling into Sophie Minier's apartment, all of them sitting together like that, an eerie family portrait. The words I'd heard crouching outside. Elle est dangereuse. And Nick, discovering that he wasn't the ally I thought he was. That part still stings. And just before I left to come here, the concierge gave me a kind of warning. She, she told me to stop looking. Can I tell you something I've learned in my long and not especially illustrious career? Theo asks. What? When someone tells you to stop looking, it normally means you're on the right track. I change quickly in the underground toilet of a shishi bar while Theo buys a demi beer upstairs so the staff don't chuck us out. I shake out my hair, study my reflection in the fox glass of the mirror. I don't look like myself. I look like I'm playing a part. The dress is figure-hugging, but classier than I'd expected. The label inside reads Isabelle Moron, which I'm guessing might be a step up from my usual Primark. The shoes, Michel Vivian, is the name printed on the footbed, are higher than anything I'd wear, but surprisingly comfortable. I think I might actually be able to walk in them, so I guess I'm playing the part of Theo's ex-girlfriend. Not sure how I feel about that. A girl comes out of the stall next to me. Long, shining, dark hair. A silky dress falling off one shoulder underneath an oversized cardigan. Wings of black eyeliner. She starts outlining her lips in lipstick. That's what I need. The finishing touch. Hey. I lean over to her, smile my most ingratiating smile. Could I borrow some of that? She frowns at me, looks slightly disgusted, but hands it over. Si tu veux. I put some on a finger, dab it onto my lips. It's a dark, vampiric red, and pass it back to her. She puts up her hand. Non, merci. Keep it. I have another. She tosses her gleaming hair over one shoulder. Oh, thanks. I put the lid back on, and it closes with a satisfying magnetised click. I notice it has little interlocking C's stenciled on the top. Mum had a lipstick like this, even though she definitely didn't have spare cash to spend on expensive makeup. But then that was Mum all over. Blow it on a lipstick and be left with nothing for dinner. Me, sitting on a chair, legs dangling. Her pressing the waxy stub of it against my lips, turning me to face the mirror. There you go, darling. Don't you look pretty? I look at myself in the mirror now, pout just like she asked me to do all those years, a million years, a whole lifetime ago. There. Done. Costume complete. I head back upstairs. 
Ready, I tell Theo. He downs the dregs of his stupidly tiny glass of beer. I can feel him running a quick eye over the outfit. His mouth opens, and for a moment I think he might say something nice. I mean, part of me wouldn't know what to do with a compliment right now. But at the same time, it might be nice to hear. And then he points to my mouth. Mr. Bit, he says. But yeah, otherwise that should do. Oh, fuck off. I rub at the edge of my lips. I hate myself for even having cared what he thought. We leave the bar, turn onto a street thronged with very well-dressed shoppers. I could swear the air around here smells of expensive leather. We pass the glittering windows of rich people's shops. Chanel, Celine, and, aha, Isabel Moran. He leads me away from the crowds into a much smaller side street. Gleaming cars flank the pavements. In contrast to the crowded shopping boulevard, there's no one in sight, and it's darker here. Fewer street lamps. A deep hush over everything. Then Theo stops at the door. Here we are. He looks at his watch. Well, we're definitely a little late. Hopefully they'll let us in. I look at the door. No number, but there's a plaque with a symbol I recognise. An exploding firework. Where are we? Theo reaches past me, a trace of that citrus cologne again, and presses a doorbell I hadn't noticed. The door swings open with a click. A man appears, dressed in a black suit and bow tie. I watch as Theo fishes a card from his pocket, the same one I found in Ben's wallet. The doorman glances at the card, nods his head towards us. Entrez, s'il vous plaît. The evening is about to start. I try and peer past the doorman to get a glimpse of what lies beyond. At the end of the corridor, I see a staircase leading downwards, dimly lit by sconces with real candles burning in them. Theo plants a hand in the small of my back and, with a little push, steers me forward. Come on, he says. We don't have all night. All right, dear, the doorman says, barring our entry with a hand. He looks me over. Votre mobile, s'il vous plaît. No phone allowed. Or camera. Uh, why? I glance back at Theo. It occurs to me again that I know absolutely nothing about this guy beyond what it says on his business card. He could be anyone. He could have brought me anywhere. Theo gives a tiny nod, gestures. Don't make a fuss. Do what the guy says. Okay? I hand my phone over, reluctantly. Vos mask. The man holds up two pieces of material. I take one. A black mask, made of silk. What? Just put it on, Theo murmurs, near my ear. And then louder. Let me help, darling. I try to act natural as he smooths down my hair, ties the mask behind my head. The doorman beckons us through. With Theo close behind me, I begin to descend the stairs. Jess. An underground room. I see dark red walls, low lighting, a small crowd of dimly lit figures sitting in front of a stage veiled by a wine-coloured velvet curtain. Masked faces turn to look as we descend the final few steps. We're definitely the last to turn up at the party. What the hell is this place? I whisper to Theo. Shh. An usher in black tie meets us at the bottom of the stairs, beckons us forward. We pass walls decorated with stylized gold dancing figurines, then weave among little booths with masked figures sitting behind tables.
more faces turning in our direction. I feel uncomfortably exposed. Luckily, the table we're taken to is tucked into a corner, definitely the worst view of the stage. We slide into the booth. There really isn't very much room in here, not with Theo's long legs, which he has to pull up against himself, his knees hard against the wooden surround. He looks so uncomfortable that in different circumstances it might give me a laugh. The tiny amount of seat left means I have to sit with my thigh pressed right up against his. I look about. It's hard to tell whether this place is actually old or just a clever imitation. The others around us are all very well healed. Judging by their clothes, they could be out for an evening at the theatre. But the atmosphere is wrong. I lean back in my chair, trying to look casual like I fit in here among the tailored suits, the jewel-encrusted earlobes and necks, the rich person hair. A weird, hungry hum of energy is coming off them, coiling through the room. An intense note of excitement, of anticipation. The waiter comes over to take our drinks order. I open the leather-bound menu. No prices. A glance at Theo. A glass of champagne for my wife, he says quickly. He turns to me wearing a smile of fake adoration, so convincing it gives me a chill. Seeing as we're celebrating, darling, I really hope he's paying. He looks down the menu. And a glass of this red for me. The waiter is back in a minute, brandishing two bottles in white napkins. He pours a stream of champagne into a glass and passes it to me. I take a sip. It's very cold, tiny bubbles electric on the tip of my tongue. I can't think when I've ever had the real stuff. Mum used to say she was a champagne girl, but I'm not sure she ever had it either. Just cheap, sweet knockoffs. As the waiter pours Theo's red, the napkin slips a little, and I notice the label. It's the same wine, I whisper to Theo, once the waiters left us. The Meunier have that in their cellar. Theo turns to look at me. What was that name you just used? He sounds suddenly excited. The Meunier, the family I was telling you about. Theo lowers his voice. Yesterday, I submitted a request to see the Matrice Cadastral. That's like the land registry for this place. It's owned by one Meunier Wines, S-A-R-L. I sit up very straight, everything sharpening into focus. A feeling like a thousand tiny pinpricks across the surface of my skin. That's them. That's the family Ben's been living with. I try to think. But why was Ben interested in this place? Could he have been reviewing it? Something like that? He wasn't reviewing it for me. And I'm not sure, being so exclusive, that it's the sort of place that exactly courts press coverage. The lights begin to dim. But just before they do... A figure in the crowd catches my eye, oddly familiar despite the mask they're wearing. I try to shift my gaze back to the same spot, but the lights are dimming further, voices lowering, and the room falling into darkness. I can hear the smallest rustle of people's clothing, the odd sniff, their intakes of breath. Someone coughs, and it sounds deafening in the sudden hush. Then the velvet curtain begins to roll back. A figure stands on the stage against a black background, skin lit up pale blue, face in shadow, completely naked. No, not naked, a trick of the light, 
two scraps of material covering her modesty. She begins to dance. The music is deep, throbbing. Some sort of jazz, I think. No melody to it, but a kind of rhythm. And she's so in sync with it that it feels almost as if the music is coming from her. Like the movements she is making are creating it, rather than following it. The dance is strange, intense, almost menacing. I'm torn between staring and tearing my eyes away. Something about it disturbs me. More girls appear, dressed or undressed, in the same way. The music gets louder and louder, beating until it's so overpowering that the pulse of it is like the sound of my own heartbeat in my ears. With the blue light, the shifting, undulating bodies on stage, I feel as though I'm underwater, as though the outlines of everything are rippling and bleeding into one another. I think of last night. Could there be something in the champagne? Or is it just the effect of the lighting, the music, the darkness? I glance over at Theo. He shifts in his seat next to me, takes a sip of wine. His eyes locked on the stage. Is he turned on by what's happening on stage? Am I? I'm suddenly aware of how close we are to each other of how tightly my leg is pressed up against his. The next act is just two women, one dressed in a close-fitting black suit and bow tie, the other in a tiny slip dress. Gradually they remove each other's clothes, until you can see that without them, they're almost identical. I can feel the audience sitting forward, drinking it in. I lean towards Theo. Whisper, what is this place? A rather exclusive club, he murmurs back. Its nickname, apparently, is Le Petit Moor. You can't get in unless you have one of those cards, like the one you found in Ben's wallet. The lights dim again. Silence falls on the crowd. Another nearly naked girl. This one, wearing a kind of feathered headdress rather than a mask, is lowered from the ceiling on a suspended silver hoop. Her act is all confined to the hoop. She does a somersault, a kind of backflip, lets herself fall and then catches herself with a flick of an ankle. The audience gasps. Theo leans in close. Careful now, but look behind you, he whispers breath tickling my ear. I start to swivel round. No, Jesus, more subtly than that. God, he's patronising. But I do as he says. Several times I take small, sly glances behind me. And as I do, I notice a series of booths hidden in the shadows at the back, their occupants shielded from the view of the regular punters by velvet curtains and attended by a constant flow of waiters carrying bottles of wine and trays of canapes. Every so often, someone leaves or enters, and I notice that it always seems to be a man, all of a similar type and age, elegant, suited, masked, an air of wealth and importance about them. Theo leans over, as though he's whispering another sweet nothing. Have you noticed? Are they all men? Yes. And how every so often, one of them goes through that door over there. I follow the direction of his gaze. But I'd stop looking now, he murmurs, before we start to draw attention to ourselves. I turn back to the stage. The girl has stepped off the hoop. She smiles out at the audience, taking us all in in a sweeping glance. When she gets to me, she stops. I'm not imagining it. She freezes. She is staring at me in what looks like horror. 
I feel a thrill go through me. The sharp brown fringe, the height, even the little mole beneath her left eye, which I can make out now under the spotlight. I know her. Sophie, penthouse. They file into the apartment. Nicholas, Antoine, Mimi. Take up the same positions on the sofas they occupied last night when the girl interrupted us. Nick's foot is tapping a frantic rhythm on the home rug. As I watch, I am certain I can make out a tiny black scorch mark just beneath his toe, one of several burned into the priceless silk. But you'd only spot them if you knew what you were looking for. Suddenly, I am assaulted by memories. It was my greatest transgression, inviting him up here. We stole a bottle from Jacques Cellar, one of the finest vintages. Had each other there, on the rug. Paris glittering noisily in at us through the vast windows. We lay tangled together afterwards, warmed by the cashmere throw I had poured around our naked bodies. If Jacques had come back unexpectedly. But wasn't there some part of me that wanted to be caught? Look at me, who you have left here alone all these years. Wanted, desired. As we lay there, I stroked his hair, enjoying the dense velvety softness of it between my fingers. He lit a cigarette that we passed back and forth like teenage lovers, hot ash scattering, sizzling into the silk of the rug. I didn't care. All that mattered was that, with him here, the apartment suddenly seemed warm, full of life and sound and passion. My mum used to stroke my hair. I pulled my hand away sharply. I didn't mean it like that, he said quickly. I just meant I hadn't realised how much I missed it. And when he turned to look across at me, I saw in his expression something undefended and frail, something that had hidden beneath all the charm. I thought I saw my own loneliness reflected there. But in the next moment he smiled, and it had vanished. A minute or so later he sat up, shaking in the empty apartment around us. Jacques is away a lot in the evenings, isn't he? I nodded. Was he already planning our next encounter? He's very busy. His gaze seemed to sweep over the paintings on the walls, the furnishings, the richness of the place. I suppose that must mean business is flourishing. I froze. He'd said it lightly. Too lightly? It brought me back to myself. The madness of what we were doing. All that was at stake. You should go, I told him, suddenly angry at him, at myself. I can't do this. This time I really believed I meant it. I have too much to lose. I close my eyes, open them again, and focus on my daughter's face. She does not meet my eye. All the same, it has brought me back to myself, to what is important. I take a steadying sip of my wine, force down the memories. So, I say to them all, let us begin. Nick, second floor. My stepmother has called us all to order. We're sitting upstairs in the penthouse apartment, a dysfunctional little family conference. Like the one we'd been going to have last night, before Jess turned up unannounced and set the cat among the pigeons. I was always a keen student of English idioms. We have a French one like it, actually. Jeter un pavé dans la mer, throw a paving stone in the pond. And maybe that's a more accurate description of what happened when she arrived here. She has displaced everything. I look at the others, Antoine knocking back the wine. He might as well have picked up the whole bottle. Mimi white-faced and looking ready to bolt from the room. Sophie sitting rigid and expressionless. She's not looking quite herself, my stepmother. I can't work out what's different about her at first. Her shining black bob doesn't have a strand out of place. Her silk scarf is knotted expertly at her throat. But there's something off. Then it hits me. She's not wearing lipstick. I don't know if I've ever seen her without it. She looks diminished somehow, older, frailer, more human. Antoine speaks first. That stupid little cunt is at the club. He turns to me. Still suggests we do nothing, little bro. 
I, I think the important thing is we all pull together, I say. A united front as a family. That's the most important thing. We can't fall apart now. But I realize, looking at their faces, that they're all unknown quantities to me. I don't feel like I know these people, not really. I was away for so long, and we're all so estranged from one another, that we don't look and feel like the real thing. Even to one another. Yes, because you've been such a key player in this family up until now, Antoine says, making me feel even more of an imposter, a fraud. He gestures towards Sophie. And you're not going to catch me playing the adoring steps onto that salop. Hey, I say, let's just... Watch your mouth, Sophie says caustically, turning to Antoine. You're sitting in my apartment. Ooh, it's your apartment, is it? He gives a mock bow. I'm so sorry, I hadn't realized. I thought you were just a parasite living off Papa's money. I didn't know you'd earned any of it yourself. I was only eight or nine when Papa married the mysterious new woman who had materialized in our lives, but Antoine was older, a teenager. Maman had been an invalid for so long, languishing in her rooms on the third floor. This newcomer seemed so young, so glamorous. I was a little besotted. Antoine took it rather differently. He's always had it in for her. Just stop it, Mimi says suddenly, her hands over her ears. All of you, I can't take any more. Antoine turns to Mimi with a horrible smile on his face. Nah. <laughs> he slurs at her now. And as for you, well, you're not really part of this family, are you? Ma petite sœur. Stop that, Sophie says to Antoine, her voice ice cold, the lioness protecting her cub. At her feet, the whippet startles and gives a sharp bark. Oh, I think she can give as good as she gets, Antoine says. What about all that stuff at her school with the teacher? Papa had to make a pretty hefty donation and agree to remove her to keep that one quiet. But perhaps it's no surprise, huh? He turns to Mimi. When you consider where she comes from. Don't you dare speak to her like that, Sophie says. Her tone is dangerous. I glance over at Mimi. She's just sitting there, staring at Antoine, her face even paler than usual. Okay. I say, come on, let's all just... And can I just say, Antoine says, that it's just typical that our darling père has decided to fuck off for all of this, isn't it? All of us glance instinctively at the portrait of my father on the wall. I know it must be my imagination or a trick of the light, but it looks as though his painted frown has deepened slightly. I shiver. Even when he's miles away, you can still feel his presence in this apartment somehow. His authority. The all-seeing, all-powerful Jacques Meunier. Your father, Sophie says to Antoine now sharply, has his own business to be taken care of. As you well know, it would only complicate things further if he returns. We must all hold the fort for him in his absence. <laughs> what a surprise he's not here when the shit hits the van! Antoine gives a laugh, but there's no humor in it. He trusts you to be able to handle the situation on your own, Sophie says. But perhaps that is simply too much to ask. Look at you. You're a 40-year-old man still living under his roof, leeching off his money. He has given you everything. You've never had to grow up. You've had everything handed to you by your father on a silver platter. You're both useless hothouse flowers, too weak for the outside world, unable to fly the nest. That stings. For God's sake, she says, show your father some respect. Oh, yeah? Antoine gives her a nasty smile. <laughs> Are you really going to talk to me about respect? <laughs> The last word hissed under his breath. How dare you speak to me like that? 
She rounds on him, a surge of real anger breaching the icy facade. Oh, how dare I? Antoine gives her a sly-looking grin. Vraiment? Really? He turns to me. You know what she is? You know what our very elegant stepmother really is? You know where she comes from? I've had my suspicions. As I grew older, they grew too. But I've barely even allowed myself to think them, let alone voice them aloud, for fear of my father's wrath. Antoine stands up and walks out of the room. A few moments later, he comes back carrying something in a large frame. He turns it around so that all of us can see it. It's a black and white photograph, a large nude, the one from my father's study. Put that back, says Sophie, her voice dangerous. Her hands are clenched into fists. She looks over at Mimi, who is sitting stock still, her eyes wide and scared. Antoine sits back in the chair, looking pleased with himself, propping the photograph beside him like a child's science project. Look at her, he says, gesturing to the image, then at Sophie. Hasn't she done well? The Hermès scarves, the trench coats, une vraie bourgeoise. You'd never know it, would you? You'd never know that she was really a... A crack, loud as a pistol shot. It happens too quickly to understand what's going on. She moved so fast. Then Antoine is sitting there holding his hand to his face, and Sophie is standing over him. She hit me, Antoine says. But his voice is small and scared as a little boy's. It isn't the first time he's been hit like this. Papa was pretty free with his fists, and Antoine, the eldest, seemed to get the worst of it. She fucking hit me. He takes his hand away, and we all see the mark of her hand on his cheek. The imprint of it a livid pink. Sophie continues to stand over him. Think what your father would say if he heard you talking to me like that. Antoine looks up at Papa's portrait again tears his eyes away with an effort. He's a big guy, but he seems almost to shrink into himself. We all know that he would never dare speak to Sophie like this in Papa's presence. And we all know that when Papa gets back, there'll be hell to pay if he hears about it. Could we please just focus on what's important? I say, trying to gain some control. We have a bigger problem to focus on here. Sophie gives Antoine another venomous stare, then turns to me and nods tightly. You're right. She sits back down, and in a moment that chilly mask is back in place. I think the most important thing is that we can't let her find out any more. We have to be ready for her when she returns. And if she goes too far, Nicola, I nod. Swallow. Yes, I know what to do, if it comes to it. The concierge, Mimi says suddenly, her voice small and hoarse. We all turn to look at her. I saw that woman, Jess, going into the concierge's cabin. She was on her way to the gate and the concierge ran out and grabbed her. They were in there for at least ten minutes. She looks at all of us. What? What could they have been talking about for all that time? Jess. I stare at the girl on the stage. It's her. The girl who followed me two days ago. The one I chased onto the metro train. She stares back. The moment seems to stretch. She looks as terrified as she did when that train pulled away from the platform. And then, as if she's coming out of a trance, she swings her gaze back to the audience, smiles, climbs back onto the hoop as it starts to rise upwards, and is gone. Theo turns to me. What was that? 
You saw it too. Yeah, I saw it. She was staring right at you. I met her, I say. Just after I spoke to you for the first time at the cafe. I explain it all, catching her following me, chasing her into the metro. My heart is beating faster now. I think of Ben, the family, the mystery dancer. They all feel like parts of the same puzzle. I know they are. But how do they all fit? After the show ends, the audience members drain the remainders from their glasses and surge up the staircase, heading out into the night. Theo gives me a nudge. Come on then, let's go. Follow me. I'm about to protest. Surely we're not just going to leave. But I stop when I see that rather than continuing up the stairs with the rest of the paying customers, Theo has shoved open a door on our left. It's the same one we noticed earlier, during the performance. The one through which those suited men kept disappearing. Let's try and talk to your friend, he murmurs. He slips through the door. I follow close behind. Beneath us is a dark, velvet-lined staircase. We begin to descend. I can hear sounds coming from below. But they're muted, like they're coming from underwater. I hear music, I think, and the hum of voices, and then a sudden, high-pitched cry that might be male or female. We have almost reached the bottom of the stairs. I hesitate. I thought I heard something. Another set of footsteps beside our own. Stop, I say. Did you hear that? Theo looks at me questioningly. I'm sure I heard footsteps. We listen for a couple of moments in silence. Nothing. Then a girl appears at the bottom of the stairs. One of the dancers. Up close, she's so made up it looks like she's wearing a mask. She stares at us. For a moment, I have the impression that there's a scared little girl looking out at me, behind the thick foundation, fake eyelashes and glossy red lips. We're looking for a friend, I say quickly. The girl who did that act on the swing. It's about my brother, Ben. Can you tell her we're looking for her? You cannot be here, she hisses. She looks terrified. It's okay, I say, trying to sound reassuring. We're not going to stay for long. She hurries past us, up the stairs, without a backward glance. We keep going. At the end of the corridor, there's a door. I put my shoulder against it, but there's no give. I suddenly have a sense of how far underground we are, at least two floors deep. The thought makes it harder to breathe. I try to swallow down my fear. I, I think it's locked, I say. The sounds are louder now. Through the door I hear a kind of groan that sounds almost animal. I try the handle again. It's definitely locked. You have a go. But Theo doesn't answer me. And I know, before I turn, that there's someone behind us. Now I see him, the doorman who met us at the entrance, his huge frame filling the corridor, his face in shadow. Shit. Kiski spas? He asks, dangerously, quietly, as he begins moving towards us. What are you doing down here? A week got lost. I say, my voice cracking. I was looking for the toilets. Vous devez partir, he says, and then he repeats it in English. You need to leave, both of you, right now. His voice is still quiet, all the more menacing than if he were shouting.
It says, absolutely do not fuck with me. He takes a hold of my upper arm in one of his huge hands. His grip burns. I try to pull away. He grips tighter. I get the impression he's not even putting much effort in. Hey, hey, that's not necessary, Theo says. The doorman doesn't answer or let go. Instead, he takes hold of Theo's arm too, in his other hand. And Theo, who up until now I'd thought of as a large guy, looks suddenly like a child, like a puppet, held in his grip. For a moment, the doorman stands stock still, his head cocked to one side. I look at Theo and he frowns, clearly as confused as I am. Then I hear a tinny murmur and realise that the doorman is listening. Someone is feeding him instructions through an earpiece. He straightens up. Please, madame, monsieur. Still that scarily polite tone, even as his hand tightens further around my bicep, burning the skin. Do not make a scene. You must come with me, now. And then he is steering us, with more than a little force along the corridor, back up the first flight of stairs, back into the room with the tables, the stage. Most of the lights have been turned off, and it's completely empty now. No, not completely. Out of the corner of my eye, I think I catch sight of a tall figure standing quite still watching us from the shadowy recesses in one corner. But I don't manage to get a proper look, because now we're being manhandled up the next flight of steps, up to ground level. Then the front door is opened, and we're thrust out onto the street. The doorman giving me such a hard shove in the back that I trip and fall forward onto my knees. The door slams behind us. Theo who has managed to keep his balance, puts out a hand and hauls me up. It takes a long time for my heartbeat to return to normal. But as I manage to gain some control over my breathing, I realise that though my knees hurt and my arm feels badly bruised, it could have been so much worse. I feel lucky to be back out here gulping freezing lungfuls of air. What if the voice in the doorman's ear had given different instructions. What might be happening to us now? It's this thought rather than the cold that makes me shiver. I pull my jacket tighter around me. Let's get away from here, Theo says. I wonder if he's thinking along the same lines. Let's not give them a chance to change their minds. The street is almost silent, completely deserted. Just the blink of the security lights in shop windows and the echo of our feet on the cobblestones. And then I hear a new sound, another pair of feet, behind us and moving quickly, quicker, growing louder as my heart starts beating faster. I turn to see. A tall figure, hood pulled up, and as the light catches her face, just so, I see that it's her. The girl who followed me two nights ago. The girl on the hoop, who stared at me in the audience this evening like she'd come face to face with a nightmare. Concierge, the lodge. I am dusting up on the top floor. Normally, I do the hallways and staircases at this time of day. Madame Meunier is very particular about that. But this evening, I have trespassed onto the landing. It is the second risk I have taken. The first was speaking to the girl earlier. We might have been seen, but I was desperate. I tried to put a note under her door yesterday evening, but she caught me there, threatened me with a knife. I had to find another way. 
because I saw who she was the first night she arrived, coming to that woman's aid, helping her put the clothes back into her suitcase. I could not stand back and let another life be destroyed. They are all in there, in the penthouse, all apart from him, the head of the family. I could have taken the back staircase. I use it sometimes to keep watch, but the acoustics are much better from here. I can't hear everything they're saying, but every so often I catch hold of a word or a phrase. One of them says his name, Benjamin Daniels. I press a little closer to the door. They are talking about the girl now, too. I think about that hungry, interested, bright way about her, something in her manner. She reminds me of her brother, yes, but also of my daughter. Not in looks, of course. No one could match my daughter in looks. One day, when the heat had begun to dissipate, I invited Benjamin Daniels into my cabin for tea. I told myself it was because I had to show my gratitude for the fan. But really, I wanted company. I had not realized how lonely I had been until he showed an interest. I had lost the shame I had felt at first about my meager way of living. I had begun to enjoy the companionship. He glanced again at the photographs on the walls as he sat cradling his glass of tea. Elira, have I got that right? Your daughter's name? I stared at him. I could not believe he had remembered. It touched me. That's correct, monsieur. It's a beautiful name, he said. It means the free one. Oh, in what language? I paused. Albanian. This was the first thing I trusted him with. From this detail, he might have been able to guess my status here in France. I watched him carefully. He simply smiled and nodded. I've been to Tirana. It's a wonderful city, so vibrant. I have heard that, but I don't know it well. I'm from a small village on the Adriatic coast. Do you have any pictures? A hesitation. But what harm could it do? I went to my tiny bureau, took out my album. He sat down in the seat across from me. I noticed he took care not to disturb the photographs as he turned the pages, as though handling something very precious. I wish I had something like this, he said suddenly. I don't know what happened to the photos from when I was small, but then again, I don't know if I could look. He stopped. I sensed some hidden reservoir of pain. Then, as though he had forgotten it, or wanted to forget it, he pointed at a photograph. Look at this, the color of that sea. I followed his gaze. Looking at it, I could smell the wild thyme, the salt in the air. He glanced up. I remember you said you followed your daughter to Paris, but she isn't here any longer? I saw his gaze flicker around the cabin. I heard the unspoken question. It wasn't as though I had left poverty at home for a life of riches here. Why would a person abandon their life for this? I did not intend to stay, I said. Not a first. I glanced up at the wall of photographs. Elira looked out at me. At five, at twelve, at seventeen. The beauty growing, changing. But the smile always the same the eyes the same. I could remember her at the breast as an infant, dark eyes looking up at me with such brightness and intelligence beyond her years. When I spoke, it was not to him, 
but to her image. I came here because I was worried about her. He leaned forward. Why? I glanced at him. For a moment, I had almost forgotten he was there. I hesitated. I had never spoken to anyone about this. But he seemed so interested, so concerned. And there was that pain I had sensed in him. Before, even when he had shown me the little kindnesses and attentions, I had seen him as one of them. A different species, rich, entitled. But his pain made him human. She forgot to call when she said she would, and when I eventually heard from her, she didn't sound the same. I looked at the photographs. I... I tried to find a way to describe it. She told me she was busy, she was working hard. I tried not to mind. I tried to be happy for her. But I knew, with a mother's instinct, I knew something was wrong. She sounded bad. Horse, ill. But worse than that, she sounded vague, not like herself. Every time we had spoken before, I felt her close to me, despite the hundreds of miles between us. Now I could feel her slipping away. It frightened me. I took a breath. The next time she called was a few weeks later. All I could hear at first were gasps of air, and finally I could make out the words. I'm so ashamed, Mama. I'm so ashamed. The place, it's a bad place. Terrible things happen there. They're not good people, and... The next part was so muffled I could not make it out. And then I realized she was crying. Crying so hard she could not speak. I gripped the phone tight enough that my hand hurt. I can't hear you, my darling. I said, I said, I'm not a good person either. You are a good person, I told her fiercely. I know you, and you're mine, and you're good. I'm not, Mama. I've done terrible things, and I can't even work there any longer. Why not? A long pause. So long that I began to wonder if we had been cut off. I'm pregnant, Mama. I thought I hadn't heard her properly at first. You're uh, pregnant? Not only was she unmarried, she hadn't mentioned any partner to me, anyone special. I was so shocked I couldn't speak for a moment. How many months? Five months, Mama. I can't hide it any longer. I can't work. After this, all I could hear was the sound of her crying. I knew I had to say something positive. But I'm... I'm so happy, my darling, I told her. I'm going to be a grandmother. What a wonderful thing. I'll start getting some money together. I tried not to let her hear my panic about how I would do this quickly enough. I would have to take on extra work. I would have to ask favors, borrow. It would take time, but I would find a way. I'll come to Paris, I told her. I'll help you look after the baby. I looked at Benjamin Daniels. It took some time, monsieur. It was not cheap. It took me six months. But finally, I had the money to come here. I had my visa, too, which would allow me to stay for a few weeks. I knew that she would already have had the baby, though I hadn't heard from her for several weeks. I had tried not to panic about this. I had tried instead to imagine what it would be like to hold my grandchild for the first time. But I would be there to help her with the care, and to care for her. That was the important thing. 
Of course, he nodded in understanding. I had no home address for her when I arrived, so I went to her place of work. I knew the name. She had told me that much. It seemed such an elegant, refined place, in the rich part of town, as she had said. The doorman looked at me in my poor clothes. The entrance for the cleaners is round the back, he said. I was not offended. It was only to be expected. I found the entrance slipped inside. And because I looked the way I did, I was invisible. No one paid me any attention. No one said I should not be there. I found the women, the girls, who had worked with my daughter, who knew her. And that was when, for a moment, I could not speak. When? He prompted gently. My daughter died, monsieur. She died in childbirth, nineteen years ago. I came to work here, and I have stayed ever since. And the baby? Your daughter's baby? But, monsieur, clearly you have not understood. I took the photograph album from him and shut it back in the bureau with my relics, my treasures. The things I have collected over the years, a first tooth, a child's shoe, a school certificate. My granddaughter is here. It's why I came here. Why I have worked here for all these years, in this building. I wanted to be close to her. I wanted to watch her grow up. A word from behind the penthouse door, and suddenly I am wrenched back into the present. I have just distinctly heard one of them say, concierge. I step backwards into the gloom, treading carefully to avoid the creaking floorboards. An instinct. I should not be here. I need to get back to my cabin. Now. Mimi, fourth floor. I burst back into the apartment. I go straight to my room, straight to the window, stare out through the glass. It was hell sitting up there with all of them, talking, shouting at each other. I just wanted it to stop. I wanted so badly to be alone. Mimi. 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 It takes a moment for me to work out where the sound is coming from. I turn around and see Camille standing there in my doorway, hands on her hips. Mimi? She walks towards me, clicks her fingers in front of my face. Hello? What are you doing? Quoi? What? I stare at her. You were just staring out of the window like some sort of zombie. She does an impression, eyes wide, jaw hanging open. What were you looking at? I shrug. I hadn't even realized. But I must have been looking into his apartment. Old habits die hard. Putain, you're scaring me, Mimi. You've been acting so... so weird. She pauses. Even weirder than normal. Then she frowns like she's working something out. Ever since the other night... When I came back late and you were still up. What is it? Rien. I say, it's nothing. Why won't you just leave me alone? I don't believe you, she says. What happened here before I got back that night? What's going on with you? I shut my eyes, clench my fists. I can't cope with all these questions. All this probing. I feel like I'm about to explode. With as much control as I can manage, I say, I just... I need to be on my own right now, Camille. I need my own space. She doesn't take the hint. Hey, was it something to do with that guy you were being so mysterious about? Did it not work out? If you just tell me, maybe I could help. I can't take any more. The white noise is buzzing in my head. I stand up. I hate the way she's looking at me, 
the concern and worry in her expression. Why can't she just get it? I suddenly feel like I don't want to see her face anymore. Like it would be better if she weren't here at all. Just shut up! Fuck off! Fuck off! Just... just leave me alone! She takes a step back. And I'm sick of you bugging me. I say, I'm sick of all your mess around the place, everywhere I look. I'm sick of you bringing your... your fuck buddies back here. I might be a widow, yes, I know all of your friends think that, but you, you're a disgusting little slut. I think I've done it now. Her eyes are wide as she steps further away from me. Then she disappears from the room. I don't feel good, but at least I can breathe again. I hear sounds coming from her bedroom next door, drawers being pulled open, cupboard doors slamming. A few moments later, she appears with a couple of canvas bags over each arm, stuff spilling out of them. You know what? She says, I might be a disgusting little slut, but you are one crazy bitch. I can't be bothered with this anymore, Mimi. I don't need this. And Dominique's got her own place now. No more sneaking around. I'm out of here. There's only one person I know with that name. That doesn't make any sense. Dominique, yeah. Your brother's ex. And all that time he thought she was flirting with Ben. A little smile. That was a good decoy, right? Anyway, this is different. This is the real deal. I love her. It's one woman for me now. No more Camille, the, what uh, was it you called me? Disgusting little slut. She hoists a bag higher on her shoulder. Buff. Whatever. I'll see you around, Mimi. Good luck with whatever the fuck is going on with you. A couple of minutes later, she's gone. I turn back to the window. I watch her striding across the courtyard, bags over her arm. For a moment, I actually feel better. Calmer. Freer. Like maybe I'll be able to think more clearly with her gone. But now it's too quiet. Because it's still here, the storm in my head, and I don't know whether I'm more frightened of it or of what it's drowning out. I lift my gaze from the courtyard. I look back into his apartment. A few days ago, I let myself in there with a key I stole from the concierge's cabin. I've been going into that cabin since I was a little girl, sneaking in, while I was sure the old woman was on one of the top floors cleaning. It used to fascinate me. It was like the cabin in the woods from a fairy tale. She has all these mysterious photographs on the walls. The proof she actually had another life before she came here, as hard as it is to believe. A beautiful young woman in so many of them, like a princess from the same fairy tale. Now I'm older, of course. I know that there's nothing magical about the cabin. It's just the tiny, lonely home of a poor old lady. It's depressing. But I still remembered exactly where she kept the master set of keys. Of course she's not allowed to use them. They're in case of emergencies. If there was a flood in one of the apartments, say, while we were on holiday somewhere. And she doesn't have a set for my parents' apartment. That's off limits. It was early evening, dusk. I waited, watched him go out through the courtyard, like I watched Camille just now. He was only in a shirt and it was cold, so I didn't think he was going far. Perhaps just a few streets over to buy some cigarettes from the tabac, which still gave me enough time to do what I needed. I ran down the single flight of steps and let myself into the third floor apartment. Underneath my clothes, I was wearing the new lingerie I had bought with Camille. I could feel the secret, rustling slipperiness of it against my skin. 
I felt like someone braver, bolder. I was going to wait for him until he came back. I wanted to surprise him. And this way, I would be the one in control of the situation. I'd watched him so many times from my bedroom. But to stand in his apartment was different. I could feel his presence there. Smell the scent of him beneath the strange, musty, old lady odor of the place. I wandered around for a while, just breathing him in. The whole time his cat stalked after me, watching me, like it knew I was up to no good. I opened his fridge and I rifled through his cupboards. I looked through his records, his collection of books. I went into his bedroom and lay down on his bed, which still had the imprint of his body in it. And I inhaled the scent of him on the pillows. I looked through the toiletries in his bathroom, opened the caps. I sprayed his lemon-scented cologne down the front of my shirt and in my hair. I opened his closet and buried my face in his shirts. But better were the shirts in his laundry basket, the ones he'd worn, the ones that smelt like his skin and sweat. Better even than that were the short hairs I found around the sink where he'd shaved and hadn't managed to wash them all away. I collected several on a finger. I swallowed them. If I'd watched myself, I might have said I looked like someone in the grip of an amour fou, an obsessive, mad love. But an amour fou is usually unrequited. And I knew that he felt the same way. That was the important thing. I just wanted to become a part of it, this world, his world. I'd had thousands of conversations with him in my head. I'd told him about my brothers, how horrible Antoine has always been to me, how Nick is really just a big loser who lives off Papa's money, and I honestly didn't get why Ben was friends with him. How the second I graduated, I'd be out of here, off to travel the world. We could go together. I found a glass in the kitchen and poured myself some of his wine, drank it down like it was a glass of grenadine. I needed to be drunk enough to do this. Then I took off my clothes. I lay down on his bed, waiting like a present left there on the pillow. But after a while I felt stupid. Maybe the wine was wearing off. I was a little too cold. This wasn't how I'd planned it in my head. I'd thought he'd have come back sooner. Half an hour ticked by. How long was he going to be? I wandered over to his desk. I wanted to read what he was writing so late into the night, scribbling notes, typing on his laptop. I found a notebook. A moleskin just like I use for my sketching. Another sign that we were meant to be. Twinned souls, soulmates. The music, the writing. We were so similar. That was what he was telling me that night when we sat in the darkened park together. And before that, when he gave me the record. Outsiders, but outsiders together. The book was full of notes for restaurant reviews, little doodles in between the writing, cards for restaurants tucked between the pages. It made me feel so close to him, his handwriting, beautiful, clever, a little spiky, exactly as I would have imagined. Elegant like the fingers that had touched my arm that night in the park, I fell a little deeper in love seeing that writing. And then, on the last page, there was a note that had my name written there, a question mark after it like this. Mimi? Oh my God, he'd been writing about me. I had to know more, had to find out what this meant. I opened his laptop. It asked me for the password. Merde. I hadn't a chance of getting in. It could be literally anything. I tried a couple of things. His surname, his favourite football team. I'd found a Manchester United shirt hanging in his closet. No luck. And then I had an idea. I thought of that necklace he always wore. The one he said came from his mum. 
I typed in Saint Christopher. No, it bounced back at me. It was just a blind guess, so I wasn't surprised. But just because I could, I tried again, with numbers substituted for some of the letters, a tighter encryption. 5TCHR1ST0PH3R. And this time, when I pressed enter, the password box closed and his desktop opened up. I stared at the screen. I couldn't believe I had guessed it. That had to mean something too, didn't it? It felt like a confirmation of how well I knew him. And I know writers are private about their work in the same way that I'm private about my art. But now it felt almost like he wanted whatever was on here to be found and read by me. I went to his documents to Recent. And there it was at the top. All the others had the names of restaurants. They were obviously reviews. But this one was called Meunier Wines S.A.R.L. According to the little timestamp, this was what he had been working on an hour ago. I opened it. Merde, my heart was beating so fast. Excited, terrified, I began to read. But as soon as I did, I wanted to stop. I wished I had never seen any of it. I didn't know what I had expected, but this was not it. It felt like my whole world was caving in around me. I felt sick. But I couldn't stop. Jess. The girl steps forward into the light of the street lamp. She appears totally different to how she did in her act. She wears a cheap-looking fake leather jacket and jeans with a hoodie underneath. But it's also that she's taken off all that thick makeup. She looks a lot less glamorous, and at the same time much more beautiful. And younger. A lot younger. I didn't get a proper look at her in the darkness near the cemetery that time. If you'd asked me, I might have guessed late twenties. But now I'd say somewhere closer to eighteen or nineteen. The same sort of age as Mimi Minier. Why did you come? She hisses at us, in that thick accent. To the club. I remember how she turned and sprinted away the first time we met. I know I have to tread very carefully here, not spook her. We're still looking for Ben, I say gently, and I feel like you might know something that could help us. Am I right? She mutters something under her breath, the word that sounds like Corva. For a moment, I think she might be about to flee, but she stays put, even steps a little closer. Not here, she whispers. She looks behind her, nervous as a cat. We must go somewhere else, away from this place. At her lead, we walk away from the posh streets with the fancy cars and the glitzy shop windows. We walk through avenues with red and gold fronted cafes with wicker seats outside. Like the one I met Theo in. Signs advertising prefix menus. Groups of tourists still mooching about aimlessly. We leave them behind too. We walk through streets with bars and loud techno. Past some sort of club with a long queue snaking around the corner. We enter a new neighbourhood where the restaurants have names written in Arabic, in Chinese, other languages I don't even recognise. We pass vape shops, phone shops that all look exactly the same. Windows of mannequins wearing different style wigs. Stores selling cheap furniture. This is not tourist Paris. We cross a traffic intersection with a bristle of flimsy-looking tents on the small patch of grass in the middle. A group of guys cooking stuff on a little makeshift stove, hands in their pockets, standing close to keep warm. 
The girl leads us into an all-night kebab place with a flickering sign over the door and a couple of small metal tables at the back, rows of strip lights in the ceiling. We sit down at a greasy little formica table in the corner. It's hard to imagine anywhere more different from the low-lit glamour of the club we've just left. Maybe that's exactly why she's chosen it. Theo orders us each a carton of chips. The girl takes a huge handful of hers and dunks them, all together, into one of the pots of garlic sauce, then somehow crams the whole lot hungrily into her mouth. Who's he? She mumbles through her mouthful, nodding at Theo. Uh, This is Theo, I say. He works with Ben. He's helping me. I'm Jess. What's your name? A brief pause. Irina. Irina. The name is familiar. I remember what Ben had scribbled on that sheet of wine accounts I found in his dictionary. Ask Irina. Ben said he would come back, she says suddenly, urgently. He said he would come back for me. There's something in her expression I recognize. Uh Aha. Someone else who has fallen in love with my brother. He said he would get me away from that place. Help find a new job for me. I'm sure he was working on it, I say cautiously. It sounds quite like Ben, I think. Promising things he can't necessarily deliver. But, like I said before, he's disappeared. What has happened? She asks. What do you think has happened to him? We don't know. I tell her. But I found a card for the club in his stuff. Irina, if there's anything you can tell us, anything at all, it might help us find him. She sizes both of us up. She seems confused by being in this unfamiliar position of power. And frightened, too. Glancing over her shoulder every few seconds, We can pay you, I say. I look across at Theo. He rolls his eyes, pulls out his wallet. When we've agreed on an amount of cash Irina is happy with, depressingly small, actually, and after she's finished the chips and used up both of our pots of garlic sauce, she draws one leg up against the table protectively, the skin of her knee pale and bruised in one spot through the ripped denim. For some reason this makes me think of playground scrapes, the child she was not so long ago. You have a cigarette? She asks Theo. He passes her one, and she lights up. Her knee is juddering against the table, so hard that the little salt and pepper shakers are leaping up and down. You were really good, by the way, I say, trying to think of something safe to begin with. You're dancing. I know, she says, seriously, nodding her head. I'm very good. The best at la petite mort. I trained as a dancer before, where I come from. When I came for the job, they said it was for dancing. It seemed like the audience really enjoyed it, I say. The show. I thought your performance was very, I try to think of the right word, sophisticated. She raises her eyebrows, then makes a kind of huh sound without any humour in it. The show, she mutters. That's what Ben wanted to know about. It seemed like he knew some things already. I think someone told him some of it, maybe. Told him some of what, I prompt. She takes a long drag on her cigarette. I notice that her hand is shaking. They had to show, all of it. It's just... She seems to be searching for the right words. Window. 
looking. No, window shopping. Not what that place is really about. Because afterwards, they come downstairs. The special guests. What do you mean? Theo says, sitting forwards. Special guests. A nervous glance out through the windows at the street. Then suddenly she's fumbling the roll of notes Theo gave her back out of her jacket pocket, thrusting it at him. I can't do this. Irina, I say quickly, carefully. We're not trying to get you in any trouble. Trust me. We won't go blabbing to anyone. We're just trying to find out what Ben knew. Because I think that might help us find him. Anything you can tell us might be useful in some way. I'm really scared for him. As I say it, my voice breaks. It's no act. I lean forward, begging her. Please, please help us. She seems to be absorbing all this, deciding. I watch her take a long breath. Then, in a low voice, she begins to talk. The special guests pay for a different kind of ticket. Rich men, important men, married men. She holds up her hand for emphasis, touches her ring finger. We don't know names, but we know they are important. With, she rubs her thumb and forefinger together, money. They come downstairs to the other rooms, below. We make them feel good. We tell them how handsome they are, how sexy. And today, the Oakoffs. <clears throat> Buy anything? Irina stares at him blankly. I think his delicacy might have been lost in translation. Do they pay for sex? I ask, lowering my voice to a murmur, wanting to show we have her back. That's what he means. Again, she glances at the windows, out at the dark street. She's practically hovering in her seat, looking like she's ready to leg it at any moment. Do you want more money? I prompt. I kind of want her to ask for more. I'm sure Theo can afford it. She nods quickly. I nudge Theo. Go on then. A little reluctantly, he pulls another couple of notes out of his pocket, slides them across the table to her. Then, almost like she's reading from some sort of script, she says, No, it is illegal in this country to pay. Oh. Theo and I look at each other. I think we must both be thinking the same thing. In that case, then what? But she hasn't finished. They don't buy that. It's clever. They buy wine. They spend big money on wine. She spreads her hands to demonstrate this. There's a code. If they ask for a younger vintage, that's the kind of girl they want. If they ask for one of the special vintages, it means they'd like extras. And we do everything they want us to. We do whatever they ask. We're theirs for the night. They choose the girl or girls they want. And they go to a special room with a lock on the door. Or we go somewhere with them. Hotel, apartment. Ah, uh, Theo says, grimacing. The girls at the club. We don't have family. We don't have money. Some have run from home. Some, many, are illegal. She sits forward. They have our passports, too. So you can't leave the country, I say, turning to Theo. That's fucking dark. 
I can't go back there anyway, she says, suddenly, fiercely. To Serbia. It wasn't, it wasn't a good situation back home, she adds defensively. But I never thought, I never thought that would be where I'd end up, a place like that. They know we won't go to the police. One of the clients, some girls say he is police, important police. Other places get shut down all the time, but not that place. Can you actually prove that? Theo asks, sitting forward. At this, she checks over her shoulder and lowers her voice. Then she nods. I took some photos of the one they say is police. You've got photos? Theo leans forward, eagerly. They take our phones, but when I started speaking to Ben, he gave me a camera. I was going to give this to your brother. A hesitation. Her eyes dart between us and the window. More money, she says. Both of us turn to Theo. Wait as he finds some more cash and puts it on the table between us. She fumbles her hand into the pocket of her jacket, then takes it back out, fist clenched, knuckles showing white. Very carefully, like she's handling something explosive, she places a memory card on the table and pushes it towards me. They're not such good photos. I had to be so careful. But I think it's enough. Here, yeah, Theo says, reaching out a hand. No, Irina says, looking at me. Not him. You. Thank you. I take it. Slide it into my own jacket pocket. I'm sorry, I say, because it seems suddenly important to say it. I'm sorry this has happened to you. She shrugs, hunches into herself. Maybe it's better than other things, you know? At least you're not going to end up murdered at the end of an alley, or in the Bois de Boulogne, or raped in some guy's car. We have more control. And sometimes they buy us presents to make us feel good. Some of the girls get nice clothes, jewelry. Some go on dates, become girlfriends. Everybody's happy. Except she looks anything but happy. There's even a story. She leans closer, lowers her voice. What? Theo asks. Did the owner's wife came from there? I stare at her. What? From the club? Yes. That she was one of the girls. So I guess it worked out okay for some. I'm trying to process this. Sophie Meunier. The diamond earrings. The silk shirts. The icy stare. The penthouse apartment. The whole vibe of being better than everyone else. She was one of them, a sex worker. But it's not rich husbands for everyone. Some guys, they refuse to wear anything. Or they take it off when you're not looking. Some girls get, you know, sick. You mean STIs? I ask. Yes. And then in a small voice. I caught something. She pulls a face, a grimace of disgust and embarrassment. After that, I knew I had to leave. And some girls get pregnant. It happens, you know. There's a story, too, about the girl a long, long time ago. Maybe it's just a rumor. But they say she got pregnant and wanted to keep it, 
or maybe it was too late to do something. Anyway, when she went into... She mimes doubling over with pain. Labor. Yes. When that happened, she came to the club. She had no other place to go. When you're illegal, you're scared to go to hospital. She had the baby in the club. But they said it was a bad birth. Too much blood. They took her body away. No one ever knows she existed. No problem. Because she wasn't official. Jesus Christ. And you told all this to Ben? I asked her. Yes. He said he would make sure I was safe. Help me out. A new start. I speak English. I'm clever. I want a normal job. Waitressing. Something like that. Because... Her voice wavers. She puts up a hand to her eyes. I see the shine of tears. She swipes at them with the heel of her hand, almost angrily, like she doesn't have time for crying. It's not what I came to this country for. I came for a new life. And even though I never cry, I feel my own eyes pricking. I hear her. Every woman deserves that. The chance of a new life. Mimi, fourth floor. I sit here on my bed, staring into the darkness of his apartment, remembering. On his laptop three nights ago, I read about a place with a locked room, about what happened in that room, about the women the men, about how it was, is, connected to this place, to this family. I felt sick to my stomach. It couldn't be right what he'd written, but there were names. There was detail, so much horrible detail, and Papa? No, it couldn't be true. I refused to believe it. It had to be lies. And then I saw my own name, like I had in his notebook, when it had been so exciting. Only now it filled me with fear. Somehow I was connected to that place too. There were horrible things my older stepbrother had said. I had always thought they were just random insults. Now I wasn't sure. I didn't think I could bring myself to read it, but I knew I had to. What I saw next, I felt my whole life fall apart. If it was true, it would explain exactly why I had always felt like an outsider. Why Papa had always treated me the way he had. Because I wasn't really theirs. And there was more. I glimpsed a line. Something about my real mother? But I couldn't read it because my eyes had blurred with tears. I froze. Then I heard footsteps outside, approaching the door. Mailed. I slammed the laptop closed. The key was turning in the lock. He was back. Oh God, I couldn't face him. Not now. Not like this. Everything was changed between us. Broken. Everything I believed in had just been shattered. Everything I had ever known was a lie. I didn't even know who I was anymore. I ran into the bedroom. There was no time. The closet. I yanked the doors open, slipped inside, crouched down in the darkness. I heard him put a record on the player in the main room, and the music streamed out, just like the music I had heard every hot summer night, floating to me across the courtyard, as though he had been playing it for me. It felt like my heart was breaking. It couldn't be true. It couldn't be true. Then 
Over the sound of my own breathing, I heard him entering the room. Through the keyhole I saw him moving around. He pulled off his sweater. I saw his stomach, that line of hair I had noticed on the first day. I thought about that girl I had been, the one who had watched him from the balcony. I hated her for being such a clueless little idiot, a spoiled brat, thinking she had issues. She had no idea. But at the same time I was grieving for the loss of her, knowing I could never go back to her. He paced close to the closet. I cringed back into the shadows, and then moved away again, stepping into the bathroom. I heard him turn on the shower. All I wanted now was to get out of there. This was my moment. I pushed the door open. I could hear him moving around in the bathroom, the shower door opening. I began to tiptoe across the floor, quiet as I could. Then there was a knock on the front door of the apartment. Putain! Back I ran, back to the closet, crouching down in the darkness. I heard the shower stop. I heard him go to answer it, greeting whoever it was at the door. And then I heard the other voice. I knew it straight away, of course I did. They talked for a while, but I couldn't hear what they were saying. I opened the closet door a crack, trying to hear. Then they were coming into the bedroom. Why? What were they doing in the bedroom? Why would those two come in here? I could just make them out through the keyhole. Even in those snatched glimpses, I could see there was something strange about their body language. Something I couldn't quite work out. But I knew that something was wrong. Something was not how it should be. And then it happened. I saw them move together, the two of them. I saw their lips meet. It felt like it was happening in slow motion. I was digging my nails so hard into my palms, I thought I might be about to draw blood. This couldn't be happening. This couldn't be real. I sank down into the darkness, fist in my mouth, teeth biting into my knuckles to stop myself from screaming. A few moments later, I heard the shower start again, the two of them going into the bathroom, closing the door. Now was my chance. I didn't care about the risk that they might catch me. Now nothing mattered as much as getting out of there. I ran like I was running for my life. Back in my room, back in the apartment, I fell to pieces. I was sobbing so hard I could hardly breathe. The pain was too much, I couldn't bear it. I thought of all the plans I had made for the two of us. I knew he had felt it too, what had been between us in the park that night, and now he'd broken it, he'd ruined it all. I took out the paintings I'd made of him and forced myself to look at them. Grief became rage. Fucking bastard. Fucking lying fils de pute. All those horrible, twisted, lying words on his computer. And then he and Maman? The two of them together like that? I stopped remembered what I'd seen on his computer. I had called her Maman. But after everything I had read, I wasn't even sure what she was to me now. No, I couldn't think about that. I wouldn't, couldn't believe it. It was all too painful. I could only focus on my anger. That was pure, uncomplicated. I took out my canvas cutting knife. The blade, so sharp you can cut yourself just by touching it to your thumb. I held it to the first canvas and I sliced through it. All the time I felt like he was watching me with those beautiful eyes, asking what I was doing. So I punched holes through them so I couldn't see his eyes any longer. And then I ripped into all of them stabbing through the canvas with the blade, enjoying hearing it tear. 
pulled at the fabric with my hands, the canvas rasping as his face, his body, was torn to pieces. Afterwards, I was trembling. I looked at what I'd done. The mess. The violence of it. Knowing that it had come from me, I felt like I had an electric current running through me. A feeling that was kind of like fear, kind of like excitement. But it wasn't enough. I knew what I had to do. Jess. I have to go. Irina says, a nervous glance out at the dark, empty street beyond the windows. We've been too long, talking like this. I feel bad just letting her wander off into the city on her own. She's so young, so vulnerable. Will you be okay? I ask her. She gives me a look. It says, I've been looking after myself for a very long time, babe. I trust myself to do that better than anyone else. And there's something proud about her as she walks away. A kind of dignity. The way she holds herself, so upright. A dancer's posture, I suppose. I think how Ben promised to take care of her. I could make promises too. But I don't know if I can keep them. I don't want to lie to her. But I make a vow to myself, in this moment, that if I can find a way, I will. As Theo and I walk towards the metro, I'm reeling, running through everything Irina told us. Do they all know? The whole family? Even nice guy Nick? The thought makes me feel nauseous. I think of how he told me that he was between jobs, how it clearly didn't make much odds to him. I suppose it wouldn't if you don't need an income, if your lifestyle is being bankrolled by a load of girls selling themselves. And if the Meunier family knew that Ben had found out the truth about Le Petit Moor, what might they have done to prevent a secret like that from getting out? I turned to Theo. If Ben's story had been printed, the police would have to act, wouldn't they? It wouldn't matter if the Meunier have some high-up contacts. Surely there'd be public pressure to investigate. Theo nods, but I sense he's not really listening. So he really was onto something, after all, he mutters quickly, almost to himself. He sounds very different to his usual, sardonic, downbeat self. He sounds... I try to put my finger on it. Excited. I glance at him. It's going to be a huge scoop, he says. It's big. It's really big. Especially if establishment figures are involved. It's like the President's Club, but way, way darker. It's the sort of thing that wins awards. I stop dead. Are you taking the piss? I can feel anger pulsing through me. Do you even care about Ben at all? I stare at him. (laughs) You don't, do you? Theo opens his mouth to say something, but I don't want to hear another word. Oh, you know what? Fuck you! I march away from him, as fast as I can in these ridiculous heels. I'm not completely sure where I'm going, and of course my stupid phone ran out of data, but I'll work it out. Far better than having to spend literally another second in his company. Jess! Theo calls. I'm half jogging now. I turn left onto another street. I can't hear him anymore, thank God. I think this is the way. But the problem is that all the crappy phone shops look exactly the same, especially with their lights off and grills down, no one about. There's an odd smell coming from somewhere, acrid, like burning plastic. 
What a bastard. I seem to be crying. Why the hell am I crying? I always knew I couldn't trust him, really. I suspected he'd had some angle the first time we met. So it's not like it's a big surprise. It must be everything. The stress of the last few days. Or Irina. The horror of everything she just told us. Or simply the fact that, even though I half saw it coming, I kind of hoped I was wrong. Just this once. And now here I am alone. Again. Like always. I turn onto a new street. Hesitate. I don't think I recognise this. But there seem to be metro stops everywhere in this city. If I walk for another couple of blocks, I'm sure I'll find one. Over the churn of angry thoughts in my head, I'm vaguely aware of some sort of commotion nearby. Yelling and shouting. A street party? Maybe I should head in that direction. Because I've just realised there's a lone guy walking in my direction from the other end of the street. Hands in his pockets. And I'm sure he's fine. But I don't really want to test it. I turn off. Head towards the noise. And way, way too late. I realise this is no street party. I see a mass of people surging in my direction, some of them wearing balaclavas and swim goggles and ski masks. Huge plumes of black smoke are mushrooming into the air. I can hear screaming, shouting, the sound of metal being struck. Heat roars towards me in a powerful wave and I see the fire in the middle of the street, the flames as high as the second floor windows of the buildings opposite. In the middle you can just make out the blackened skeleton of a police van that has been turned on its side and set ablaze. Now I can make out the police approaching the protesters in riot gear, helmets and plastic visors, waving batons in the air. I hear the whiplash crack of the batons as they make contact. And mixing with the black smoke is another kind of vapour. Greyish, spilling in all directions, coming towards me. For a moment I stand, frozen, watching. People are running in this direction, slaloming around me, pushing, yelling, desperate holding scarves and t-shirts over their mouths. A guy next to me turns and lobs something. A bottle? Back in the direction of the police. I turn and follow, trying to run. But there are too many bodies, and the grey vapour is catching up with me, swirling all around. I start coughing and can't stop. I feel like I'm choking. My eyes are stinging watering so much I can hardly see. Then I collide, smack, into another body. Someone who's just standing still in the middle of the stampede. I ricochet back, winded by the impact. Then look up, squinting through the tears. Theo! He grabs hold of the arm of my jacket, and I cling onto him. Together we turn and half run, half stumble coughing and wheezing. Somehow we find a side street, manage to break free from the torrent of people. A few minutes later, we shove through the door of a nearby bar. My eyes are still streaming. I look at Theo and see his eyes are red-rimmed too. Tear gas, he says, putting his forearm up to rub at them. Fuck. People are turning on their bar stools to stare at us. We need to wash this stuff out of our eyes, Theo says. Straight away. The barman points us wordlessly in the right direction. It's a single, largish bathroom. We get the tap running and splash water onto our faces, leaning together over the small sink. I can hear ragged breathing. 
I'm not sure if it's mine or his. I blink. The water has helped to ease the stinging a little. It's now, as my pulse returns to normal, that I remember. I don't want to be in this guy's company at all. I grope for the door. Jess, Theo says. About before. No. Nope. Fuck off. Please, hear me out. He does, at least, look a little ashamed. He puts up a hand, mops his eyes. The fact that the tear gas makes him look like he's been crying is an odd addition. He starts speaking, quickly, like he's trying to get it all out before I can cut him off. Please, let me explain. Look, this job is a total pain in the arse. It pays absolutely nothing. It broke up my last relationship. Every so often, something like this comes along and you get to expose the bad guys and suddenly it all seems worthwhile. Yeah, I realise that's no excuse. I got carried away. I'm sorry. I look down at the floor, my arms crossed. And if I'm truthful, no. I don't really care about your brother. One key skill as a journalist is being able to read people. And can I be really brutally honest now? Ben always seemed totally self-interested. Always out for numero uno. I hate him for saying it. Not least because there's a part of me that suspects he may be right. How dare you... No, no. Let me speak. When he initially told me about his big scoop, I was sceptical. He's also a bit of a bullshit merchant, no? But when you played me that voicemail, I thought, yeah, actually there might be a story here. Maybe he did get tangled up in something nasty. It might be worth seeing where this all leads after all. So no. I didn't care about your brother. But you know what, Jess? I want to help you. Oh, fuck. No, listen. I want to help you because I think you deserve a break. And I think you're pretty bloody brave. And I also think you don't have a bad bone in your body. <sighs> then you really don't know me at all. Christ, does anyone really know anyone? But I'm not a bad guy, Jess. To be fair, I'm not an entirely good one, either. But he coughs, looks down at the floor. I glance at him. Is he bullshitting me? My eyes have started streaming again. I really don't want him to think they're tears. Ow, Jesus. I wince as I rub at them. He steps towards me. Hey, can I take a look? A shrug. He reaches out a hand and tilts my chin upwards. Yeah, they're still pretty red. But I think we only got a little of it, thank God. It should wear off soon. His face is very close to mine. And I'm not quite sure how it happens. But one moment he's holding my jaw and peering at me his touch surprisingly gentle. The next I appear to be kissing him, and he tastes like cigarettes and wine from the club, which is suddenly one of the better tastes I can imagine. And he's a lot taller than me, so my neck is cricked. But actually I don't care. In fact, I kind of like it. Because this is hot. It's really fucking hot and also wrong in so many different ways. Not least because I'm wearing his ex-girlfriend's clothes. And even though he's so much bigger than me, I'm the one pushing him back against the sink, and he's letting me, and one of his big hands is tangling in my hair. And then I'm taking his other hand, and pulling it under this stupid, tiny dress. And it's only now that we remember we should probably lock the door. 
Sophie, penthouse. The others have left the penthouse. I sent Mimi to her apartment to wait. I don't want her to witness any of what's to come. My daughter is so fragile. Our relationship, too. We have to find a new way of being with one another. I walk into the bathroom, gaze at myself in the mirror, grip the sides of the sink. I look pale and drawn. I look every one of my fifty years. If Jacques were here right now, he would be appalled. I smooth my hair. I spray scent behind my ears on the pulse points of my wrists, powder the shine off my forehead. Then I pick up my lipstick and apply it. My hand falters only once. Otherwise, I am as precise as ever. Then I walk back to the main room of the apartment. The bottle of wine is still there on the table. Another glass, just to help me think. I start, as I realize I am not alone. Antoine stands by the floor-to-ceiling windows, watching me. A malignant presence. He must have stayed behind after the other two left. What are you doing here? I ask him. I try to keep my voice controlled, even though my pulse is fluttering up somewhere near my throat. He steps forward, under the spotlights. The mark of my hand is still pink on his cheek. I'm not proud of myself for that loss of restraint. It happens so rarely. I've become good at keeping my emotions in check over the years. But on those very rare occasions when the provocation is great enough, I seem to lose all sense of proportion. The rage takes over. It's been fun, he says, coming nearer still. What has been fun? Oh. The grin he gives me now makes him look quite deranged. But surely you have guessed by now. After that whole thing with the photograph in Papa's study, you know? Leaving those little notes for you in your postbox under your door, waiting to collect my cash. I really do like how you package it up like that for me. Those nice cream envelopes, very discreet. I stare at him. I feel as though everything has just been turned on its head. You! It's been you all along! He gives a little mock curtsy. Are you surprised that I got it together enough? A useless hothouse flower like me? I even managed to keep it all to myself up till now. Didn't want my darling brother to try and get in on the action too, because, as you well know, he is just as much of a... What was the word you used again? Leech, as I am. He's just more hypocritical about it. Hides it better. You don't need money, I tell him. Your father, that's what you think. But you see... I had an inkling a few weeks ago that Dominique might be about to try and leave. Just as I suspected, she's trying to fleece me for everything I've got. She's always been a greedy little bitch. And darling Papa is so fucking tight-fisted. So I've wanted a little extra cash, you know? To squirrel away. Did Jacques tell you? No, no. I worked it all out on my own. I found the records. Papa keeps very precise notes, did you know that? of the clients, but also of the girls. I always had my suspicions about you, but I wanted proof. So I went deep into the archives. I found the details of one, Sofia Volkova, who used to work, he puts the word in air quotes, at the club nearly thirty years ago. That name. But Sofia Volkova no longer exists. I left her back there, shut up in that place with the staircase leading deep underground. The velvet walls, the locked room. Anyway, Antoine says, I'm more switched on than people realize. I see a great deal more than everyone thinks. That manic grin again. But then you knew that part already, didn't you? Jess. Theo and I walk to the metro together. Funny. How after you've slept with someone, not that you'd call what we just did up against the sink sleeping, you can suddenly feel so shy, so unsure of what to say to each other. I feel stupid, thinking about the time we might have just wasted. Even if, admittedly, neither of us took that much time. It also feels almost like it just happened to someone else especially now I've changed back into my normal clothes. 
Theo turns to face me, his expression solemn. Jess, you obviously can't go back to that place. Back into the belly of the beast. You'd be bloody mad. His tone no longer has that drawling, sardonic edge to it. There's a softness there. Don't take this the wrong way, but you strike me as the kind of person who could be a little... reckless. I know you probably think it's the only way you can help Ben, and it's really... commendable. I stare at him. Commendable? I'm not trying to win some kind of bloody school prize. He's my brother. He's literally the only family I have in the entire world. Okay, Theo says, putting his hands up. That was clearly the wrong word. It's way, way too dangerous. Why don't you come to mine? I have a couch. You'd still be in Paris. You'll be able to keep looking for Ben. You could speak to the police. What? The same police who supposedly know about that place and haven't done anything about it? The same police who might well actually be in on it? Yeah. Bat lot of good that would do. We head down the steps to the metro together, down onto the platform. It's almost totally empty, just some drunk guy singing to himself on the opposite side. I hear the deep rumble of a train approaching, feel it behind my breastbone. Then I have a sudden, definite feeling that something is wrong, though I can't work out what. A kind of sixth sense, I suppose. Then I hear something else, the sound of running feet, several pairs of running feet. Theo, I say. Look, I think... But before I've even got the words out, it's happening. Four big guys are tackling Theo to the ground. I realise that they're in uniform, police uniforms, and one of them is triumphantly holding a baggie full of something white in the air. That's not mine, Theo shouts. You planted that on me! Fuck so... But his next words are muffled, then replaced by a groan of pain as one policeman slams his face into the wall, while another clips cuffs on him. The train is pulling into the platform. I see the people in the nearest carriage staring from the windows. Then I see that another man is approaching us on the platform, older, wearing a smart suit beneath an equally smart grey coat. That cropped steel grey hair, that pit bull face, I know him. It's the guy Nick took me into the police station to meet. Commissaire Blanchot. Now, thinking wildly back, I make another connection. The figure I thought I recognised in the audience at the club. Just before the lights went down. It was him. He must have been following us all night. The two policemen, who aren't so preoccupied with holding Theo, start towards me now. It's my turn. I know I only have a few seconds to act. The train doors are opening. Suddenly, a whole crowd of protesters are pouring from the carriage, carrying signs and makeshift weapons. Theo manages to turn his head towards me. Jess! He calls through a split lip. His voice slurred. Get on the bloody train! The guy behind him knees him in the back. He crumples onto the platform. I hesitate. I can't just leave him here. Get on the fucking train, Jess! I'll be fine! And don't you dare go back there! The nearest policeman lunges for me. I step quickly out of his way then turn and shove my way through the oncoming crowd. I leap up into the carriage just before the doors close. Sophie, penthouse. Well, Antoine says. 
much as I have enjoyed our little chit-chat. I'd like my cash now, please. He puts out his hand. I thought I'd come and collect it in person, because I've been waiting for three days now. You've always been so prompt in the past, so diligent. And I've let a day go by for extenuating circumstances, you know. But I can't wait forever. My patience does have limits. I don't have it, I say. It is not as easy as you think. I think it's pretty fucking easy. Antoine gestures about at the apartment. Look at this place. I unclasp my watch and hand it to him. Fine. Take this. It's a Cartier Pontier. I'll, I'll tell your father it is gone for mending. Oh, mais non. He puts up a hand, mock affectedly. I'm not getting my hands dirty. I'm Papa's son, after all. You must know that about me, surely. I would like another pretty cream-colored envelope of cash, please. It's so very like you, isn't it? The elegant exterior, the cheap, grubby reality inside. What have I done to make you hate me so much? I ask him. I've done nothing to you. Antoine laughs. You're telling me that you really don't know? He leans in a little closer, and I can smell the stink of the alcohol on his breath. You are nothing, nothing compared to Maman. She was from one of the best families in France. A truly great French line, proud, noble. You know the family thinks he killed her. Paris's best physicians and they couldn't work out what was making her so sick. And when she died, he replaced her with what? With you? To be honest, I didn't need to see those records. I knew what you were from the moment I met you. I could smell it on you. My hand itches to slap him again. But I won't allow another loss of control. Instead, I say, your father will be so disappointed in you. Oh, don't try with a disappointment card. It doesn't work for me any longer. He's been disappointed in me ever since I came out of my poor mother's shut. And he's given me fucking nothing. Nothing. Anyway, that hasn't been tied up with guilt and recrimination. All he's given me is his love of money and the fucking Oedipal complex. If he hears about this, you threatening me, he'll, he'll cut you off. Except he won't hear about it, will he? You can't tell him because that's the whole point. You can't let him find out because there's so much I could tell. Other things that have gone on inside these apartment walls. He pulls a thoughtful expression. How does that saying go again? Quand le chien n'est pas là, les souris dansent. Where the cat's away, the mice dance. He takes out his phone, waves it back and forth in front of my face. Jacques's number right there on the screen. You wouldn't do it, I say, because then you wouldn't get your money. Well, isn't that exactly the point? Chicken and egg, ma chère belle-mère. You pay, I don't tell. And you really don't want me to tell Papa, do you? About what else I know? He leers at me just as he did when I left the third floor apartment one evening, and he emerged out of the shadows on the landing, looked me up and down in a way that no stepson should look at their stepmother. Your lipstick, ma chère belle-mère, he said with a nasty smile. It's smudged? Just there? No, I tell Antoine now. I'm not going to give you any more. Excuse me? He cups a hand behind his ear. I'm sorry, I don't understand. No, you're not getting your money. I'm not going to give it to you. He frowns. But I'll tell my father. I'll tell him the other thing. Oh, no, you won't. I know that I am in dangerous territory, but I can't resist saying it, calling his bluff. He nods at me slowly, like I'm too stupid to understand him. I assure you, I absolutely will. Fine, message him now. I see a spasm of confusion cross his face. You stupid bitch, he spits. What's wrong with you? But suddenly he seems uncertain, even afraid. I told Benjamin Daniels about Sophia Volkova. That was my most reckless act, more than anything else I did with him. We had showered together that afternoon. He had washed my hair for me. Perhaps it was this simple act, far more intimate than the sex in its way, that released something in me that encouraged me to tell him about the woman I thought I had left behind in a locked room beneath one of the city's better-heeled streets. 
In doing so, I felt suddenly as though I was the one in control. Whoever my blackmailer was, they would no longer hold all of the cards. I would be the one telling the story. Jacques chose me, I said. He could have had his pick of the girls, but he chose me. But of course he chose you, Ben said, as he traced a pattern on my naked shoulder. He was flattering me, perhaps. But over the years I'd also come to see what the attraction must have been for my husband. Far better to have a second wife who could never make him feel inferior, who came from somewhere so far beneath him that she would always be grateful. Someone he could mould as he chose. And I was so happy to be moulded. To become Madame Sophie Meunier with her silk scarves and diamond earrings. I could leave that place far behind. I wouldn't end up like some of the others. Like the poor wretch who had given birth to my daughter. Or so I thought. Until that first note showed me that my past hung over my life like a blade. Ready at any moment to pierce the illusion I had created. And tell me about Mimi. Ben murmured into the nape of my neck. She's not yours, is she? How does she fit into all this? I went very still. This was his big mistake. The thing that finally shocked me out of my trance. Now I knew I wasn't the only one he was speaking to. Now I realized how stupid I had been. Stupid and lonely and weak. I had revealed myself to this man, this stranger. Someone I still didn't really know. In spite of all our snatched time together. In hindsight, perhaps even as he told me about his childhood, he had been selecting, editing, part of him slipping away from me, ever unknowable, giving me choice morsels, just enough that I would unburden myself to him in return. He was a journalist, for God's sake. How could I have been so foolish? In talking, I had handed him the power. I hadn't just risked everything I had built for myself, my own way of life. I had risked everything I wanted for my daughter, too. I knew what I had to do, just as I know what I have to do now. I steal myself, give Antoine my most withering stare. He may be taller than me, but I feel him cringing beneath it. I think he has just understood that I am beyond bullying. Message your father or not, I say. I don't care. But either way, you aren't getting another euro from me. And at this moment, I think we all have more important matters to focus on. Don't you? You know Jacques's position on this. The family comes first. Jess. I'm back here. Back in this quiet street with its beautiful buildings. That familiar feeling settles over me. The rest of the city, the world, seems so far away. I think of Theo's words. You strike me as the kind of person who could be a little reckless. It made me angry when he said it, but he was right. I know there is a part of me that is drawn to danger, even seeks it out. Maybe it's madness. Maybe if Theo hadn't just been arrested, I'd have gone back to his like he said I should, crashed on his sofa. Maybe not. But as it stands, I don't have anywhere else to go. I know I can't go to the police. I also know that if I want to find out what happened to Ben, this place is the only option. The building holds the key. I'm sure of it. I won't find any answers running away. I had a gut feeling that day with Mum too. She was acting weirdly that morning, wistful, not herself. Her smile dreamy, like she was already somewhere else. Something told me I shouldn't go to school, fake a sick note, like I had before. But she wasn't sad or frightened, just a little checked out. And it was sports day. And once upon a time I was good at sport, and it was summer, and I didn't want to be around mum when she was like that. So I went to school and completely forgot mum even existed for a few hours. But anything existed except my friends and the three-legged race and the sack race and all that stupid stuff. When I got home at ten to four, 
I knew. Before I even got to the bedroom, before I even unpicked that lock and opened that door, I think maybe she'd changed her mind, remembered she had kids who needed her more than she needed to leave, because she wasn't lying peacefully on the bed. She was lying like a snapshot of someone doing a front crawl, frozen in the act of swimming towards the door. I'll never ignore a gut feeling again. If they've done something to Ben, I know I've got the best chance of finding it out. Not the police in their pay. No one but me. I've got nothing to lose, really. If anything, I feel a kind of pull towards this place now. To crawl, as Theo put it, back into the belly of the beast. I'd thought it sounded melodramatic when he said it, but when I stand at the gate and look up at it, it feels right. Like this place, this building, is some huge creature ready to swallow me whole. There's no sign of anyone about when I enter the apartment building, not even the concierge. All the lights are off in the apartments up above. It seems as deathly quiet as it did the night I arrived. It's late, I suppose. I tell myself it must just be my imagination that lends the silence a heavy quality, like the building has been waiting for me. I move towards the stairwell. Strange. Something draws my eye to the dim light. A large, untidy pile of clothes at the bottom of the stairs, strewn across the carpet. What on earth is that doing there? I reach for the light switch. The lights stutter on. I look back at the pile of old clothes. My stomach clenches. I still can't see what it is, but in an instant I know. I just know. Whatever is there at the bottom of the stairs is something bad. Something I don't want to see. I move towards it as though I'm pushing through water, resisting, and yet knowing I have to go and look. As I get closer, I can make it out more clearly. There's a solid shape visible inside the softness of the material. Oh my God. I'm not sure if I whisper this out loud or if it's only in my head. I can see now with horrible clarity that the shape is a person. Lying face down, spread eagled on the flagstones. Not moving. Definitely not moving. Not again. I've been here before the body in front of me so horribly still. Oh my God. Oh my God. I can see little spots dancing in front of my eyes. Breathe, Jess. Just breathe. Every part of me wants to scream, to run in the opposite direction. I force myself to crouch down. There's a chance she could still be alive. I bend down. Put out a hand, touch the shoulder. I can feel bile rising in my throat, gagging me. I swallow hard. I roll the concierge over. Her body moves as though it really is just a loose collection of old clothes, too fluid, too senseless. A couple of hours ago, she was warning me to be careful. She was frightened. Now she's... I put a couple of fingers to her neck. Sure, there'll be nothing. But I think I feel something. Is that... Yes. Beneath my fingertips. A stuttering. A pulse. Faint but definite. She is still alive. But only just. 
I look up at the dark stairwell, towards the apartments. I know this wasn't an accident. I know one of them did this. Jess. Can you hear me? Christ. I realise I don't even know the woman's name. I'm going to call an ambulance. It seems so pointless. I'm sure she can't hear me. But as I watch her lips begin to part, as though she's trying to say something, I reach into my pocket for my phone. But there's nothing there. My jacket pocket is empty. What the hell? I scrabble in my jeans pocket. Not in there, either. Back up to my jacket. But it's definitely not here. No phone. And then I remember. I handed it over to that doorman in the club, because he wouldn't let us in otherwise. We got thrown out before I had a chance to collect it. And I'm certain he wouldn't have handed it over anyway. I close my eyes. Take a deep breath. Okay, Jess, think. Think. It's fine. It's fine. You don't need your phone. You can just go onto the street and ask someone else to call an ambulance. I shove open the door, run through the courtyard to the gate, pull at the handle. But nothing happens. I pull harder. Still nothing. It doesn't move a millimetre. The gate is locked. It's the only explanation. I suppose the same mechanism that allows it to be opened with the key code can also be used to lock it shut. I'm trying to think rationally. But it's difficult because panic is taking over. The gate is the only way out of this place. And if it's locked, then I'm trapped inside. There is no way out. Could I climb it? I look up, hopefully. But it's just a sheet of steel. Nothing to get a toehold on. Then there are the anti-climb spikes along the top and the shards of glass along the wall either side that would shred me to pieces if I tried to climb over. I run back into the building, into the stairwell. When I return, I see the concierge has managed to sit up her back against the wall near the bottom of the staircase. Even in the gloom, I can make out the cut at her hairline where she must have hit her head on the stone floor. No ambulance, she whispers, shaking her head at me. No ambulance. No police. Are you mad? I have to call. I break off because she has just looked up at the staircase behind me. I follow her gaze. Nick is standing there, at the top of the first flight of stairs. Hello, Jess, he says. We need to talk. Nick, second floor. You animal, she says. You did this to her! Who the fuck are you? I put up my hands. It... it wasn't me. I just found her. It was Antoine, of course. Going too far, as usual. An old woman, for God's sake. To shove her like that. It must have been a... a terrible accident. Look, there are some things I have to explain. Can we talk? No, she says. No, I don't want to do that, Nick. Please, Jess, please. You have to trust me. I need her to stay calm. Not do anything rash. Not force me to do something I'll regret. I'm also still unsure whether or not she has a phone on her. Trust you? Like I trusted you before? When you took me to meet that shady cop, when you hid from me that you were a family. Look, Jess, I say, I can explain everything. Just come with me. 
I don't want you to get hurt. I really don't want anyone else to get hurt. What? She gestures to the concierge. Like her? And Ben? What have you done to Ben? He's your friend, Nick! No! I shouted. I've been trying to be so calm, so controlled. He was not my friend. He was never my friend. And I don't even try to keep the bitterness at bay. Three nights ago, my little sister Mimi came and told me what she had found on his computer. It said, Our money doesn't come from wine. It says, It says it's girls. Men buying girls, not wine. This horrible place, this club. Ce n'est pas vrai. It can't be true, Nick. Tell me it's not true. She was sobbing as she tried to speak. And it says... She fought for breath. It says I'm not really theirs. I suppose we always knew about Mimi, Antoine and I. I suppose all families have these kinds of secrets, these commonly agreed deceptions that are never spoken of aloud. Frankly, we were too afraid. I remember how, when we were little more than kids, Antoine made some comment that our father overheard, some insinuation. Papa backhanded him across the room. It has never properly been mentioned again, just another skeleton thrown to the back of the closet. Ben had clearly been very, very busy. It sounded as though he had discovered more about Papa and his business than I even knew myself. But then I haven't wanted to know all the deplorable particulars. I've kept as much distance, as much ignorance as possible over the years. Still, it was all tied up with the thing I had told him in strictest confidence ten years before in a weed cafe in Amsterdam. The confession he had promised me hand on heart never to share with another soul. The secret at the very heart of my family. My main, terrible source of shame. I can still remember my father's words when I was sixteen, outside that locked door at the bottom of the velvet staircase, taunting. Oh, you think this is something you can just turn your nose up at, do you? You think you're above this? What do you think really paid for that expensive school? What do you think paid for the house you live in, the clothes you wear, some dusty old bottles, your sainted mother's precious inheritance? No, my boy, this is where it comes from. Think you're immune now? Think you're too good for all of it? I knew all too well what Mimi had felt, reading about it on Ben's computer learning about the roots of our wealth, our identity, discovering it was sullied money that had paid for everything. It's like a disease, a cancer spreading outwards and making all of us sick. But at the same time, you can't choose your blood. They are still the only family I have. When Mimi told me what she had read, all of it, Ben's casual text message months ago, our meeting in the bar, the move into this building, suddenly revealed itself to be not the workings of happy coincidence, but something far more calculated, targeted. He had used me to fulfill his own ambitions, and now he would destroy my family. And in the process, he apparently didn't care that he would also destroy me. I thought again of that old French saying about family. La voix du sang est la plus forte. The voice of blood is the strongest. I didn't have a choice. I knew what I had to do. Just as I know what I have to do now. Jess. Please, Jess. Nick says in a reasonable tone. Just hear me out. I'll calm down there, and we can chat. For a moment, I think, just because they're a family, 
it doesn't mean they're all responsible for what's happened here. I remember how Nick briefly referred to his father as a bit of a cunt. Clearly they don't all see eye to eye. Maybe I've jumped to conclusions. Maybe she really did fall. An old woman, frail, slipping on the stairs late at night. No one to hear her because it's late. And maybe the front gate is locked because it's late, too. No. I'm not going to take my chances. I turned to look back at the concierge, slumped on the floor and grimacing in pain. And as I do, I see the door to the first floor apartment opening. I watch as Antoine steps out onto the landing to stand next to his brother. The two of them so much more alike than I had realised. He smiles down at me, a horrible grin. Hello, little girl, he says. Where to run? The front gate is locked. I refuse to be the girl in the horror film who flees into the basement. Both brothers are advancing towards me down the stairs now. I don't have any time to think. Instinctively, I step into the lift. I press the button for the third floor. The lift clanks upwards, the mechanism grinding. I can hear Nick running up the stairs below. Through the metal grill, I can see the top of his head. He's chasing me. The gloves are off now. Finally, I reach the third floor. The lift clanks into place agonizingly slowly. I open the metal gate and dash across the landing, shove the keys into the door to Ben's apartment and fling it open, slam it shut behind me, lock the door, my chest heaving. I try to think, panic making me stupid just when I need my thoughts to be as clear as possible. The back staircase, I could try and use that, but the sofa's in the way. I run to it, start trying to tug it away from the door. Then I hear the unmistakable sound of a key beginning to turn in the lock. I back away. He has a key. Of course he has a key. Could I pull something in front of the door? No, there's no time. Nick starts advancing towards me across the room. The cat, seeing him, streaks past and jumps up onto the kitchen counter to his right, mewing at him, perhaps hoping to be fed. Traitor. Come on, Jess, Nick says, coaxingly, still that chillingly reasonable tone. Just, just stay where you are. This new menace in Nick is so much more frightening than if he hadn't worn that nice guy mask before. I mean, his brother's violence has always seemed to simmer just beneath the surface. But Nick, this new Nick, he's an unknown quantity. So what? I ask him. So you can do the same thing to me that you've done to Ben. I didn't do anything. There's a strange emphasis on the way he says this. A stress on the I. I didn't. Are you saying someone else did? One of the others? He doesn't answer. Keep him talking, I tell myself. Play for time. I thought you wanted to help me, Nick, I say. He looks pained now. I did want to, Jess, and it's all my fault. I set this whole thing in motion. I invited him here. I should have known. He went digging into stuff he shouldn't have. Fuck. He rubs at his face with his hands, and when he takes them away... I see that his eyes are rimmed with red. It's my fault. And I'm sorry. I feel a coldness creeping through me. What have you done to Ben, Nick? I meant it to sound tough, authoritative. 
but my voice comes out with a tremor. I haven't. I didn't. I haven't done anything. Again, that emphasis. I didn't. I haven't. The only way out is past Nick, through that front door. Just by the door is the kitchen area. The utensil pots right there. Inside it is that razor-sharp Japanese knife. If I can just keep him talking, somehow grab the knife. Come on, Jess. He takes another step towards me. And suddenly there's a streak of movement. A flash of black and white. The cat has leapt from the kitchen counter onto Nick's shoulders, the same way it greeted me the very first time I entered this apartment. Nick swears, puts his hands up to tear the animal away. I sprint forwards, yank the knife out of the pot. Then I lunge past him for the door, wrench it open and slam it behind me. Hello, little girl. I turn. Fuck. Antoine stands there. He must have been waiting in the shadows. I lunge the knife towards him, slashing so violently at the air with the blade that he staggers backwards and falls down the flight of stairs, collapsing in a heap on the next landing. I peer at him through the gloom, my chest burning. I think I hear a groan but he's not moving. Nick will be out any moment. There's only one way to go. Up. I'm clearly outnumbered here. One of me, four of them. But perhaps there's somewhere I can hide, to try and buy some time. Come on, Jess. Think. You've always been good at thinking yourself out of a tight spot. Mimi, fourth floor. What's going on out there? Maman? After everything I have learned, the words still feel strange. Painful. Shh, she says, stroking my hair. Shh, ma petite. I'm crouched on the bed, trembling. She came down to check on me. I've allowed her to sit beside me, to put an arm around my shoulders. Look, she says, just stay in here, yes? I'm going to go out there and see what's going on. I grab hold of her wrist. No, please don't leave me. I hate the neediness in my voice, my need for her, but I can't help it. Please, I say, maman. Just for a couple of minutes. She says, I just have to make sure. No, please don't leave me here, Mimi. She says sharply, let go of my arm, please. But I keep hanging onto her. In spite of everything, I don't want her to leave me. Because then I'd be left alone with my thoughts, like a little girl afraid of the monsters under the bed. Jess. I sprint up the stairs, taking them two at a time. Fear makes me run faster than I've ever done in my life. Finally, I'm on the top floor, opposite the door to the penthouse apartment, the wooden ladder up to the old maid's quarters in front of me. I begin to climb, ascending into the darkness. Maybe I can hide out here long enough to gather my thoughts, work out what the hell I'm going to do next. I'm already pulling the hoop earrings from my ears, bending them into the right shape, making my rake and my pick. I grab for the padlock, get to work. Normally I'm so quick at this, but my hands are shaking. I can feel that one of the pins inside the lock is seized, and I just can't get the pressure right to reset it. Finally, finally, the lock pops open and I wrench it off and push open the door. I close it again quickly behind me. 
The open padlock is the only thing to give me away. I'll just have to pray they won't immediately guess I've come in here. My eyes start to adjust in the gloom. I'm looking into a cramped attic space, long and thin. The ceiling slopes down sharply above me. I have to crouch so I don't knock my head on one of the big wooden beams. It's dark, but there's a dim glow which I realise is the full moon, filtering in through the small, smeared attic windows. It smells of old wood and trapped air up here. And something animal. Sweat. Or something worse. Something decaying. Something that stops me from breathing in too deeply. The air feels thick. Full of dust motes which float in front of me in the bars of moonlight. It feels as though I have just pushed open a door into another world, where time has been suspended for a hundred years. I move forwards, looking around for somewhere to hide. Over in the dim far corner of the space, I see what looks like an old mattress. There appears to be something on top of it. I have that feeling again like I did downstairs when I found the concierge. I don't want to step any closer. I don't want to look. But I do, because I have to know. Now I can see what it is, who it is. I see the blood. I understand. He's been up here all along and I forget that I'm meant to be hiding from them. I forget everything, apart from the horror of what I'm looking at. I scream and scream and scream. Mimi, fourth floor. A scream tears through the apartment. He's dead! He's dead, you fucking killed him! I let go of my mother's arm. The storm in my head is growing louder, louder. It's a swarm of bees. Then like being crashed underwater by the waves. Now like standing in the middle of a hurricane. But it still isn't loud enough to shut out the thoughts that are beginning to seep in. The memories. I remember blood. So much blood. You know how when you're a kid you can't sleep because you're afraid of the monsters under the bed? What happens if you start to suspect that the monster might be you? Where do you hide then? It's like the memories have been kept behind a locked door in my mind. I have been able to see the door. I have known it's there. And I have known that there is something terrible behind it. Something I don't want to see. Ever. But now the door is opening, the memories flooding out. The iron stink of the blood. The wooden floor slippery with it. And in my hand, my canvas cutting knife. I remember them pushing me into the shower. Maman... Someone else, too, maybe, washing me down. The blood running dilute and pink into the drain, swirling around my toes. I was shivering all over. I couldn't stop. But not because the shower was cold. It was hot, scalding. There was a deep coldness inside me. I remember Maman holding me like she did when I was a little girl, and even though I was so angry with her, so confused, all I wanted suddenly was to cling to her, to be that little girl again. Maman, I said, I'm frightened. What happened? Shh. She stroked my hair. It's okay. She told me, I'm not going to let anything happen. I'll protect you. 
Just let me take care of all of this. You aren't going to get into any trouble. It was his fault. You did what had to be done, what I wasn't brave enough to do myself. We had to get rid of him. What do you mean? I searched her face, trying to understand. Maman, what do you mean? She looked closely at me then, stared hard into my eyes. Then she nodded, tightly. You don't remember. Yes. Yes, it's best like that. Later there was something crusted under my fingernails, a reddish-brown rust color. I scrubbed at it with a toothbrush in the bathroom until my nail bed started bleeding. I didn't care about the pain. I just wanted to be rid of whatever it was. But that was the only thing that seemed real. The rest of it was like a dream. And then she arrived here. And the next morning she came to the door. She knocked and knocked until I had to open it. Then she said those terrible words. My brother, Ben, he's... Well, he's kind of disappeared. That was when I realized it could have been real after all. I think it might have been me. I think I might have killed him. Sophie, penthouse. He's dead. He's dead. You fucking killed him. I have to go, Cherie, I tell Mimi. I have to go and deal with this. I step onto the landing, leaving her in the apartment. I look upwards. It has happened. The girl is in the Chambre de Bon. She's found him. I remember pushing open the door to his apartment that terrible night. My daughter covered in blood. She opened her mouth as though to speak or scream, but nothing came out. The concierge was there too, somehow. But then of course she was. She sees, knows everything. Moving around this apartment building like a spectre. I stood looking at the scene before me in a state of utter shock. And a strange sense of practicality took over. We need to wash her, I said. Get rid of all this blood. The concierge nodded. She took Mimi by the shoulders and led her towards the shower. Mimi was muttering a stream of words now. About Ben, about betrayal, about the club. She knew. And for some reason, she had not come to me. When she was clean, the concierge took her away, back to her apartment. I could see my daughter was in a state of shock. I wanted to go with her, comfort her. But first I had to deal with the consequences of what she had done. The thing, in all honesty, that I had considered doing myself. I found and used every tea towel in the apartment, every towel from the bathroom. All of them, soaked through crimson. I wrenched the curtains down from the windows and wrapped the body in them, tied it carefully with the curtain cords. I hid the weapon in the dumb waiter, in its secret cavity inside the wall, and wound the handle so it travelled up to a space between the floors. The concierge brought bleach. I used it to clean up after I'd washed the blood away, breathing through my mouth so as not to smell it. I pressed the back of my hand to my mouth. I couldn't vomit. I had to stay in control. The bleach stained the floor, leached the varnish out of the wood. It left a huge mark, even larger than the pooling blood but it was the best I could do, better than the alternative. And then, I don't know how much later, the door opened. It wasn't even locked. I had forgotten that in the face of the task ahead of me. They stood there, the two Meunier boys, my stepsons, Nicola and Antoine, staring at me in horror, the bleach stain in front of me, blood up to my elbows, Nick's face drained of all colour. There's been a terrible accident. I said. Jesus Christ, Nicholas said, swallowing hard. Is this because... There was a long pause while I tried to think of what to say. I would not speak Mimi's name. I decided that Jacques could take the blame as a father should. This was, after all, really his mess. I settled on. Your father found out what Ben had been working on. Oh, Jesus. Nick put his face in his hands. And then he howled like a small child a sound of terrible pain. 
His eyes were wet, his mouth gaping. This is all my fault. I told Papa. I told him what Mimi had found, what Ben had been writing. I had no idea. If I'd known, oh Jesus. For a moment, he seemed to sway where he stood. Then he rushed from the room. I heard him vomiting in the bathroom. Antoine stood there, arms folded. He looked equally sickened, but I could see he was determined to tough it out. Serves him right. The putain du bata, he said finally. I'd have done it myself. But he didn't sound convinced. A few minutes later, Nick returned looking pale but determined. The three of us stood there, staring at one another. Never before had we been anything like a family. Now, we were oddly united. No words passed between us, just a silent nod of solidarity. Then, we got to work. Jess. Even in my darkest moments over the last couple of days, even learning what Ben had got himself into, I haven't allowed myself to imagine it. Not finding my brother like this. How I found mum. I sink to my knees. It doesn't look like my brother. The body on the mattress. It isn't just the pale, waxy colour of the skin. The sunken eye sockets. It's that I've never seen him so still. I can't think of my brother without thinking of his quick grin. His energy. I take in the dark, rusted crimson colour of his t-shirt. I can see that elsewhere the fabric is pale. It's a stain. It covers his entire front. He must have been up here all along. All this time. While I've been scurrying around following clues. Tying myself in knots. Thinking I was helping him somehow. And to think I'd seen that locked attic door on my first morning here. Crouched here beside him. I rock back and forth as the tears begin to fall. I'm so sorry, I say. I'm so bloody sorry. I reach down to take a hold of his hand. When was the last time we held hands? My brother and I. That day in the police station, maybe. After mum. Before we went our separate ways. I squeeze his fingers tight. Then I almost drop his hand in shock. I could have sworn I felt his fingers twitch against mine. I know it's my imagination, of course. But for a moment, I really thought. I glance up. His eyes are open. They weren't open before. Were they? I get to my feet, stand over him, heart thundering. Ben! I'm sure I just saw him blink. Ben! Another blink. I didn't imagine it. I can see his eyes attempting to focus on mine. And now he opens his mouth, but no sound comes out. Then... Yes. It's little more than an exhalation, but I definitely heard him say it. He closes his eyes again, as though he's very, very tired. Ben, I say. Come on, hey, sit up. It suddenly seems very important to get him upright. I put my arms under his armpits. He's almost a dead weight but somehow I manage to haul him into a sitting position. He half slumps forward, and his eyes are cloudy with confusion. But they are open. Oh, Ben. I take hold of his shoulders. I don't dare hug him in case he's too badly hurt. Tears are streaming down my face now. I let them fall. 
Oh my God, Ben, you're alive. You're alive. I hear a door slam behind me. It's the door to the attic. For a moment, I had genuinely forgotten about anything and anyone else. I turn around, slowly. Sophie Minier stands there. Behind her, Nick. And even though I'm reeling from everything that's just happened, I'm still able to make out that there's a big difference in their expressions. Sophie's face is an intense, terrifying mask. But Nick's, as he looks at Ben, shows surprise, horror, confusion. In fact, Nick looks, and this is the only way I can think to describe it. As though he has seen a ghost. Nick, second floor. I feel dread creeping through me as I take in the scene in the attic. I ran up here when I heard the screaming after dragging Otwan semi-conscious to the sofa in my apartment. He's here. Ben is here. He doesn't look well, but he is sitting up. And he is alive. This can't be right. It doesn't make any sense. It's not possible. Ben is dead. He's been dead since Friday night. My one-time friend, my old university mate, the guy I fell for on that warm summer night in Amsterdam over a decade ago, that I've been thinking about ever since. He died. And it was my fault. And in the days since, I have been trying to live with the guilt and the grief of it, walking around feeling only barely alive myself. I looked to my stepmother, expecting to see my own shock reflected in her expression. It isn't there. This doesn't seem to have come as a surprise to her. She knows. It's the only explanation. Why else would she be so calm? Finally, I managed to speak. What is this? I ask, voice hoarse. What is this? What the fuck is happening? I point to Ben. This isn't possible. He's dead. You see, I know it for a fact. I had plenty of time to take it all in. The unspeakable horror of that lifeless shape in its makeshift shroud. The undeniable fact of it. Of the blood, too, spilled across the floorboards and soaked into the towels. Far more blood than anyone could lose and live. But it's more than that. Three nights ago, Antoine and I carried his body down the stairs and dug a shallow trench and buried him in the courtyard garden. Mimi, fourth floor. It has all gone so quiet now, after the scream up above. What is going on? What has she found? This is the part I remember. After this, there is nothing until the blood. It was late and I was tired from all the thoughts whirring around my brain, but couldn't sleep. I couldn't stop thinking about what I had read, what I saw, Ben, and my mother. I destroyed my paintings of him, but it didn't feel like enough. I could see him over there in his apartment, working away at his computer, but it was all different now. I knew what he was writing about, and the thought of it made me feel sick all over again. I could never unknow it, even if I tried not to believe it. But I think I do. I think I do believe it. The hushed tones everyone uses when they talk about Papa's business. Things I've heard Antoine say, 
it was all beginning to make a horrible kind of sense. Ben came to the window and looked out. I ducked out of sight so he wouldn't spot me. Then I went back to watching. He moved back to his desk, looking at his phone, holding it to his ear. But then he looked up, turned his head. He began to stand. The door was opening. Someone was stepping into the room. Oh, merde. Putain de merde. What was he doing there? It was Papa. He wasn't meant to be home. When did he get back, and what was he doing in Ben's apartment? Papa had something in his hands. I recognized it. It was the magnum of wine he had given Ben as a present only a few weeks earlier. He was going to. I couldn't bear to keep looking, but at the same time I couldn't look away. I watched as Ben crumpled to his knees, as Papa raised the bottle again and again. I watched as Ben staggered backwards, as he collapsed onto the floor, as blood began to soak into the front of his pale T-shirt, turning the whole thing red. And I knew it was all my fault. Ben crawled towards the window. I watched as he raised his hand, hit his palm against the glass. And then he mouthed a word. Help. I saw my father raise the bottle again, and I knew what was going to happen. He was going to kill him. I had to do something. I loved him. Ben had betrayed me. He had destroyed my whole world. But I loved him. I reached for the nearest thing at hand, and then I ran down the stairs so quickly it felt as though my feet weren't even touching the ground. The door to Ben's apartment was open and Papa was standing over him, and I just had to make him stop. I had to make him stop, and at the same time, maybe there was a little voice inside me saying, He's not really your Papa, this man. And he's not a good man. He's done some terrible things. And now he's about to become a killer, too. Ben was on the ground and his eyes were closed. And then I was behind Papa. He hadn't seen me, hadn't heard me creep into the room. And I had my canvas cutting knife in my hand. And it's small, but the blade is sharp. So very sharp. And I raised it above my head. And then nothing. And then the blood. Later, I thought I heard the sound of voices in the courtyard. I heard the scrape of shovels. It didn't make any sense. Maman likes to garden, but it was dark, night time. Why was she doing it now? It couldn't be real, it had to be a dream. Or some kind of nightmare. Nick, second floor. I remember leaving Papa's study after I told him what Ben had been up to, what he was writing about. I had called him home, told him there was something he needed to hear. As I descended the staircase, I thought about the look on his face, the barely controlled rage, a charge of fear that returned me to childhood. When he wore that expression, it was time to make yourself scarce. But at the same time, I felt a free saw of perverse pleasure, too, at bursting the Benjamin Daniels bubble, at showing Papa that his famous judgment wasn't always as sound as he thought, tarnishing the golden boy he had briefly seemed to hold closer than his own sons. I had betrayed Ben, yes, but in a much smaller way than he had betrayed me and my family's hospitality. He had it coming. Any feeling of triumph soured quickly. Suddenly, I wanted to be numb. I went and took four of the little blue pills and lay in my apartment in an oxycodone haze. Maybe I was aware of some kind of commotion upstairs. I don't know. 
It was like it was happening in another universe. But after a while, as the pills began to wear off, I thought perhaps I should go and see what was going on. I met Antoine on the stairs. Could smell the booze on him. He must have been passed out in yet another drunken stupor. What the fuck's happening? He asked. His tone was gruff, but there was something fearful in his expression. I have no idea, I said. This wasn't quite true. Already an unnameable suspicion was forming in my mind. We climbed to the third floor together. The blood. That was the first thing I saw. So much of it. Sophie in the middle of it all. There's been a terrible accident. That was what she told us. I knew in an instant that this was my fault. I had set all of this in motion. I knew what kind of man my father was. I should have known what he might be driven to do. But I'd been so blinded by my own anger, my sense of betrayal. I told myself I was protecting my family, but I also wanted to lash out, to hurt Ben somehow. But this, the blood, that terrible inert form wrapped in the curtain shroud, I could not look at it. In the bathroom, I vomited as though I could expel the horror like something I had eaten. But of course, it did not leave me. It was part of me now. Somehow, I pulled myself together. Ben was beyond help. I knew I had to do this, now, for the survival of the family. The terrible weight of the body in my arms. But none of it felt real. Part of me thought that if I looked at Ben's face, it would make it real. Perhaps that was important, for some sort of closure. But in the end, I couldn't bring myself to do it. To undo all that tight binding, to confront what lay beneath. So you see, this is what happened. Three nights ago, Ben died. And we buried him. Didn't we? Sophie, penthouse. From the moment I saw her, covered in blood, my husband's blood, I acted so quickly, almost without thought. Everything I did was to protect my daughter. It is possible that I was in shock too, but my mind seemed very clear. I have always been single-minded, focused, able to make the best out of a bad situation. It's how I ended up with this life after all. I knew that if I were to have the cooperation of his sons, their help in this, Jacques would have to be alive. I knew that it had to be Benjamin who had died. Before I wrapped the body, I had held Jacques's phone up to his face, unlocked it, changed the passcode. I have kept it on me ever since, messaging Antoine and Nicolas as their papa. The longer I could keep Jacques alive, the more I could get out of his sons. After I had done what I could for Benjamin, stemming the blood with a towel, cleaning the wounds, the concierge and I brought him up here to the Chambre du Bon. He was too concussed to struggle, too badly injured to try and free himself. Here, I've been keeping him alive, just. I've been giving him water, scraps of food, the other day a quiche from the boulangerie, all until I could decide what to do with him. He was so badly wounded that it might have been easier to let nature take its course. But we had been lovers. There was still that reminder of what we had briefly been to each other. I am many things. A whore, a mother, a liar, but I am not a killer. Unlike my beloved daughter. Jacques has gone away for a while, I told my stepsons when they arrived. It is best that no one knows he was here in Paris tonight. So as far as you know, should anyone ask, he has been away the entire time on one of his trips, yes? They nodded at me. They have never liked me, never approved of me but in their father's absence, they were hanging on my every word, wanting to be told what to do, how to act. They have never really grown up, either of them. Jacques never allowed them to. I think of the gratitude that I'd felt to Jacques in the beginning, for rescuing me from my previous life. I didn't realize at the time how cheaply I'd been bought. I didn't free myself when I married my husband as I'd thought, 
I didn't elevate myself. I did the exact opposite. I married my pimp. I chained myself to him for life. Perhaps my daughter did the very thing I hadn't had the courage to do. Jess. I grip the knife, ready to defend Ben and myself, should either of them come closer. Strangely, they don't seem so threatening right now. The air feels less charged with tension. Nick is looking from Sophie to Ben and back, his eyes wild. Something else is going on here. Something I can't understand. And yet, still I grip the knife. I can't let my guard down. My husband is dead, Sophie Minier says. That is what happened. At these words, I watch Nick stagger backwards. He didn't know. Qui? He says, hoarsely. Qui? I think he must be asking who. My daughter, Sophie Meunier says. She was trying to protect Ben. I have been keeping your brother here. She gestures in our direction. I have kept him alive. She says it like she thinks she deserves some sort of credit. I can't find the words to answer. I look from one to the other, trying to work out how to play this. Nick is a shrunken figure, crouched down, head in his hands. Sophie Meunier is the threat here, I'm sure. I'm the one with the knife but I wouldn't put anything past her. She steps towards me. I raise the knife, but she barely seems phased. You are going to let us go, I say, trying to sound a lot more assertive than I feel. I might have a knife, but she has us trapped here. The outside gate is locked. I'm quickly realising there's no way we're getting out of this place unless she agrees to it. I doubt Ben can stand without a lot of help. And there's the whole building between us and the outside world. She's probably thinking the same thing. She shakes her head. I cannot do that. Yes, you have to. I need to take him to hospital. No. I won't tell them, I say quickly. Look, I won't say how he got the injuries. I'll, I'll tell them he fell off his moped or something. I'll say he must have come back to his apartment, that I found him. They won't believe you, she says. I'll find a way to convince them. I won't tell. I can hear desperation in my voice now. I'm begging. Please, you can take my word for it. And how can I be sure of that? What other choice do you have? I ask. What else can you do? I take a risk here. Because you can't keep us here forever. People know I'm here. They'll come looking. Not exactly true. There's Theo, but he's presumably banged up in a cell right now, and I never told him the address. It would take him some time to find out. But she doesn't need to know this. I just need to sell it. And I know you aren't a killer, Sophie. As you say, you kept him alive. (laughs) You wouldn't have done that if you were. She watches me levelly. I have no idea if any of this is working. I sense I need something more. I think of how she said, my daughter, the intensity of the feeling in it. I need to appeal to that part of her. Mimi is safe, I say. I promise.
promise you that much. If what you're saying is true, she saved Ben's life. That means a lot. (laughs) That means everything. I will never tell anyone what she did. I swear to you, that secret is safe with me. Sophie, penthouse. Can I trust her? Do I have any other choice? I will never tell anyone what she did. Somehow she has managed to guess my greatest fear. She is right. If I wanted to kill them, I would have done so already. I know that I cannot trap the two of them here indefinitely, nor do I want to. But I don't think my stepsons will cooperate with me now. Nicola appears to be falling apart at the realisation of his father's death. Antoine has helped so far only because he thought he was doing his father's bidding. I dread to think what his reaction will be when he learns the truth. I will have to work out what to do with him. But that's not my main problem now. You will not tell the police, I say. It isn't a question. She shakes her head. The police and I don't get along. She points to Nicholas. He'll back me up on that. But Nicholas barely seems to hear her. So she keeps talking, her voice low and urgent. Look, I'll tell you something if it helps. My dad was a copper, actually. A real fucking hero to everyone else. Except he made my mum's life hell. But no one would believe me when I told them about it. How he treated her. How he hit her. Because he was a good guy. Because he put bad guys in jail. And then... She clears her throat. And then one day, it got too much for my mum. She decided it would just be easier to stop trying. So... No, I don't trust the police. Not here, not anywhere. Even before I met your guy, Blanchon. You have my word that I am not going to go and tell them about this. So she knows about Blanchon. I had wondered about calling him for help here. But he's always been Jacques's man. I do not know if his loyalties would extend to me. I cannot risk him learning the truth. I sized the girl up. I realised that, almost in spite of myself, I believe her. Partly because of what she's just told me about her father. Partly because I can see it in her face, the truth of it. And finally, because I'm not sure I have any other choice but to trust her. I have to protect my daughter at all costs. That is all that matters now. Nick, second floor. I am numb. I know that feeling will return at some point and that no doubt when it does, the pain will be terrible. But for now, there is only this numbness. There is a kind of relief in it. Perhaps I do not yet know what to feel. My father is dead. I've spent a childhood terrorized by him, my whole adult life trying to escape him. And yet, God help me, I loved him too. I am acting on pure instinct, like an automaton, as I help to lift Ben to carry him down the stairs. And though I am numb, I am still aware of the strange and terrible echo of three nights ago, when I carried another body so stiff and still out into the courtyard garden. For a moment, our eyes meet. He seems barely conscious so perhaps I am imagining it. But I think I see something in his expression. An apology? A farewell? But just as quickly it is gone, and his eyes are closing again. And I know I wouldn't trust it anyway, because I never knew the real Benjamin Daniels at all. A week later. Jess. We sit in silence across the formica table, my brother and I. Ben knocks back the espresso in its little paper cup. I tear one end from my croissant and chew. This may be a hospital cafe, but it's France, so the pastries are still pretty good. Finally, Ben speaks. I couldn't help myself. You know, that family, everything we never had. I wanted to be part of it. 
I wanted them to love me. And at the same time, I wanted to destroy them. Partly for living off women who might have been mum at one stage in her life. But also, I suppose, just because I could. He's looking bloody awful. Half his face covered in dark green bruising. The skin above his eyebrows stapled together. His arm in a cast. When we sat down, the woman next to us gave a little start of shock and glanced quickly away. But knowing Ben, he'll have an attractive scar to show for it soon enough. One he'll work into his charm offensive. I brought him to the hospital in a taxi, with cash from his wallet, naturally. Explained that he'd had a fall on his moped near his apartment. Got a pretty bad head injury. Said he'd made it back to his place and collapsed there, totally out of it, until I turned up and saved the day. It raised a few eyebrows. Crazy English tourists. But they've treated him. Thanks, he says suddenly. I can't believe what you went through. I knew I should have told you not to come and stay. Well, thank God you didn't, right? Because I wouldn't have been able to save your life. He swallows. I can tell he doesn't like hearing it. It's uncomfortable, acknowledging that you need people. I know this. I'm sorry, Jess. Well, don't expect me to rescue you next time. Not just for that. For not being there when you needed me. For not being there the one time it really mattered. You shouldn't have had to find her alone. A long silence. Then he says, You know, in a way, I've always been jealous of you. For what? You got to see her one last time. I never got to say goodbye. I can't think of anything to say to this. I couldn't have imagined anything worse than finding her. But maybe part of me understands. Ben glances up. I follow his gaze and see Theo in a dark coat and scarf, hand raised on the other side of the windows. I might have lost my phone, but luckily I still had his business card in my stuff. With his split lip, he now looks like a pirate who's been in some sort of duel. He looks good, too. I turn back to Ben. Hey. I say. Your article. You still have it, right? He raises his eyebrows. Yes. Christ knows what they did to my laptop. Bert had already backed it up to my cloud. Any writer worth their salt knows that. It needs to come out, I say. I know. I was thinking the same thing, but... But... I hold up a finger. We have to do it right. If it publishes, the police will have to look into the club. And those girls who work there, most of them will get deported, right? Ben nods. So it will be even worse for them than it is now, I say. I think of Irina. I can't go back. It wasn't a good situation. I think of how she spoke about wanting a new life. I promised that if I found Ben, I would find a way to help her. I'm definitely not going to be responsible for her being sent home. If we get this wrong, only the vulnerable will get screwed. I know this. I look at Ben and then at Theo as he crosses the room to join us. I have an idea. Sophie, penthouse. The cream-coloured envelope trembles in my hand, hand delivered to the apartment building's postbox this morning. I tear it open, slide out a folded letter. I have never seen this handwriting before, a rather untidy scrawl. 
Madame Meunier. There was something we didn't get a chance to discuss. I think we both had other things on our minds. Anyway, I made you a promise. I haven't talked to the police and I won't. But Ben's article about Le Petit Mont will publish in two weeks' time, whether you do anything or not. I catch my breath. But, if you help, it'll have a different emphasis. Either you can be part of the story, take its starring role, or he'll make sure you aren't named, that you're left out of it as far as possible. And your daughter won't be mentioned at all. I grip the letter tighter. Mimi. I've sent her away to the south of France to paint, to recuperate. This went against every maternal instinct. I didn't want to be separated from her, knowing how vulnerable she was, how angry. But I knew she couldn't stay here with the shadow of death hanging over this place. But before she left, I explained it all to her in my own words. How much she was wanted when she came into my life. How much she is loved. How I have never thought of her as anything other than my very own. My miracle. My wondrous girl. I've also tried to make her see that in the circumstances she did the only thing she could that night. That she saved a life as well as taking one. That she too acted out of love. I did not tell her I might have done the same. That for a brief time he was almost everything to me too. But I suspect she knows somehow about the affair. If that is what one can call those snatched few weeks of selfish, reckless, glorious insanity. I know that things may never again be the same between my daughter and I. But I can hope. And love her. It is all I can do. I too would leave this place and join her, given the choice. But my late husband is buried in the garden. I have to stay. It is something I have made my peace with. This may be a gilded cage. But it is the life I have chosen. I keep reading. Nick won't be mentioned either. Maybe he's not a bad guy, underneath it all. I think he just made some questionable choices. PTO. Nicholas has also left, along with the few possessions he kept here. I don't think he'll be back. I think it will be good for him to leave this place, to stand on his own two feet. My other stepson remains here, and while he isn't the most congenial of neighbours, it is better having him where I can keep an eye on him. And he is a less threatening presence now. I don't think I'll be receiving any more of his little notes. He seems diminished by everything, by the grief he feels for a father who was rarely anything other than cruel to him. In spite of myself, I feel for him. I turn the letter over, read on. Here's what I'm asking you to do. Those girls, the ones at the club, the ones who are your daughter's age, who are being screwed by rich, important guys so that all of you can live in that place, you're going to do right by them. You're going to give every one of them a nice big chunk of cash. I shake my head. There's no way. I suppose you'll say the building, all that, is in your husband's name. But what about those pictures on the walls? What about those diamonds in your ears, that cellar of wine downstairs? I'm not exactly an expert, but even by my modest estimate, you're sitting on quite a fortune. I'm telling you now that you should sell it to someone who doesn't want a paper trail. Someone who pays cash. I'll give you a couple of weeks. It'll give the girls a chance to sort themselves out too. But then Ben's story has to go to print. He's got an editor who's expecting it after all. And that place needs to disappear. Le Petit Mort needs to die its own little death. The police will have to investigate then. Maybe not as hard as they might do, considering they're probably tied up in it. I'm asking you to do all of this as a mother. As a woman. Besides, something tells me you wouldn't mind being completely free of that place yourself. Am I right? I fold the letter again, slide it back into the envelope. And then I nod. I glance up, feeling watched. My gaze goes straight to the cabin in the corner of the courtyard. But there's no one inside. I looked for her that night. I searched the building from top to bottom, thinking that she couldn't possibly have gone far with her injuries. I even looked in her cabin. But there was no sign. Along with the photographs on the wall, several of the smallest and yet most valuable items from the apartment, that little Matisse, for example, and also my silver whippet Benoit, the concierge was gone. An article in the Paris Gazette. It would appear 
that the owner of La Petite Mort, Jacques Munier, has vanished in the wake of the sensational allegations about the exclusive nightclub. The police are now attempting to conduct a full-scale investigation, though this is reportedly hampered by the fact that there are no witnesses available for questioning. Every dancer formerly employed by the club has apparently disappeared. This may come as something of a relief for the former patrons of the club's alleged illegal activities. However, an anonymized website has recently published what it claims is a list of accounts from La Petite Mort's records, listing dozens of names from the great and good of the French establishment. In addition, a high-ranking police official, Commissaire Blanchot, has tendered his resignation following the circulation of explicit images purporting to show him in flagrante with several women in one of the club's basement rooms. As has previously been reported, Meunier's son, Antoine Meunier, allegedly his father's right-hand man, shot himself with an antique firearm at the family property in order to avoid being taken into custody. Epilogue Jess I trundle my suitcase across the concourse at Gare de l'Est, the broken wheel catching every few steps. I really do need to get it fixed. I look up at the screen to find my train. There it is. The night service to Milan, where I'll change before going on to Rome. In the early hours of the morning, we'll travel along the shore of Lake Geneva, and apparently when it's clear, you can see the Alps. Sounds pretty good to me. I thought it was time for my own European tour of sorts. Ben staying here to make a name for himself as an investigative journalist. So, for perhaps the first time ever, I'm the one leaving him. Not running from anything or anyone. Just travelling, in search of the next adventure. I've even got a place waiting for me. A studio which is actually a fancy word for a tiny room where you can reach everything from the bed. Funnily enough, it's a conversion of an old maid's quarters at the top of an apartment block. And apparently, it has a view of St. Peter's, if you squint. It probably won't be much bigger than the concierge's cabin. But then, I don't have that much to put in it. The contents of one broken suitcase. Anyway, it's all mine. No, not mine, mine. I didn't buy it. Are you crazy? Even if I did somehow have the cash, I wouldn't want my name on the deeds for anything. Wouldn't want to be tied down. But I did put down the deposit on it and paid the first month in advance. I took a cut of the money the girls at the club were getting. A kind of finder's fee, if you like. I'm not a saint, after all. As for the girls, the women, I should say. Of course, I couldn't hold each of their hands and make sure it was all going to be okay. But it's nice to know that they've been given the same thing I have. That it'll buy them time. A little breathing room. Maybe even the opportunity to do something else. Twenty minutes before my train leaves. I look around for somewhere to grab a snack. And as I do, I glimpse a figure moving through the crowd. Small, with a familiar crouching, shuffling gait. A silk headscarf. A silver whippet on a lead. Joining the queue of people waiting to board a train. I look up at the screen above the platform. To Nice in the south of France. And then I glance away, and don't look again until the train is pulling out of the platform. Because we're all entitled to that, aren't we? The chance of a new life. Acknowledgements. I loved writing this book. At the same time, it was the hardest of my books to write partly because it was the most complicated structure and premise I've attempted yet, and partly because it was written first while I was very pregnant and then with a new baby in tow, and 
during a pandemic. Though, on that score, I know how lucky I am to have a job where I can easily work from home, unlike so many, especially those incredibly brave key workers. Anyway, I'm so proud of this book, and of releasing it into the world. It's not very British to say it, but I am. At the same time, it feels so, so important to stress that none of it would have been possible without the hard work of some very kind, dedicated and talented people. There really should be multiple names on that front cover. This book has been a huge team effort. Thank you to the phenomenal Kath Summerhays for your endless wit and wisdom and sage counsel and for being such fun to work with and to go for lunch with and for cocktails with and for always being there on the end of the phone. I am so lucky to have you and so grateful for everything you do. Thank you to the incredible Alexandra Machinist for your unfailingly excellent advice and unbelievable negotiating skills. And though for the time being our planned Parisian adventures have fallen foul of the winter vomiting virus, I know we'll be having a glass of champagne on the terrace soon. I can't wait to toast your brilliance. Thank you to Kim Young for being the most patient and supportive of editors, for championing this book from its first inception and, frankly fairly ropey, first draft. You always know how to coax my best work from me. You inspire me with your belief in me and my writing. Thank you for holding my hand throughout this whole process and for always being ready to jump on the phone to discuss a mad new plot idea. Thank you to Kate Ninsel for your masterly editorial counsel, for your razor-sharp eye and overall publishing wizardry. I still can't quite believe what you have achieved with the guest list in the US, bringing my dark little British book to well over a million readers. I am so lucky to have you as my champion. Thank you to the utterly brilliant Charlotte Brabin. You are such a talented, dedicated editor. I am so grateful for all your hard work and advice tact and creativity, and for always being ready and willing for a brainstorm. However small or silly the query, whatever time of day or night. Thank you to Luke Speed for all your kindness and wisdom, and for your endless patience in explaining the magical and mystifying world of film to me. And thank you at the same time for being such fun to work with. You and Kath are the dream team. May there be many more lunches and cinema dates. Thank you to Katie McGowan, Callum Mollison and Grace Robinson for your incredible work in finding my books, so many publishers around the world. It's such a thrill to think of them being translated into other languages and finding so many new readers globally. I'm in awe of what you do. Thank you to the fabulous Harper Fiction family. To Kate Elton, Charlie Redmayne, Isabel Coburn, Abby Salter, Hannah O'Brien, Sarah Shea, Janelle Brew, Amy Winchester, Claire Ward, Roger Cazalet, Izzy Coburn, Alice Goma, Sarah Monroe, Charlotte Brown, Grace Dent, and Ben Hurd. I am so lucky to be published by you all. I'm so hoping we all get to raise a glass together soon. Thank you to the brilliant team at William Morrow, to Brian Murray, Liette Stilik, Molly Gendel, Brittany Hills, Caitlin Harry, Sam Glatt, Jennifer Hart, Stephanie Vallejo, Pam Barricklow, Grace Han, and Jean Rayner. Thank you so much for your tireless work and dedication 
and for championing my books stateside. I can't wait to visit you all in New York and celebrate together. Thank you to the wonderful wider Curtis Brown A-Team, to Johnny Geller, Jess Molloy, and Anna Weglin. Thank you to my darling friend, Anna Barrett, for doing such a fantastic early read-through and edit of The Paris Apartment when I was too scared to show it to anyone else, for hugely boosting my confidence in the book with your encouragement and suggestions. I highly recommend Anna if you're looking for an independent edit of your novel. She's at www.the-writers-space.com. Last, but very much not least, thank you to my family. Thank you to the Folly, Collie and Alan clans for all your support. Thank you to my wonderful siblings, Kate and Robbie. Again, thank God, nothing like the siblings in this book. I'm so proud of you both and so lucky to have you. Thank you to my parents for your pride in me and for the endless, unflagging support. Thank you for forgiving me for turning up to stay, only to dump the wee man on you with no warning and disappear behind my laptop. For being such kind and loving grandparents, feeding and playing and looking after the little guy so lovingly and uncomplainingly while I've been mired in copy edits and proofreads. Thank you for encouraging me in my storytelling since I was a little girl, telling Farmer P tales in the back seat. Thank you to Al for quite literally making all of this possible, for holding the baby, for putting stuff on hold to help me, for talking me through plot crises at 3am and on walks and drives and over dinners we've gone out for and holidays we've taken to get away from the book. For your wisdom, for your support, your belief, your encouragement for reading through almost as many drafts of this book as I have myself, biro in hand, even when knackered from a day's work or baby wrangling, or both. You say 20%. I say, I owe you everything. The Paris Apartment by Lucy Foley Read by Chope Derisu, Sophia Zervudachi, Charlie Anson Claire Corbett, Daphne Kumar, and Julia Wimwood. Produced by ID Audio. With post production by ID Audio. A HarperCollins audiobook. Text copyright Lost and Found Limited, 2022. Production copyright 2022 by HarperCollins Publishers. All rights reserved. Lucy Foley asserts the moral right to be identified as the author of this work. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much for listening to this HarperCollins audiobook. Stay tuned for an exclusive conversation with the author, excerpted from the Book Club Girl podcast. You'll hear from us again in one week. Welcome to the Book Club Girl podcast, where we chat about great books with awesome authors and you, our listeners, ask the questions. I'm Tavia Kowalczuk, and I am so happy to be back for the second season of the show. And I am absolutely delighted to introduce my friend and colleague, Bianca Flores, my new co-host. Welcome, Bianca. Thank you so much, Tavia. Hello, everyone. I'm so happy to be the new co-host with Tavia. I am originally from Honolulu, but now I live in San Francisco. Well, you'll find me either listening to a bookish podcast or novel uh, while I am at the park on a sunny day. I'm so excited to share this podcast with you, Bianca. But before we get into today's episode, I have to ask you, this is the question we asked all of our guests last season. And now I'm asking you, what is your literary white whale? I am so honored to be asked this question. Thank you, Tavia. <laughs> I would say that my white whale is 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, which is so embarrassing because I have a copy. My mom loves the book and I really identify with my Hispanic roots. And I'm just like, I can't believe I haven't read this book. 
On today's show, we'll discuss the instant number one New York Times bestseller, The Paris Apartment, where everyone's a neighbor, everyone's a suspect, and everyone knows something they're not telling. And later in the show, we'll be joined by this super successful mega blockbuster author, Lucy Foley, British author of the number one New York Times bestseller and Reese Witherspoon book club pick, The Guest List, also author of The Hunting Party, and now the number one New York Times bestseller, The Paris Apartment. All right. So before we dive into this week's episode, we wanted to say thanks to Moin55 for her review of the show that came in over the break. Moin55 writes, this has been a delightful year of hearing from all of the authors and getting some great book ideas. As far as your white whales, I hope you both overcome your version as both the Nightingale and the Gentleman in Moscow are great reads. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. Yes, I must overcome my aversion. It's so funny. I actually have the Nightingale as like on one of these shelves behind me. So uh, where I'm sitting right now. So maybe maybe it will jump off at me and land land in my lap tonight. We can have a little a book club where you talk about the Nightingale and I talk about 100 Years of Solitude. Totally. And we can talk about the trauma, getting over the yes. trauma. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Moin55, for your awesome review. We love it. We love it. We love hearing from our listeners. And so remember, if you like our show, please rate and review the Book Club Girl podcast, especially on iTunes. We appreciate every single review. And chances are, if you leave one, we will read it on the show. And now we present to you the Paris Apartment Abridged. Having a brother who lives in Paris has its perks, or does it? But when Jess finally arrives at Ben's fancy Parisian apartment, he isn't there. He didn't leave to run an errand or to go grab dinner with a friend. Ben has gone missing. And as Jess starts to look for clues as to where he could be, she can't help but notice that his neighbors are all acting suspicious, and none of them seem to have ever really liked Ben at all. Ben's apartment building plays a character all on its own with his creaky floorboards, secret passages, and chilling atmosphere. Its residents each seem to have a secret. There's a humble concierge. There's Antoine, an angry, threatening alcoholic who abuses his wife. There's Mimi, who's a young art student on the verge. And Sophie, an aging trophy wife with a yippie lapdog. Not to mention Nick, an unsuccessful angel investor who's moved back from San Francisco, and he's also Ben's college buddy. Nick helped Ben get the apartment in the building, but now seems completely unconcerned where he may be. Told in super short chapters in alternating viewpoints of Jess, the concierge, Nick, Sophie, and Mimi, this locked room thriller will keep you turning the pages until Lucy fully answers Jess's desperate question, where is Ben and why did he go missing? Bianca, I think I know what you're going to say, but what do you think of this book? Tavia, I loved this book so <laughs> much. It is dark. It's eerie. It's sexy. It's everything you could want from a Lucy Foley novel. One of the things I love most about this thriller, Tavia, is the way she depicts Paris, right? Because normally when we think about Paris, we think, you know, the city of lights, the city of dreams, the city of romance. But what she does here is something completely different. She exposes the dark, seedy underbelly of Paris. She totally does that. There's one part in the book where they go to this sort of like high class club, and even that is seedy and scuzzy, and you're like, Ugh, people are awful. Tagging off that, of that sort of common imagination that everyone has of Paris as this wonderful place with flowers and trees and sunny, and you're strolling, and you know, you've got your Chanel bag, you've just bought a dress or something. But the temperature in this book is either hot or cold. It's never a nice day. It's always cold and windy or they're sweating and they're like waiting to get into a record store. And, you know, it's like finally cool at the record store. But I thought that it, I was very uncomfortable, physically uncomfortable the whole book. I think that's a really smart way she manipulates tension and bring, you know, exactly what you said, bringing that uncomfortable feeling. I think there are a lot of different ways you can do that, either, you know, by big action or plot reveals, but it's so fun to see her do that through weather instead. 
Another thing that I really loved while reading this book was the chapters were so short. And I read this book uh, like in chunks every night and it just kept me going. One chapter just led you into the next. I really like that structure for a thriller. Yeah. And speaking about each chapter leading into the next, I think what she does here so well are the cliffhangers. They aren't exactly big plot reveals, but instead they are these, you know, emotional reveals that dig deeper into each character. You know, we're getting deeper into what these characters are hiding and what they know. She also used those chapters not only to like add those awesome cliffhangers that you're talking about, but as a way for us to really get into the minds of the different characters, because each chapter is told from a point of view of another character. And one of the things that sort of irritated me, Jess is the most likable character in the book. But one thing that irritated me is that she arrives in Paris and she's like immediately upset by her brother being missing. She knows something's off in her gut. And she just like neglects herself in the pursuit of taking care of her brother. And this, for whatever reason, I just wanted her so badly to take a shower, to make a hot meal, drink some water. She did none of that. She was like a beer. She wore the same grungy sweatshirt. She would brush her hair, but never wash it. Oh my gosh. And I just feel like there was this sort of juxtaposition of Jess with Sophie, who is the trophy wife who totally keeps herself up. Like she uses her personal care and her personal hygiene and her presentation as like a way to keep people away. And it's just interesting the way these two characters sort of each care for themselves differently and how it says so much about who they are in the, in, in the course of this book. <laughs> if my sister were missing, I probably wouldn't shower either, though. Oh, my God. <laughs> On a different note, though, Tavia, one thing I love so much was how she twisted the idea of the missing girl plot. There are so many thrillers that center on missing girls. You know, they are seen as objects of lust and mystery. And instead, she shifts the conversation to focus on Ben. You know, this charismatic, sexy enigma of a man. I just think we're so overdone and tired of the missing girl trope. And it's so refreshing to have it done to a man instead. Totally. I appreciated that about the book. His character was like problematic as well. Like he wasn't the 100% lovable big brother, right? But my favorite thing about the book was the ending. There's all these twists. This is like a twist machine, this book. But she ties up every single loose end. You get to the book and you're like, what about that? Oh, ding. What about that thing? Bing. What about that person? Oh, over there. Like, okay. I find that so satisfying as a reader. I can't even tell. And sometimes you want there to be questions at the end, but no, this book, I needed to know where everything was. It was great. Absolutely. And again, I just think this is another example of a thriller writer at her best. I cannot wait to talk to her. So before we move into the interview, Bianca, I'm going to toast you to welcome you to the show. Welcome aboard. It is so nice to have you. Cheers. Cheers. We love hearing from our listeners. You can rate and review the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you're listening to this episode. And you can also participate in conversations about great books in the lively comment section of our Instagram feed at Book Club Girl. Today, we're joined by Lucy Foley, whose book, The Paris Apartment, is out now. Welcome, Lucy, to the Book Club Girl podcast. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Yes, we're so happy to have you on. So to get things started... Tavi and I were talking earlier about how we just love the Paris you depict in the book. You know, it's dark and creepy and completely different from how other authors have novelized Paris in the past. We're not alone in this opinion. One of our listeners, Julie, also wanted to hear more about the setting. She asked, how did you decide to use Paris as a setting when your other books are in more rural settings? Yes, it was a total change, really, in terms of setting. It kind of came about by happenstance. I was actually staying in Paris in an Airbnb while I was finishing the final draft of the guest list. And that's something I like to do when when I'm working on a book is kind of book myself a cheap Airbnb somewhere. And so I was staying in this creepy old Parisian apartment building, working on my laptop at all hours of the day and night. And... I would hear these strange sounds coming from the apartment above me, like 
kind of scraping and sounds of something heavy being dragged across the floorboards. And obviously as a writer and a thriller writer, it just got me thinking. I was convinced someone was hiding a body. Maybe they were. Maybe I should have called the police. I don't know. But it sparked the idea for the Paris apartment. But I think I'd also been thinking, I want to shake it up, do something new, have a setting that feels isolated in a different way. Part of a kind of urban environment, but isolated in this whole new, new, new way. Okay, so we want to know more about the building too. And one of our listeners, Shelly, also wanted to know more about the building itself. So she asked us, did you create the building where your characters are living based on research on a physical building? Or did you create the building in your mind to serve the story? So a total mixture of all of those things, I think. It was really inspired by this building that I stayed in on that kind of writing trip. There are things that have gone straight into the book, like time-saving light switches, where you, you know, you press them and then you've got a timer and you can hear it clicking down and you know that suddenly any second you're going to be plunged into darkness, (laughs) which is quite creepy. Things like the courtyards that you could look into from the apartment and all the, all the kind of different apartments looking into that, sort of being able to see into other people's apartments. That was also inspired by this building. But then there were other things that I wanted to add myself. So there's like a secret staircase. Maybe it had a secret staircase, but I never found it. And the carve beneath the building. So this sort of basement area. I also wanted to make it a bit more, the apartment building I was staying was wonderful, but slightly shabby. I wanted to make it a bit more kind of glamorous and fabulous and and also spent a lot of time looking at images. Also, when I went on my research trip to Paris, wandering around looking at apartment buildings and sort of, I guess, building a kind of composite picture from all of those different apartments that inspired it. I love it. I love it. I love the cover. I love the way that we get that sense of like the windows looking into the courtyard on the cover. You definitely have a feeling like a little head is going to pop out from one of those windows. (laughs) What are you looking at? Definitely. Okay. So Lucy, one of the things I loved most about this book is how there are so many thrillers about young girls who go missing. But in yours, we have Ben, you know, this charismatic, sexy guy who goes missing instead. You've completely reversed the go-to dead girl plot and made it something new and brilliant, and I love it. How do you see this book in conversation with other missing girl thrillers? I'm so happy you said that because that was exactly what I wanted to do with it. You know, that was almost my very first idea. So, So the... Stay in Paris kind of inspired the setting for the book. But before I even had Paris, that was the germ of the idea for this book. It was like, I want a missing girl book, but I want it to be a missing boy. And how does that kind of flip things on its head? So yeah, it's a kind of new take on the genre, I suppose. I love it. I hope this is the start of a new trend. Lucy starting new trends in the thriller space. (laughs) You're listening to the Book Club Girl podcast, where our guest this week is Lucy Foley, whose book, The Paris Apartment, is out now. You can read more about Lucy's books at bookclubgirl.com. Coming up on the Book Club Girl podcast, we asked Lucy about her affinity literary character. Stick around. This episode of the Book Club Girl podcast is brought to you by a former Book Club Girl guest, Peter Swanson, and his new book, Nine Lives. The story of nine strangers who receive a cryptic list with their names on it and then begin to die in highly unusual circumstances. Nine Lives is out in paperback now. Welcome back to the show. Each week, we bring you a fascinating new conversation with an author who's written a book we think is a great choice for book clubs to read together. Today... Best-selling author Lucy Foley is here with us answering questions about the number one New York Times bestseller, The Paris Apartment. I thought it was so interesting that when Jess finally went to the police with Nick, they were so unconcerned until they heard the voice message. They were probably like, oh, whatever. He's just off for the weekend. He just left. You know, and I think they said that that was sort of like a French attitude, but I think it also had to do with the fact that he was a man. If it had been a young woman, it would have been a totally different reaction. Yeah. I mean, it's a completely different, yeah, it just completely reverses everything, doesn't it? Bit of a long anecdote, but I remember... Once my husband and I were kind of walking home and we lived along this kind of very dark street, dark, dark, quiet street. And we were walking over these train tracks, like over this bridge. And we heard a scream, what we thought was a scream. 
And my husband's reaction to this was, I'm going to go and see what's going on. And my reaction was like, I'm going to go and call the police. Yeah. And it just really struck me like how different our reactions were. Actually ended up being a fox in the end. So we heard another one and it was, it was an animal. But I think that kind of encapsulates everything about the kind of different experiences for men and women. Have, yeah, out in the world for sure. So as an apartment dweller myself, I pick up tidbits about my neighbor's lives. You know, I can't help it. Like you pass in the hallway or you hear them through the door when you're walking by or, you know, they're talking on the phone as they're exiting the building. Our listener Susan asks, your novel, The Paris Apartment, includes neighbors who raise suspicions. Have you ever had a neighbor who did something questionable? Oh, gosh, I have to, probably have to be really careful here in case <laughs> I really um, cheese anyone off. So I have had some weird neighbours in my time. I think living in London, um, as I did previously, you're kind of living quite closely cheek by jowl with people. I remember one night, it was really hot, and obviously there's no air con in like, any of the UK. So we had all the windows open, and we heard a very strange conversation from the apartment next door to us. And it was a bit like, we were like, we kind of feel like we should shut the windows, but at the same time, it's really hot. And at the same time, it's also sort of fascinating. Um, <laughs> so it was this, yeah, very weird. And then I did have a neighbour who used to go to kind of the loo, which was at the back of the house, and you would hear kind of music playing at like really weird times of night. But that was also his loo so I couldn't really work out what what was going on in there and it had a bit of a haunted house vibe out the front it was sort of covered in ivy and you never no one ever really looked out or looked at very very strange slightly gothic I had the same thing where I have a fire escape outside my window and I was like on there just you know one summer evening having wine enjoying the evening looking at the city and I could hear my neighbor's entire conversation. And I was like, it was a bit, mostly a mundane conversation, but I was like, this just does not feel right. Like, I should I not hear this right now at all. Totally. It feels voyeuristic, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, like unintentionally. Mm, absolutely. And I think sort of, you know, not to mention like, the COVID word too much, but I think being forced into sort of this lockdown situation several times over the past couple of years has sort of only exacerbated that. Like people have been forced to live too closely to each other. And so I think all sorts of weird things have sort of come out of that. Yeah, fascinating totally. times we live in. Totally. We were actually saying that when we were discussing the book, we were talking about it last week. And what we were saying is that the atmosphere in this building is very familiar, even though I don't live in danger it's very familiar, this sort of close, stifling atmosphere because it is how we've all been living for the last two years. Absolutely. Oh my goodness. I know we are all way too familiar with that sense of claustrophobia these days. <laughs> yes, no, definitely. <laughs> okay. So to switch things up a bit, I would love to talk to you about class and power. So once we are deeper into the book, it's apparent that those two themes, class and power, play major roles as more secrets about each character are slowly revealed. Can you tell us a little bit more about how those themes are important in the book? So on the surface level, I think that kind of class dynamic has always been really interesting to me as a writer. And in a way, it's a kind of modern formulation of that sort of upstairs, downstairs dynamic that you get in the kind of golden age murder mystery. If you think of the sort of maid listening at the keyhole, it's kind of doing that in a modern setting. In the Paris apartment specifically, we've got this concierge figure. And the concierge is a bit of a kind of outdated role now in Paris. But traditionally, they were kind of everywhere in the city and they would be the kind of gatekeeper of these grand apartment buildings. They would receive the post, they would keep things ticking over, they would keep the place clean and they would receive visitors to the building. So they really were this sort of first kind of line of defence to the building. And we have that figure in the Paris apartment. But I loved writing her because she's invisible to the inhabitants of this apartment building. And because she's invisible, she has a kind of strange sort of power because they aren't aware how much she sees, how much she knows about them. And, and really, it makes them kind of vulnerable in a way to her. So 
yeah, it was great fun to kind of write that role. And I also think if you've ever been a waitress, a waiter, waitress, worked, worked in a shop, done any kind of role in like the service industries, you see the way, which I did a lot of when I was kind of in my teens, early 20s, you see the way people treat you or certain people treat you. They literally don't see you as a person. And the things that you hear as, as a result, you know, there are things that it's given me so much material for life as a writer. Um, <laughs> some of those characters that you come across. Um, so I think there's something interesting there as well. So this leads me right into my next question, which is my favorite thing about your novel, which is at the end of the book, there does not remain a single loose That's end. That's so true. Every question I had about any character or any situation is completely answered in those final pages when everything comes together. I loved all the different perspectives of the characters throughout the book. One thing that sent me into a, a total panic was pretty early on in the book, Jess runs out of minutes on her phone. <laughs> and I am addicted to my phone. So the idea of not having minutes is like, no, like worse than my brother being missing, right? So why did you do this to poor Jess? Why did she not have her phone? <laughs> so on a very boring practical level, as a writer, with this book, I'd set myself up with a kind of, I suppose, a number of kind of problems that I needed to fix. So with the other two books, my characters were literally removed from the rest of the world. They were sort of in these isolated settings. But I wanted to find ways to make Jess feel kind of more and more isolated. That sounds really horrible. But, you know, she needed to feel that all of the avenues available to her were sort of being shut down. One of those, just on the surface, is that she doesn't speak the language. So she barely speaks a word of French. So all these conversations are going on around her, which sound potentially a little bit suspicious, but she doesn't know what's actually being said. So that's kind of one point of remove for her. Then there's the fact that her phone signal goes down. Then there's just the apartment building and its atmosphere in general. So it's kind of all of these different things. And there's also the fact that she, for various reasons that I won't go into now because they're spoilery, doesn't trust the police. So the first thing that I would probably do, being like a good girl, if I got into this apartment building and there was this kind of situation, I would probably call the police. A good girl and a coward, I should say. Uh, I'd love to think that I would be like Jess. I'd be like, I'm going to kind of sleuth this out myself. But that's what I would do. But uh, it's not really something she feels particularly comfortable doing. So she doesn't really trust the police from the outset. So yeah, all of those different things are kind of part and parcel of, of the mystery. Poor Jess. Poor, poor, poor Jess. Jess. <laughs> <laughs> so we have one final question for you, Lucy. Every episode we ask an author, if you could be any character from any novel, who would you be? So that's an amazing question. And there are so many characters whose heads I would like to step into or whose lives I would like to step into. But I'm actually going to choose Miss Marple from multiple books, in fact. But I just think she's such a fascinating character. So I have to say I wasn't as kind of au fait with the Miss Marple series as I was with Poirot before I recently wrote a short story for this new Miss Marple collection coming out. And I had to kind of step into Miss Marple's shoes. And it was just such fun because she's such an interesting character and kind of so in Agatha Christie's depiction of her, so ahead of her time, because she's this elderly woman. She's, again, kind of invisible to a lot of those around her. They just see her as a sort of doddery, elderly, foolish old woman. And she's actually this brilliant, brilliant mind, brilliant detective mind. And she uses the fact that people kind of underestimate her to her advantage. I just think she's fascinating. And I would also love her kind of powers of deduction. I love that. I, I think that is such a good answer. And it's so fitting for you knowing the kind of books that you write. It's just perfect. Thank you. Lucy, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was an absolute treat having you. We are so honored. Congratulations on all your success with your books. And we can't wait to see what's next from you. Thanks so much for having me. Had such fun chatting to you guys. And thanks for your brilliant questions. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Oh, really enjoyed it. <laughs> yes, Lucy, thank you so much for being here. That was Lucy Foley, whose book, the number one New York Times bestselling The Paris Apartment, is out now. To find out more about The Paris Apartment and Lucy Foley's other mysterious novels, 
head to bookclubgirl.com slash podcast, where you can also find links to everything mentioned in this episode. Like what you heard? Subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, give us a rating and leave a review. Another way to help spread the word about the Book Club Girl podcast, tell a friend. It really helps others to find us. You'll hear from us again in one week, where we'll be speaking with Pung Shepard, critically acclaimed author of the fantasy thriller, The Cartographers. If you want to read the book before its podcast drops, head over to hc.com and use promo code BOOKCLUBGIRL, all one word, for 25% off and free shipping for any book discussed on this podcast. We love hearing from our listeners. Email us at thegirls at bookclubgirl.com or post in the comments on our Instagram feed at bookclubgirl. You can also leave us a voicemail. Our number is 212-207-7336. Your voicemail or email could very well end up being read on the show. We would love to hear from you. Before we go, we'd like to thank Caroline Quash of The Hangar Studios, who produced today's episode, and Roselia Ryan, our amazing editor and audio engineer. Many thanks to Amelia Wood and Francie Crawford for all their excellent help launching season two. And legacy shout out to my former co-host, Eliza Rosenberry. Until next time, I'm Bianca. And I'm Tavia. Happy reading. If you enjoyed this interview, get more conversations about great book club books. Download the Book Club Girl podcast from iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.